Please be seated. This honorable house now resumes its sitting. Let me say good morning to honorable members. And we will pick up where we left off last week. And I think we, okay, we stopped on page 10, where the leader of the opposition had finished his question to the front bench. And we'll continue now with the Honorable Julian Fraser posing his questions to the Honorable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for this opportunity. For the record, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say that the tenth sitting of the third session of the Fourth House of Assembly, where these questions were placed on the order of the day, was supposed to have been asked since June 17, 2021. And a lot of things have happened since that date, Mr. Speaker. Some of the questions might, be seem, might seem to be a bit dated, but nonetheless, the answers need to be had. Mr. Speaker, my question is being posed to the Premier and Minister of Finance. And question number one, Mr. Speaker, on election day, February 21st, government issued an $800 plus thousand dollar contract to an outside consultant to do work related to roads. Can the Premier and Minister of Finance please give this Honorable House A, a report on the progress of the work contracted for and outline the scope and nature of the work. B, the names of any Virgin Islander or Virgin Islander owned company to gain from this contract. C, tell this Honorable House whether the contract is being executed according to schedule and outline the contract timelines. Also D, tell us the construction cost of the work to be executed in each area of the territory where work is to be carried out as a result of this consultancy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's with pleasure that I, I answer this honorable house. But remember, uh, I'll have a lot of information to send over there to you. As you can see, all of this is the answer. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, on a point of information, the most recent election day in the territory was held on 25th February 2019. The advanced polling was on 25th February 2019. I would like to further remind this Honorable House that any contract signed prior to election day 2019 is an inherent, inherited responsibility of this current administration. Mr. Speaker, as the question was not specific on the contract name, contract number, contractor, or the nature of the works, it would be presumptuous of me to address the intent of the question. Notwithstanding, and in the spirit of accountability to this Honorable House, on matters relating to activities of the government, be it past or present, I wish to respond as follows. Mr. Speaker, on February 21st, 2019, the previous administration signed contract MCW004M2019 with FDL Consulting in Cooperation, a consultant firm based in St. Lucia, in the amount of $876,250. Mr. Speaker, that was during the advanced polling day and the day when everyone else was looking for votes this contract was being signed for consultancy services for engineering design and construction supervision for the rehabilitation of roads slopes and coastal defenses the consultancy is being funded under the caribbean development bank rehabilitation and reconstruction loan rrl which was obtained by the previous administration in response to hurricanes oma and maria Mr. Speaker, this contract signing was the result of a procurement process which was conducted in accordance with the CDB's guidelines for the selection and engagement of consultants. 
Mr. Speaker, it is important for me to mention that this fact, because it was a requirement of the RRL, the procurement process under which this consultancy is mandated is referred to as Quality and Cost-Based Selection, QCBS. Mr. Speaker, under QCBS, procurement is opened to any consultant that is based in a CDB borrowing member country of which St. Lucia is a member. Mr. Speaker, the most recent progress report as at 31st May 2021, progress report number 11, prepared by the consultant as a part of the contractual obligations, has been circulated to members, which I'll do now. I feel compelled to clarify to this Honorable House that FDL Consultant Incorporation was contracted to perform consultancy services for engineering, design, and construction supervision, and not to carry out construction works. The construction works, whether completed or ongoing, that are associated with the consultancy services have been carried out by local construction contractors. Mr. Speaker, I had to make that clear. Mr. Speaker, a full description of the scope of works for each project under the design and supervision of the consultant is noted on Table 2, which I'll share of Progress Report Number 11. However, please note that the scope of services for contract MCW forward slash 004M forward slash 2019 can be summarized as follows. One, preparing preliminary and final design for the following projects. Great Mountain Site Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization. Great Mountain Site 2 Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization. Hope Hill to Sabbath Hill Road Rehabilitation. Little Dix Hill Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization. Bob's Gas Station Slope Re Stabilization and Road Rehabilitation. Ballast Bay Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization. Long Trench Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization. Asphaltic Concrete Works Road Surfacing to all project sites listed above. Two, prepare an environmental and social management plan for the projects. Conduct a climate risk vulnerability assessment for the projects. Prepare cost estimates and bill of quantities for each project site. Prepare tender documents and assist with tender evaluations. Perform construction supervision for construction contracts relative to each project site and prepare monthly reports on the progress of the construction works. Uh, the, Mr. Speaker, as was mentioned, FDL Incorporation was contracted to perform consultancy services for engineering, design, and construction supervision, and not to carry out construction works. The construction works, whether completed or ongoing, that are associated with the consultancy services have been carried out by local construction contractors. Mr. Speaker, an account of the contractors that were awarded a contract following the conclusion of full tender process conducted by the Recovery and Development Agency that are relative to projects prepared by FDL Cooperation in Consult Corp in Cooperation, uh, providing it in the table that will be given to the Honorable Member. It should be noted that all contracts to date were won by and awarded to local contractors. A summary of the specific project sites for which contracts have been awarded to date and the corresponding contractor is as follows. The contractor for the Great Mountain Site 1 Road Rehabilitation uh, and Slope Project was Outland Heavy Equipment Limited, a, a local contractor. The contractor for the Great Mountain Site 2 Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization Project is Outland Heavy Equipment Lim Company Limited. The contractor for the Hope Hill to Sabbath Hill Road Rehabilitation Project was Quality Construction Limited. The contractor for the Little Dicks Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization Project was Caribbean Environmental Restoration Limited, a local contractor. The, lo the contractor for the Bob's Gas Station Slope Rehabilitation, Slope Re Stabilization and Road Rehabilitation Project was Caribbean Environmental Restoration Limited. The local contractor, the contractor for the Ballast Bay Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization Project is a joint venture between Store Enterprises Limited and Outland Heavy Equipment Company Limited, both of which are local contractors. Mr. Speaker, contract MCW slash 004M slash 019 signed between the Government of the Borderlands and FDL Consulting Cooperation had an original duration of 24 months for design, tendering, and construction, and an additional 12 months for the defects liability period, a combined total of 36 months. Despite the complexities of many of the projects, the consultant was able to deliver preliminary and final designs largely in accordance with the original planned duration. Mr. Speaker, it was expected that with the onset of COVID-19, which was declared a global pandemic by the World Health Organization on 11 March 2020, that the pace of the construction projects would be slowed down and in most cases come to a screeching halt for a period of time. This resulted in interrupted tendering processes and construction works. Mr. Speaker, given this unavoidable situation, 
we anticipate that there may be delayed during the defects liability periods. However, it's anticipated that construction works will be completed within the duration of the existing contractual agreement, that is by 21st May, 21st, sorry, February 2022. For D, Mr. Speaker, in my response to part A of the question, I listed nine construction projects that are associated with this consultancy. Six of these projects have been contracted with works either completing or nearing completion. The remaining three projects are currently going through active procurement processes. Mr. Speaker, I will now provide a contractual cost for each of the six construction projects. Great Mountain Site 1, reward rehabilitation and slope stabilization, $196,000. $5.48, Great Mountain Site 2, Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization, $447,461.30, Hope Hill to Sabbath Hill Road Rehabilitation, $744,495.47, Little Dicks Hill Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization, $407,105.60, Bob's Gas Station Slope Stabilization and Road Rehabilitation, $494,308.10, Ballast Bay Road Rehabilitation and Slope Stabilization, $1,054,125.93. Mr. Speaker, you would appreciate that I am unable to discuss the costs associated with projects that have not yet been tendered or are going through an active tender so as not to compromise the procurement process. Mr. Speaker, the full rehabilitation and construction um, hurricane OMA engineering design and construction supervision for the rehabilitation of road slopes and coastal defenses progress report number 11-V00 also is here in its entirety for the member to peruse in which Mr. Speaker would be able to fulfill all the questions asked. Mr. Speaker, this is a dissertation and the Premier should have given it to me before. Premier, I, I, I noticed you mentioned a, a series of projects. Uh, as far as I can remember, and I might be wrong, li li listening to what you said and looking at the schedule here, I thought that one of the, the projects being considered, uh, being undertaken by this company was something out here on Drake's Highway in the Slaney area. There was, there, there was mention of a project uh, that was supposed to be undertaken in this area that was uh, attracting a huge, a huge price and it had raised some eyebrows. Maybe this is, not, this is not the same company that was doing that work. But Mr. Speaker, is this, is this work being overseen by RDA or is done by the Ministry? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for the third, but you know under the rules I couldn't give it to you until I was answering. Uh, but I just needed to clear that up. And second of all, one time I'm accused of too less information, and next time I'm accused of a dissertation, but I, I decide today whatever is there I'm going to give to my last um, set of questions, which I've did in the first questions also previously. The answer is that given that it's a CDB loan, they have both, there are two entities looking at the pro project. This, um, the, uh, the one that CDB has assigned as their project manager and the RDA. So both of them are looking at the project. After the project. Mr. Speaker. I just want to make a statement regarding something that the Premier clarified. My dates, February 21st, that I refer to as election day, I, I'm, I'm quite cognizant that it was poll, uh, advanced polls, but in any, in any event, as far as I'm concerned, that was election day. And the last day of the government was the 22nd. <laughs> Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am aware that the former government signed major contracts on election day February 21st and on their last day in office February 22nd, 2019. Could the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House A, which of these major contracts 
that was signed during the week of election February 18th to 22nd, 2019, was started? And B, which of the projects in A are completed? And C, what reason, if any, are these projects in A still outstanding? One, one minute, Mr. Speaker, because yes, I have it now. Gladly we'll answer that question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, as in question one on a point of information, the most recent election day in the territory, in spite of the member's explanation, was held on 25th February 2019, but I do respect what the member is saying. Mr. Speaker, the contract was signed on advance polling day 21st February, as posed in the question uh, in, from the Honorable Member from, for the third district, Honorable Senior Member. I would like to further remind this Honorable House that any contract signed prior to election day 2019 or on election day 2019 in, is an inherited responsibility of this current administration. Therefore, in terms of A, Mr. Speaker, I have been advised, according to the records, major contracts signed during the 18th of February through the 22nd of February 2019 that was started at 1. Contract NRL forward slash 01M forward slash 2019 was signed between the Government of the Virgin Islands and BVI Dredging Development Limited in the amount of $750,000 for dredging of the eastern side of the Seacoast Bay Harbor on 22nd February 2019 on election day with a contractual start date on the date of the contract since signing. So that one would have begun on election day um, based on the records. Two, contract NRL forward slash 09 forward slash 2019 was signed between the government of the Virgin Islands and Ports and Marina Services Limited in the amount of $750,000 for dredging of the Eastern side of Seacoast Bay Harbor on, well, that would be on the same thing, February 2019. Sorry, I was reading it. Um, the next contract was MCW, do, 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 wait, I think it was two separate signings. So that was two separate contracts. I thought it was the same, but it's two separate contracts. Um, I made a mistake, so I, I was reading the right thing. And, and for 750000 also. So that was two separate contracts signed um, on election day to be started on election day. Um, for, so three, MCW 004M 2019 was signed between the government of the Virgin Islands and FDL Consultant Limited in the amount of $876,250 for consultancy services for engineering, design, and construction supervision for the rehabilitation of roads, slopes, and coastal defense on the 24th February, based on, on, on what we said on election day again, 2019 with services commencing no later than 10 days after the contract signing. So that also was signed on election day. So that was three of them, um, totaling more than $2 million. Contract MOF forward slash 002M forward slash 2019 was signed between the government of the Virgin Islands and Arnold Ansley in the amount of $136,500 for program of reform with the Ministry of Finance, in particular the Ministry uh, on the Treasury. That was something totally different, but nonetheless a contract. Five contract MOF forward slash 003 M forward slash 2019 was signed between the government of the Virgin Islands and BDO Limited in the amount of $928,890.90. Cloud and managed services for the beneficial ownership search, secure search system on 18 February 2019. This contract had a retroactive start date of 1st July 2018, as the records will show. And six, addendum to agreement number 234 forward slash 216 was signed between the government of the Virgin Islands and BDO Limited in the amount of $2,410,614.25 on 18 February 2019. This contract was executed in accordance with a decision from the former cabinet via mo num number 256 forward slash 218. Mr. Speaker, according to the records, agreement number one, 
2016 was not completed on time and the scope of works was increased by government to address additional needs that became apparent during the development of the project. Mr. Speaker, these additional needs included A, onboarding company service providers, B, core onboarding team, C, cloud and managed services, and D, change requests. Mr. Speaker, this contract also addressed the agreement uh, address the agreement by the parties to extend the completion date along outlined in agreement 2344 2016 to 1st July 2017. Therefore, this contract serves as the instrument as approved by the former cabinet to facilitate a retroactive payment for works rendered by the BDO Limited. So that's contract NRL forward slash 01M 2019 has been completed and is closed Contract NRL forward slash 02M forward slash 2019 has been completed and is closed. Contract MOF 002M 2019 has been completed and is closed. Contract MOF forward slash 003M forward slash 2019 has been completed and is closed. Addendum to agreement number 234 forward slash 2016 has been completed and is closed. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for C, uh, contract MCW 004M2019 between the Government of the Virgin Islands and FDL Inco Consulting Corporation is still very much alive as the project's being supervised by the consultant and ongoing. As in my response to answer 1C from the Honorable Member for the Third District, this contract expires 21st February 2022. For D, Mr. Speaker, I have been advised that according to the records, all major contracts signed According to the records that have been as, uh, informed, all major contracts signed between 18 through 22nd of February on election day 2019 have started. Mr. Speaker, I'll provide a memo with all the answers and I'll wait for him to browse them if he has any follow-up that I can answer, given that it was before my time. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the, the Premier could tell me if the contracts for the dredging of the Seacosby Harbor, which was intended to clear the, the harbor for use as a hurricane shelter. Has these contracts for dredging uh, accomplished the objective, given that all the derelict yachts are still in the harbor? Has that objective been, been, been achieved? For, for boats to be able to use the harbor as a shelter in hurricane season, which is now. Mr. Speaker, based on that contract was done before my time, I, I cannot tell if it was to address all of that. I know that there are still some boats in the, in the harbor as far as I see when I pass so there every day. And I know that uh, since we took office, we have done some of the harbors with some more to go. Given the challenges that have come out with COVID-19, financial challenges around the world has caused um, many of the programs to be interrupted and also defraud because funding is an issue as you had to make sure that you kept the lights on during COVID-19 with those 24-hour lockdowns. So I would say based on now, there's still work to be done. But in terms of what all the contract um, that was signed on election day and started on election day, um, was, was supposed to do, based on the research in the files, I've been told that it has, has done it. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has said that the contract was before his time. I don't know what he means by that, if, if it was signed on election day. I, I, I thought that you got elected that same day, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, if the contract was signed on election day, the work was executed on your watch. Mr. Speaker, I will bring the member any answer he needs because the resource that I've shown, I have asked uh, the technical process involved and they told me that the work was completed, that was signed. But if the member has any question at all, I myself will be more than happy to go dig some more and find whatever else the member will be wishing to be informed of because it is the people's money. Mr. Speaker, I'm just simply telling the prim saying to the Premier that this work started under his watch 
The sand was sucked from around the, the derelict boats under his watch. And how can you suck sand from around a boat that's in the bottom, on, uh, sitting on the bottom of the seabed and expect the, 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 the harbor to be cleared for vessels to use? So I'm trying to figure for, if the Premier checked to make sure that this project was completed in accordance to the needs of the, the government and the territory. Mr. Speaker, the contract, the work maybe have done while we took office, but the, the scope of works was signed before we took office. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I can only say that a contractor did what it is he was contracted to do, which was signed before we took office. So even when we did take office, those who are managing the, the, the contract would have had a, would have probably only be holding the contractor to what he signed it to. Now why it didn't include the boats is something that I myself have questioned, but it seems from all indication that it didn't include the boats, but it's something that we continue to work on harbor by harbor that was affected during um, hurricanes or my Maria. Mr. Speaker, I just want to tell the Premier that when those boats are removed, there is still work to be done because it's impossible to dredge the harbor and have those boats sitting there. And after the boats are removed, the harbor is still dredged. I mean, it's, it's just impossible. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the BVI Airports Authority has a development fund for which a fee of $20 is collected from passengers to be used for development. Could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell us, Honorable House A, what was the balance of the fund at the end of each year since its establishment? B, how much money was deducted from the fund for each of the years since its establishment? C, the current balance of the fund, and D, what exactly was the money taken from the fund used for? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the BBI Airport Authority has developed a development fund for which a fee of $20 is collected for, from, from passengers to be used for development. Mr. Speaker, is what the question states. So, Mr. Speaker, the balance of the development fund held by the BBI Airport Authority for which a fee of $20 is collected from passengers is as follows. 2012, the balance was $943.47. 2013, the balance was $978,363.47. 2014, the balance was $258,110.64. 2015, the balance was $58,427.43. 2016, the balance was $65,636.80. 2017, the balance was $34,988.97. 2018, the balance was $238.97. I repeat, in 2018, the balance was $238.97. In 2019, when we took over, up to the end of the year, the balance was zero. And in 2020, in the middle of turmoil, the balance was $454,628.94. In 2021, thus far, the balance is $317,000 and $317,010.78. Just again, in 2020, the balance is $454,628.94. Mr. Speaker, I've been advised that the amount of money deducted from the fund for each year since its establishment is as follows. Mr. Speaker, in 2012, $0 deducted. In 2013, $600,000. In 2014, $1,212,080. In 2015, 
$199,925.30. In 2016, $492,932.12. In 2017, $30,407.93. In 2018, $38,145. In 2019, zero. In 2020, $377,397.06. And in 2021, $249,306.23. Mr. Speaker, the balance in the fund is $317,010.78. Mr. Speaker, exactly how the money uh, the, in the airport development fund was used is detailed, and I have it here, Mr. Speaker, and I attach report of each year. Um, Mr. Speaker, it's very detailed. in. 2019, $600,000 went out to buy three fire trucks. In 2014, the, which total $600,000? In 2014, now the total that the um, deducted was $1,212,080, uh, where transferred to main operational account $180,000, transferred to main operational account $300,000, consultancy boy group $32,080. So transfer to main operational account seven hundred thousand dollars. In two thousand fifteen, transfer to main uh, operational account one hundred thousand. Payment to co consume law for consultancy thirty five thousand six hundred ninety one dollars ninety two cent. Payment of salaries fifty three thousand five hundred fifty eight dollars sixty two cent. Payments of salaries ten thousand nine hundred six hundred seventy four dollars seventy six cents with a total of $199,925.30. In 2016, payroll assess assistance for the year 2016, $492,932.12, which is the same uh, for the total, because that's all that came out that year. In 2017, payroll assistance for the year 2017, $30,470.93, and that's the total also. In 2018, 50% deposit for walkthrough metal detector, $38,145, and that's the total also. In 2019, no deposits or purchases. Um, in 2020, we have a total of $377,297.06. Personal, the tracker, $201,000 and change. Personal, Deposit for construction welcome center twenty thousand. Uh, deposit for enclosed of arrival area fifty seven thousand five hundred dollars. Survey of Teddy Bay International Airport five thousand five hundred dollars. Development business plan for capital investment thirty three thousand four hundred forty seven dollars. Conceptual design for new runway one hundred thousand dollars. And two thousand and twenty one, a total of two hundred forty nine thousand three hundred six thousand twenty three cents. With the following deductions, second payment for development of business plan, mobilization fee for arrival, area renovation, investigation of security control for Amber Group Management Solution, payment for arrival, area renovation, uh, supply of tiles, BBI AA administration building, completion of windows and doors installation for BBI administration administration building, supply of tiles, departure hall and terminal rooms, payment for business plan, forensic audit services, variation installation of additional lighting, and all of it is here at the disposal of the member. So that is how the, the monies were accounted for from the 2012 to the date, and also how each of the deduction, the amount of deductions and what they went towards. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I have a minute to look at this?
Mr. Speaker, the operative word here, Mr. Speaker, is a development, development fund, which I was there at the time this fund was established, Mr. Speaker, I was a minister. And it was done under, well, well there was some reluctance to do it because it was a tax being added to, to, to the traveling public. But it was for a good cause, which was development. But Mr. Speaker, when I look at the page that I get here from the Premier, regarding the use of the fund, the purchase of three fire trucks, how could that be development, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, transfer to main operational account. Transfer to payroll or salaries, payment to salaries. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier if he would agree with me when I say that these funds were not used for the purpose they were intended. What, what years was and, that? And Mr. Speaker, I, I understand the years, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, given that we understand the use of the funds, which were necessary, it's a necessary purpose they were used, but not for the purpose it was established. The, up, the, the airport cannot function without fire trucks, so you need fire trucks. Salaries has to be paid, else you won't have staff. I wonder if the Premier would agree with me that given that it's a responsibility of the government to run, keep the airport running through subventions if necessary, that all these millions of dollars that were removed from that fund for the purpose or that it was intended, but necessary, if he would agree to fund BVI Airports Authority to that amount of money so that the, the, the development fund could be replenished. Mr. Speaker, the, the, I was listening to the member's question, but I want to make sure you repeat it so I get it accurately, so I can respond as, 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 um, as in-depth and, and accurate and factual as, as possible. So, member, could you go away one last time, please? Thank you. Well, I'm really testing me to see how much I remember. Mr. Speaker, I'm looking at the purpose for which the funds withdrawn from the fund were used. 2013, payment for three fire trucks, $600,000. Transfer to main operational account. This is 2014. On three occasions, funds were transferred to the main operational account. 180,000, 300,000, and 700,000. That's 2014 alone. Also, some monies were paid to the boy group, $32,000. That I can let slide as, as operation. In 2015, Mr. Speaker, transferred the main operational account. Payment of salaries, payment of salaries. You're looking at 100,000, 53,000, 10,000. 2016, payroll assistance for the year 2016, $492,000 payroll. And it goes on like that, Mr. Speaker. 2017, 30,000 for payroll assistance. 50% deposit for walkthrough metal detector, 38,000 in 2018. And Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is given that in order for the, up, the, the, the airport to be functional, which it has to be functional in order for it to operate, these services for which these monies were, were transferred and used were necessary and should have been paid for based on uh, uh, from subventions from the government or revenues collected from the airport other than from this fund. Would the Premier agree that his government should replenish the development fund by crediting the BVI Airports Authority for these services that it used that money for? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to tell, thank the member for that because at a glance, it would seem like that would be the most feasible thing to do. But 
what I was trying to explain in the earlier part of this sitting was that the deficit received, and I have my figures here, did not just start in 2019, as you can see, with the BVI Airports Authority. There was a deficit that was keep being coming forward. And given the challenges of monies in government, even prior to the COVID, which would have been 2017, in fairness to any government that had to go through to category five, it would have been one in which they would have had to see how to quote unquote keep the lights on. And some of that money went towards the um, paying of a lot of the operation cost. But it still recognized some deficit. And I, what I was showing is that the deficit continues to come forward. And yes, sometimes we get it paid on more and sometimes it goes up and central government puts in more money and it goes down. And sometimes we get it paid off, but because of the airport um, what is in need of the project which everyone shuns from, the need to extend the airport to have, as we say in our culture, the dance pay for the lights is urgent. Now, I would say to you, member for the third, that you are correct, that it would be the best thing to do, but central government does have some challenges financially in terms of high demands and limited resources coming in the wake of two category five and still in the middle of the rough seas of COVID-19. Those cannot be discarded when we're talking about the finances of this country. However, we continue to survive, uh, but we must recognize that it's not business as usual. The airport can eventually, as the numbers show, pay for itself with some expansion. We are not going to go into the almost $200 million that was being proposed before our time. But at this time, all indications as we work with the RDA at this time, we are looking at at least 1,000 to 1,500 feet and uh, how we go about the funding of that because that would call also for some work to be done on the terminal, but it will be done in, in project managed independent of government, but it still needs to be done. Until you do that, member, the, the central government will continue to put more money into BVI Airports Authority, and also the need would come in where that fund would have to be used, uh, whether you're correct, just for developmental reasons. If you'll notice, um, after a while we try to use it just for developmental reasons and developmental purposes, but it is a challenge right now. You would recognize that for 2020, most of the months uh, saw no activity at the airport. And uh, with no activity at the airport, that created quite an even further stir in the finances of the airport. And the central government at the end of last year and even to this year um, have been putting more money in it so that we can keep the airport going. But the, the, the longer term solution is the projection from all consultancies um, done on the airport shows that we can have the airport um, paying for itself without any subsidy from government any further, but it will require the expansion. The truth of the matter is all reports show that if you do not expand the airport um, and you leave as is, there's a chance that you would not have an airport. So doing nothing right now is not an option, but more of those plans of the expansion will be forthcoming because we have just about a clear way forward of how to deal with it so that the concerns that you have rightfully raised could be no more, but it still will take a little while before we get there. But, Mr. Premier, 
I still want a clear answer on whether or not you agree that given that these sums were, outsta were outstanding prior to the elections of 2019, uh, the funds have, were being depleted prior to the elections of 2019, which I'm sure on your platform you promised the people that you were going to replenish the funds. By now they should have been replenished. I still want to hear from you, Mr. Premier, whether or not you're going to replenish these funds, given that they were used for a purpose other than which they were intended, and the public are being, the contract that we have with the public is that this $20 is going to be used for development purposes. That did not take place. And another thing I noticed that in 2019 it says, no deposits, no purchases. Where, what happened to the monies that were collected in 2019? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, for the members' uh, follow-ups. I didn't promise the public anything with BVI Airports Authority, so I wanted to make sure the record reflects that this government didn't say anything along that line of the vein in which we are speaking. We did promise to look at the airport and the extension. And I would say that the member is correct in, in terms of, if I quote you correctly, that the funds, what they were uh, allocated to be uh, spent on were not spent on prior to the 2019 when we took office. Uh, I do see, however, in fairness to the sitting government coming out of two category five hurricanes, in fairness to them, and um, being a minister of finance, why they would look for some kind of, of outlet financially to keep the institution going because that, at that time in 2017, it definitely was a trying time. Um, so I cannot say that they, they covered it with the paperwork to say, well, this is the reason. But if looking at it from a, a rational eye, I would say that had to be the reason. I don't believe on, in, the, in, 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 in playing politics with something that seems very, very clear to be common sense because the way the money was spent has been accounted for just mean it was not part of development which is the what the policy and agreement stated for i do not see right now um, how we are not putting it back because we have subsidized the bvi airports authority very heavily and no failure of theirs because they have been put in that deficit for quite some years so it's always a catch-up we are playing to make sure that everything stays within even what is expected of them with their, regu um, with their regulators. So I cannot say that the money will be put back in in the manner in which you have uh, described, but the money has been put back in, I will say two times over in, in making sure that we help the BVI Airport Authority and we still have to help them more in um, uh, right now and in a couple months until everything picks back up, slowly it's picking up in terms of flights right now. Um, with, since the reopening of December, I think that uh, lately they are seeing more increase. The last spike uh, created uh, just a little drawback, but not much, because the figures are there to show that the most active month for tourists coming to the Virgin Islands since the reopening of our borders in December 2020 was July, ironically. So well, I think it was 7,208 uh, visitors with most of them coming through the TB Letsam Airport, so International Airport. So once that continues, that will start to take some burden off of central government having to subsidize them heavily, but still would have to do so to some extent. But you are correct, the deficit has been moving forward before the 2019, and you are correct that it was not spent what it was assigned to be spent before the 2019 and um, the only thing i can say is that i don't see us putting in it, um, more monies just to replenish that given all that's needed to put in just to take care of the deficit and run the airport it will be a little fast stretch for us financially at this time with the challenges we're experiencing with COVID 19. So I hope I've answered the member's question as thoroughly as I can. I don't know if I'm answering it to your liking, but at least I know that I've answered it as factually as I can. Thank you. Huh? 2019, no money was deposited. 
With that, I have to check and see what the, the, the issue with that, because that's a new question, and that is clear zero. I will have to get that information and bring back to you. I really don't want to, to speculate, because that there, I will make sure that I get that details and bring to you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, a, a good example of what I was talking about is what, what happened with the NHI. The NHI, you give $7 million to clear up a promise that was made from its inception. So we have to get these balances straight, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. What you say with um, the NHI mean? Oh, NHI, you gave them $7 million to clear up okay. something that was promised earlier in the, from their inception. Okay. So you need to do something like this. Okay. Now, I want to thank the member, if, you, if, you, if I may, Speaker. Yes. The, the $7.5 million that was given to NHI during the stimulus, um, I'm glad that the member brought it up. Uh, that was money that was owed long before we took office. As a matter of fact, you said it correct. It was monies owed to NHI from the inception. And that money was part of the $40 million that was deducted automatically by Social Security, which would make the international claim that $40 million was shared to friends false, even $7.5 million, million less, um, and even more to come. But time will reveal that that was not a correct statement. But let us not um, drift into anything else right now. What I would say is that the set, out of the $40 million grant that came from Social Security, $7.5 million of that was deducted automatically and paid to NHI by Social Security for monies that were owed before our tenure from the time NHI started that was to be finished paid. As you would know that NHI, in, in our humble opinion, in my humble opinion, was a good thing but the Minister of Health that brought it did a very good job, but it was supposed to be able to build up the fund for a year or more before anything came out. But I guess with the other colleagues, with the political pressure, before anything really went in, plenty started to come out. And we will know up to this day, NHI has not catch itself or caught itself as, um, as yet. Uh, and the deficit keeps rolling on. So in the middle of the pandemic, when we thought we'd get more money to help the people, Social Security reminded us, not so fast. That startup money has to be paid now, but that still doesn't have to do with the other monies that are still outstanding before that 7.5. I want to make that clear because we still have monies outstanding to NHI. So member of the thought, you are correct, but the reason that none of that went to the airport was because the money came from Social Security. And you would know member of the third very well, being a businessman and a, and a man that I ultimately respect with numbers, that if you owe me and I'm giving you money, I will take out what you owe me before I give you the rest. And that's what Social Security did with that outstanding $7.5 million out of the $40 million. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, question number four. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House whether A, the duty-free facility at Cyril B. Romney Tortola Pair Park is active, and B, how exactly does it work? C, how much revenue was collected by Her Majesty's customs from merchants at the Pair Park for each of the, the years 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you know, governments are a continuum, and this is another model that we met that we are um, trying to make it work because the member for the third has been very consistent on asking about this even before my tenure. So I went and took meticulous notes to make sure that I can answer this as in-depth as possible for the member of the third district and the senior, one of the senior members in this house. Mr. Speaker, the duty-free facility at Cyril B. Romney Tortola Pair Park 
is active. Mr. Speaker, how exactly does it work? Mr. Speaker, it is important to know that my government was able to secure office accommodations at the Cyril B. Romney Tatola Pair Pack for the Customs and Immigration Department in 2021. The Cyril B. Romney Tatola Pair Pack, in accordance with Schedule 2 of the Tourist Duty Free Shopping System Act 2015, known as Tatola Pair Pack, means the area whose boundaries are defined in Schedule 2 designated a customs area within the meaning of the Customs Management and Duties Act 2020, 2010. is a customs area and this facility was operating from its inception without customs offices to facilitate the tourist duty free shopping system. This accommodation, which is being occupied by the Customs Petroleum and Concession Unit, will now allow the department to service the tourist duty free shopping system and facilitate the clearance of the cruise passengers while enforcing other customs legislation, including commercial licenses and cruising permits, ordinance, etc. This facility operates as a bonded warehouse where the import duty is secured by a guaranteed bond for all duty free deposited goods in accordance with the Customs Management Duty Act number no. 6 of 2010. Securing an office facility was a request made by the Customs Department and facilitated by the management of Cyril B. Romney Pair Pack to mitigate the challenges faced in effectively and efficiently executing their duties at the Pair Park. With that being said, the processes of the license operators at Cyril B. Romney Pair Pack are as follows. All custom entry declaration forms for imported goods to be entered into the pair pack must be prepared and submitted via customs automated processing systems caps with all the requisite documents by or on behalf of the licensed duty-free operators. Entries are reviewed and proposed by the Petroleum and Concession Unit. After full validation of entries, a summary is generated and returned to the declarant to proceed for further cargo processing inspection. Approved goods imported are exempted from all taxes in accordance with the Tourist Duty Free Shopping System Act 2015. The declarant would then present the, this declaration form to the officer at the port of entry for verification and release of shipment to the duty free warehouse stores at the pair pack. The petroleum and concession unit will be notified by the importers or its agents of delivery of the shipments to make arrangements for inspections to ensure goods are accounted for and deposited into the warehouse or stores. During inspection, if there are any discrepancies, officers will report their findings for further action. If there are no discrepancies, goods are then released. All duty-free operators are required to submit a spreadsheet provided by customs to record information on all local and foreign sales. Additionally, the licensed duty free operator must provide proof of sales. This submission are due on the 5th of each month. The Tartola Pair Pack Duty Free Warehouse Export. Customs must be notified of all goods imported duty free that is scheduled to be re exported other than store sales. These goods must be exported under customs supervision. Importer or exporter will be required to complete an export declaration. An export entry, which will be reconciled with the import entry, must be prepared and submitted to customs for checks and balances. Entries are then submitted, reviewed, processed, and validated by customs for shipment. Goods are then inspected and sealed for shipment. In terms of C, Mr. Speaker, the duties collected by customs from licensed duty operators at the pair pack for the following years are as follows. 2016, $49,855.36. 2017, $76,288.94. 2018, $89,211.44. 2019, $113,195.85. And so far in 2020, 
$16,791.60. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I give to the member in case he has any follow-up. I thank you. Mr. Speaker, according to the Premier, this new process of placing customs and immigration at the Pear Park has just begun, I think it was last year, Premier? Last year? On site. On site, yeah, it was the last, that's 2020? 21. Oh, so it just happened in 21? No, no, on site. On site. I, I understand, on site. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. On site in 21. It seems to be a, a rather sophisticated method for ensuring that government receives the revenue that it's entitled to. And I applaud you for that. It seems, that based on the outline that you gave, it seems it's something that can work. My question, Mr. Speaker, is, that, is how was it carried out? How was it executed before? And was it effective? Mr. Speaker, it's effective now, and it'll continue to be effective. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I think the Premier missed my question. I wasn't talking about now. I, I applaud him for now, but I was asking the question before. Obviously, he must have noticed there was a deficiency why he did it now. Uh, as he said, my questions were being asked for a long time. And also, Mr. Speaker, as I said before, that these questions was, was, were posed since June 17th, and today they may seem dated, which I noticed when I asked the Premier about whether the facility was in place, if it was active, he said yes. I wanted to know if it was active during the time of the pandemic while, we were shut, while, while there were no cruise ships coming in. That's what I really wanted to know back in the 17th. Maybe he could answer, was the facility active the um, duty-free facility active during that period while there were no cruise ships coming into the territory. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll have to resource a file given that the member is asking about a time frame prior to my taking office. I know that the member has asked a lot when I was in the opposition as one of his uh, colleagues on the same side, um, but uh, now that I'm a premier, I've heard you ask it, and uh, the last time you asked, I did promise to make sure that I get a thorough, thorough um, report on it and also to make any adjustments. When I did receive the report, to my recollection, I realized that there was some work needed to be done, and the, the financial secretary, especially the one that's now and the, the head of customs uh, were able to tell me what all was done before, but what we were going to do to make sure that we improved upon it so that we would have been acting fully within um, the confines of the act that governs this, this initiative. So I am confident now, uh, for the most part, given some areas still of improvement needed, but that we are operating within the confines of the act to collect whatever government revenues needs to be collected. The reason why it wasn't done before, could you allow me to research, or if you bring back a substantive question, I'll also get it. So whichever one you want done, I'll research and try to get that answer for you. But I don't want to mislead this honorable house and, and give a wrong answer, uh, because I may have to come back and, and uh, correct it, which, which is not bad because it would not have been done willfully, but I want to avoid that as much as possible. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the Premier saying that he, that, that particular question, he would like me to rephrase or bring back at a, at a later time. But I wonder if he could really answer the one that I asked regarding the facility, the duty-free concession. Was it active? During the time, there were no cruise ships coming into the territory. Yes, Mr. Speaker, that's what I'm saying. That even to that path of it, I'll have to make sure I see because I was prior to my time, and I want to make sure that I research the files thoroughly and be able to answer the member. Thank you. 
No, Mr. Speaker, this couldn't be prior to your time. I'm talking about during the pandemic while there were no cruise ships coming in for that particular year. Oh, I thought you were talking about with Irma. So, so there was two different times when the cruise ship stopped, Irma and now. So you're talking about now? No time. Oh, yes. As you can see, the figures are there to show how much we have been collecting. And even when you use the word um, active, in fairness, even to the prior administration, there were funds that um, were collected. It's just that it wasn't as active as it is active now. Mr. Speaker, I, I think the Premier is confusing me, probably deliberately, but I, let, me, let me elucidate my question. The duty-free concession being active, meaning it means that goods are being entered duty-free. That's what it means. Not that you're collecting money. If you're collecting money, it, it's, it's okay. But were goods being entered duty-free during that period? This, the cruise ship period? Or you mean overall? At the cruise ship pier. At, at Cyril B. Romney, uh, Cyril B. Romney Tortola Pier Park, were goods being entered duty free? Mr. Speaker, I will make sure that I get the answer research and bring it back for you so that we could be abundantly clear on that. But I'm pretty much sure that it was. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for several years across this and last administration, the opposition has been stonewalled and at times downright refused answers relating BVI Airways and an associated missing $7.2 million of government funds. Can the Premier and Minister of Finance please, A, tell this Honorable House whether his government is actively pursuing the retrieval of these monies, B, if the answer is yes, how is it being done? And C, if the answer is no, why isn't it being done? Mr. Speaker, one of my family's favorite uh, sitcoms that they like to look at is Golden Girls and and the old lady would, would say, they would close her mouth because they would say Mana don't say anything and this one is leaves me tempted but given that that um, I'm on my best behavior today I'm confused when the member asks me for several years across this and last administration I could take the last, but this, that the opposition has been stonewalled and at times downright refused answers. The reason that that has me mind boggled, Mr. Speaker, is that the persons who can give him the answers are over there with him. But nonetheless, that was not part of my answer. That was part of the golden girl's slip of the mouth. Mr. Speaker, while your government is an advocate for transparency and accountability, and while these two standards of governance and democracy are important, however, Mr. Speaker, Speaker Standing Order 17, subsection 1 of this Honorable House sets out the parameter by which questions can be asked in this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 17, subsection 1, G4, states that a question shall not be asked which deals with matters referred to a commission of inquiry or within the jurisdiction of the chairman of a select committee. Mr. Speaker, this question falls squarely into that category as the commission of inquiry has requested this information which spans the tenure of this current administration as well as information of similar nature for immediate past administration. In addition, Mr. Speaker, this matter is also part of an ongoing criminal investigation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these are things that I wouldn't know unless I ask. And I, I thank the Premier for enlightening me. 
I, I, I presume that I can deduce from his answer that he would be more than willing to give me that information when the time comes, if it comes. Mr. Speaker, question number six. Mr. Speaker, question number six. By mutual consent, I have agreed to withdraw this question on the condition that you will put it on the order of the day for the next sitting. If you can, if you can agree to that, Mr. Speaker, I will withdraw the question. Okay, Honorable Member, we will transfer your question to the 12th city. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number seven, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, legislation provides for the charge of a levy on fossil fuel imported into the territory and placed into a fund for the purpose of improving our, territory, our transportation infrastructure network. Mr. Speaker, can the Honorable Premier Minister of Finance please tell us, Honorable House, A, the amount of money collected for each of the years 2010 to 2020, and B, whether this money collect, collected went into the fund as mandated by law. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure always to answer this honorable house dealing with the people's business. Mr. Speaker, sir, the total amount of money, namely the charge of a levy on fossil fuel, imported into the territory that was collected for the years 2010 to 2020 is $10,527,620. The breakdown of this sum is illustrated in Appendix A, which I'll go through. It must be noted, Mr. Speaker, as for the budget estimates, the monies are expected to be paid into the Consolidated Fund as revenues described as fossil fuel surcharge, and the established procedure was to periodically transfer those monies to the Transportation Network Improvement Fund. Mr. Speaker, the revenues collected since inception were paid into the Consolidated Fund first, and transactions were completed to recognize the amounts due to the Transportation Network Improvement Fund in order to be in compliance with the governing legislation. Then, Mr. Speaker, this practice changed during 2012, when the government of the Virgin Islands, and note the date 2012, when the government of the Virgin Islands embarked on the project to improve its business services, accounting systems, and financial reporting, including its cash portfolio. With the assistance of experts, certain statutory funds were eliminated because of inactivity or other reasons, and the cash was instead transferred to the Consolidated Fund to improve earnings on current accounts and investments. And the annual accounts would now be prepared in accordance to an international standard. The International Public Sector Accounting Standard, IPSAS, which were officially adopted through the Public Finance Management Act 2012 and January 2013. As the computerized accounting systems were upgraded and a new chart of accounts came into effect. It must be noted, Mr. Speaker, that it may have been an oversight that the appropriate amendment to repeal the Transportation Network Improvement Fund was not done, being that the fund was no longer recognized in the audited annual accounts of 2012 to 2016. However, in June 2020, the Transportation Network Improvement Fund was reactivated and the revenues collected were then paid into the newly created account. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Mr. Speaker, I was looking for the breakdown for each of the years. I don't see it. You, you asked it again in question nine, so I could do it then. Oh, I, I, it's in a subsequent question? You have it in question nine. I, could you, could, I didn't hear you. No, in, you, you have a series of questions in on nine? it. You just um, give it a break in question eight, okay. but you came back to it again in question nine. Okay. So I think your answers will be there, because those were the specific questions then. Mr. Speaker, even the Premier can't believe what he just said regarding what happened in 2000, 2012. Mr. Speaker, th th that, that's, a, that's a law. It's the law. You don't just talk about some accounting principle or method that you establish and you, and you abandon the law. So I, I want to see what happened to these monies? Who were authorized to take these monies without an amendment to the legislation and do something else other with them? From 2010 that I asked up until 2020, Mr. Speaker, that money, the, the $10,527,000, should have gone into the transportation network. Is this your follow-up, Honorable Member? Mr. Speaker, could the Honorable Premier tell me, other than the reversal of that action, which he's made in 2020, other than that reversal, and I commend him for that, what is he going to do about that $10 million that was supposed to go into the network, which the network so badly needs? Is he going to replenish that? Well, Mr. Speaker, like other reports, I would wait on the report from the Public Accounts Committee to know the way forward. Thank you. That's what I call sticking it to the man. Okay, okay. I, I applaud you for that. That's a good answer. I can't argue with you on that one. I will see to it that the Public Accounts Committee get move, move on it hit forward with. Question number eight, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House, A, how much of the funds collected under question seven, A, went into the capital fund for the purpose of, for the purpose it was intended for each of the years 2010 to 2020, and B, if the money did not go to the capital fund, where did it go? Glad the answer, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, this is dealing with the period 2010 to 2020. And Mr. Speaker, the record showed that the sum of $500,000 was transferred to the development fund for the year 2010. During the period of 2010 to 2020, and thereafter, the Transportation Network Improvement Fund, TNIF Fund, was not recognized in the most recent audited annual accounts of 2016. The fund seems to have went dormant between 2010 to mid-year 2020. Mr. Speaker, the TNIF Fund, Transportation Network Improvement Fund, uh, also known as TIF, was reactivated in January 2020. During this present government administration and the revenues from there on, uh, thereon were transferred into the newly created account, checking account, which presently stands at one million three hundred and six dollars three sorry one million three hundred and six thousand three hundred and fifty six dollars as of June fifteenth, twenty twenty one. And Mr. Speaker, I am advised that the monies that were not transferred from the TIF fund to the development fund was transferred back to the consolidated funds to improve the cash portfolio in 2012. All monies that were collected for the period 2010 to 2019 and a portion of 2020 remain in the consolidated fund from which the, de from which the development fund received contributions 
based on when the funds were needed for disbursement. Mr. Speaker, as noted in my earlier response, the TNIF fund was reactivated in June 2020, and the revenues for this purpose, which it was legislated to do, thereafter were duly placed in the designated account for the TNIF fund. Mr. Speaker, the TNIF fund stands under this administration at 1,306,000 three three hundred and fifty six dollars as of june 15 2021 and the fund is active once again thank you so much mr speaker mr speaker i, I want to applaud the premier for making that particular fund active again no one would know better than himself and i in this particular house of assembly how important that fund is to the infrastructure of the territory. However, Mr. Speaker, I, I would like to ask the Premier if he has any thoughts as to whether or not he would be amenable to recouping those funds that were lost during the period of 2010 and 2019 to 2012 and 2019 to other things and recoup them back into the Transportation Network Fund. The action is job. Show the people you can handle it. Let me make sure, Mr. Speaker, that I understand what the member is asking. Could he Repeat that so I can get it very clear so that I can answer accordingly. Mr. Speaker, it is obvious that the Transportation Network Fund not being um, serviced by the monies that were collected for it, the funds went elsewhere. It means that the territory's network, infrastructure network suffered as a result. I'm asking the Premier if he would be amenable to committing to replenishing those funds for the purpose so that the road networks in this territory can get what it has been deprived of over those years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm now abundantly clear. Mr. Speaker, the member is correct. This fund was created by a law by the member of the third when he was in government. And if I remember correctly, it was, I was one of the persons that seconded. And it was for the reason being, and the member will correct me if I'm wrong, to make sure that when that money is received out of the cents from the fossil fuel, that it will go directly to a fund so that government does not have to continuously put money into improving road and other infrastructure network so that the fund would fund itself. Mr. Speaker, the member is correct that it uh, has not been um, followed as one would anticipate. It seems to me, because I cannot speak entirely for the past administration, given that that's not on the file, but what I do know, I know now as Minister of Finance, it seems to be that there was a cash flow issue and that was helping the cash flow issue, which caused many of the areas to have the ongoing running deficit that exists now even during my tenure that we are trying to get on the handle while dealing with the regular operations of government and the high demands being placed. And while those who have created it have now moved away to ask me about the very issue. But Mr. Speaker, I would say to the member that I would not be amiable or, or in a position to do anything to preempt the findings of the Public Accounts Committee. I would say that I've done some research to give them quite a head start. And I would wait on the Honorable Member, who is a member of the PAC, so that he can bring that forward so that we all can and see, because it, the B, Public Accounts Committee is a very important arm of good governance in this House. So I wouldn't want to preempt the member from doing his own work.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question nine, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Honorable Premier Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House, A, the current balance of the fund referred to in question 7A, B, how much money from the said fund was transferred to the capital fund for 2021, and C, list the projects that are to benefit from the fund in 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm always intrigued by the members of the third uh, questioning because it always includes a span of years before my tenure and this government's tenure um, of us together and also of this tenure. So sometimes you get so busy that you don't get to do that research, but a member sends you to do it. And I want to thank him for doing that. Mr. Speaker, in attempt to answer his question, the member of the third district's question, I will state and I will proceed as follows. Mr. Speaker, as previously mentioned, the current balance of the Transportation Network Improvement Fund stands at $1,306,356 as of June 15, 2021, in the, and this has been accumulated during the uh, tenure of this administration. To date, no commitments have been made against the fund in terms of to date. For present, Mr. Speaker, no monies were transferred to the capital fund in 2021 because, Mr. Speaker, as you would know, there's a process for that and there's a specific purpose by law if it is to be used, what it has to be used for. So, Mr. Speaker, that has to be followed in before any of that $1,306,356 is used which the member for the third can bear me out based on his vast knowledge of that same act. Mr. Speaker, though, according to the 2021 budget estimates, no projects were scheduled to benefit from the fund in 2021 as yet, because we can still do that at any time, nor scheduled after the presentation of the 2021 budget estimates. But Mr. Speaker, I want to say in terms of collection, the, the, in 2010, $779,792 uh, was collected. In 2011, $1,037,159 $1, was collected. In 2012, $0 was collected. In 2013, $980,208 was collected. In 2014, $909,480 was collected. In 2015, $1,093,884 was collected. In 2016, $1,362,942 was collected. In 2017, $1,121,953 was collected. In 2018, $1,082,263 was collected. In 2019, $1,223,967 was collected. In 2020, $936,013 was collected. So if you do it um, up to the 2020, you have the $10,527,620. But in 2021, now what we do, what has been collected is the million and three because we put it directly into the fund. So that's why it wasn't part of this table. And the member would know that um, 10 million, as you rightfully said before, $527,620 was collected from the Transportation Network Improvement Fund Act. But as you rightfully have stated earlier, member for the third, if I, I borrow your words, none of it went into the improvement of the roads, nor did it go into the improvement of any infrastructure, as was legislated. Um, it all went into the uh, consolidated fund and disbursed in different areas. And, uh, but uh, we have started that since our tenure to make sure that all of it goes as legislated. Uh, had all of that been done, we probably would have been driving on better roads and better infrastructure at this time. Nevertheless, government is a continuum, so I have inherited it with my government, and we 
uh, on the verge of fixing it. And I thank you for your question. And if you have any follow-up, I'm be more than willing to answer. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to make an observation. And I'm, I'm looking at your government, and I see you, first district. Your deputy is from the seventh district. Member for the fifth. The minister for transportation is from the fifth district, and the member for. The ninth district is a member of, are members of your administration. And this particular fund that I'm here talking about speaks to the heart of what goes on in our districts. It makes you or breaks you. And I don't expect to see your administration with ministers from districts allowing this to happen, what took place over the past years. So, so I, I, I stand here commending you for, for for um, making sure that that fund was reactivated. Mr. Speaker, I just want to ask the Premier, can he, can he make a commitment now that before this year end, those monies sitting in, the, in, the, in, in that fund will be, would be um, activated for use on projects in our various districts, uh, not in our various districts, in the territory. Once you cover the territory, you cover the districts that this money will be used, this $1,306,000 will be used for the purpose for which it was intended before this year and that he would appropriate these monies for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was trying to see what all they had for it. I would say to the member, just like we did with the money services money, specifically targeted for certain purposes, just like we did with the asset um, um, seizure in terms of, of drug seizure, et cetera, and targeted for certain purposes. This has already been legislated, and I commend you, sir, for when you pass this um, legislation. And in doing so, I remember we worked on it to make sure it was targeted for a specific purpose. And once recognized that this was not being done, we moved to make sure that we acted according to the law. And we made sure um, the, that we have everything up and running. This is part of an overall plan with us putting the money there. Because once we get the, 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 plant, the plant, the astral plant that was purchased by government up and running, then we can utilize that money to get a lot of work done from Anigada to Justin Dykes and, and for, for way less money because it'll be doing by government. That is what the TIP fund was for. And we have um, the COVID-19 caused us some delays from moving forward as a, as a team was supposed to come in and set up the, the plant, the new paver and the milling machine is there to come. So, so government now is investing that money now in-house so that we can get more done for the people. Because in the past, uh, the 10 million and change went in the consolidated fund and was observed, as you rightfully has pointed out today. And you would know, given your technical expertise, member for the third, what $10 million could have done for our road infrastructure. Uh, it would have done quite a bit, even had we had our own asphalt machine and our own um, um, a milling machine, so to speak. So there is a plan by Public Works. I know that the, the current Public Works um, director and the minister um, have not revealed the plan in terms of what all be done yet until they get the full machine up and running. COVID-19 created some delays. I won't steal the Minister of Transportation's thunder um, in that we are all one government, yes, but he deals with it day to day. But those are the areas that I know that I can remember in, in researching it. So you will hear how that one million change will be spent. And I know that the people of the Virgin Islands are going to be happy that, the, the, as you rightfully said, that we have gone back and do what is correct by staying within the confines of the law and allowing for the monies to hit its target group. I would say, member, that one of the things that I've learned um, in politics over the years, and I, I thank you for this, 
um, in the years we spent together, the 20 years together on the same uh, political side. We're still on Team BBI's side, but on the same political side, is that when you did this um, act, you did state that you were tired of money just going into the consolidated fund and not being able to go and hit its target. I remember when you said that in your presentation um, of this bill in the second reading. And when I remember that, I tell my members, even up to today, that's the reason we target some funds so that we can make sure that they go specifically to what they are intended to do. Or we would see the whole budget be spent and that money be absorbed in the consolidated fund and it disappears like vapor and there's nothing to show. Although there was an act that specifically specified how much monies out of what is collected should have gone to deal with those matters. So I want to thank you for that. And that has paid fruit and yield dividend. Even now as we go towards constructing high schools, the, the new high school to move the children from CTL into to, um, the campus, um, the Minister of Education can know that that has paid dividends with, with us having access to that fund from the money services to help with that and in help in some other areas, even as they go to do certain things, dealing with the insinuator, 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 sorry, it has helped tremendously. So I want to state um, thank you. And yes, you will get the full plan, but allow for the machinery to finish. There'll be some of it to land and also to be set up. Hopefully there'll be no more delays through COVID. And you, whether from District 1 to 9, will see the benefits of the act that you under the Virgin Islands Party government at the day passed, sir. So I, th I do thank you, and I could give you full credit for that. Mr. Speaker, question number 10. Mr. Speaker, while there are no arguments that horse racing is our number one national pastime, we also know that Ellis Thomas Downs was decimated by Hurricane Irma and gained no government attention since. Mr. Speaker, as Minister Responsible for Development, can the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House, A, if it is in his plans to rebuild the grandstands at Ellis Thomas Downs. And B, if the answer is yes, when? And if the answer is no, why not? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we all, all agree that horse racing is, the, is in the BVI is a national pastime. Mr. Speaker, we also all agree that the Ellis Thomas Downs was decimated in the 2007 hurricanes of Oma and Maria. And we all agree that the facility is in need of repairs. The government is currently in evaluation on how best to complete repairs to the grandstand, given the current lease arrangements that must now be negotiated. And Mr. Speaker, given the delicacy of those negotiations, I will choose to stop there. Mr. Speaker, I would say to the Premier that I sat here and I listened to him in a statement he gave at our last meeting on Thursday, and it was passionate. It, re it related to the ferry terminal in West End, which he would know that during my tenure as minister, I was working on that terminal and getting that terminal because I, I think it's, it's of vital importance to this territory and I applaud him for making sure that it gets done. I'm sure that he would agree with me when I say that this facility sitting in the district that I am responsible for and is advocating for its, re, for its rebuilding, he can share the passion that I have for the facility in my district, and I leave it at that. I think that he understands 
and knows that it needs to be done. But one further thing, Mr. Speaker, I would like to let, let the Premier know that the portion of land upon which Ellis Thomas Downs grandstand sit is not on the lease, it's freehold by government. That portion of land is freehold by government. Thank the member, Mr. Speaker, for that information, and as we carry forward, but I want to reassure the member that all efforts, all efforts are forthcoming to fix the grandstand and to negotiate the best possible deal for the people of the Virgin Islands with these lease agreements that are up and are currently being negotiated. Question number 11, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell his Honorable House, A, whether an assessment of the cost of the damages done to Ellis Thomas Downs was carried out? B, if the answer is yes, what was it? And C, if the answer is no, why not? And can he commit to doing one? Mr. Speaker, I would say to the member this, with, with the utmost respect, the same answer, that we all agree that horse racing in the BVI is a national, is a national pastime. Mr. Speaker, we also all agree that the Ellis Thomas Downs was decimated in the 2007 hurricanes of Omai Maria, and we all agree that this facility is in need of repairs. The government is currently in evaluation of how best to complete repairs to the grandstand and other areas given the current lease agreements that must now be renegotiated re and are being renegotiated. So, Mr. Speaker, I repeat and I give the member my solid word that this is receiving our full attention, but is ongoing with the renegotiation of the lease. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, question number 12. Mr. Speaker, can the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House, A, whether there are bills passed in this Honorable House or the Legislative Council that are awaiting assent from the Governor? B, if the answer is yes, Mr. Speaker, which bills are there and what date were they passed by the legislature? And C, can you give the reason for assent being withheld? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since this government took office, it was made clear that we would have a very aggressive legislative agenda. As a result, many bills were passed in the House of Assembly and assented to by the governor, such as but not limited to Virgin Islands Contractor General Act 2021, the Virgin Islands Whistleblower Act 2021, Virgin Islands Cruising, Cruising, and Home Porting Act 2021, Virgin Islands Gaming and Betting Control Act 2020, Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2020, Data Protection Act, Electronic Filing Act, Electronic Transaction Act, Electronic Transfer of Funds Act. I don't know. I can do it again. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, during our tenure as a government, we have had the most legislation enacted in two years than any other administration with this time, with this same time frame. However, Mr. Speaker, there are three bills passed by the House of Assembly during our tenure that has not been assented to by the governor, in, and this stems back to the last governor. They are the Medical Marijuana, the Amendment to the Drug and Prevention Act, and the Disaster Management Act, in terms of amendments. The Disaster Management Bill was not assented to for the reasons given by the governor that the amendments in the bill infringes on his constitutional responsibility. This matter is still out for the jury. The other two bills were not assented to by the governor as 
was sent to the Foreign Secretary of State for ascension. However, however there are flagged some concerns where discussions are still ongoing. Mr. Speaker, the bills that were passed by this Honorable House that have not been assented to are uh, number 21 of 2020, Virgin Islands Cannabis Licensing Act 2020, passed in the House of Assembly, 30th day of June 2020. Number 22 of 2020, Drug Prevention of Misuse Amendment Act 2020, passed in the Honorable House of Assembly, second day of July 2020. Number 1 of 2021, Disaster Management Act 2021, passed in the House of Assembly, sixth day, January 2021. Mr. Speaker, the Disaster Management Act 2021 has not been assented to for the reasons given by the Governor that the amendments in the bill infringes on his constitutional responsibility. This matter is still out for jury. The other two bills were not assented to by the Governor and were sent to the Foreign Secretary of State for ascension for the first time in the history of the Virgin Islands. However, there are flagged some concerns where discussions are still ongoing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier if the bills that he mentioned that have not been assented to are the ones during his administration. Mr. Speaker, are you sure that there are no bills prior to your administration that have not been assented to? Let me check. Mr. Speaker, there very well may be. I have to check because I vaguely remember the Prison Act that was amended, the correction facility. I remember in the opposition when that was done and that was sent to be assented to and I never saw it assented to. So that may, may very well be one of them that I remember now that you asked um, and pardon my memory even further from the last administration. I do not recall any other, but I will do some more thorough research. But I know within the, my, the tenure of this current government, there are those three um, uh, bills. I must say that um, all the, the necessary legwork legally and otherwise were done before they got to the House. Uh, you know that they were thoroughly uh, vetted by the House and um, the uh, it's these spanned two attorney generals and uh, all the green lights were given that they were not uh, violating any constitutional powers nor were they violating any international um, re regulations or anything at all. But at the end of the day, the, the reasons have been cited why they have not been assented to to date. So I will leave that as for the member. Mr. Speaker, the, the, I, I am even thinking a little earlier than that, that um, prison act. So I'll, tell, I'll talk to you in camera regarding what I'm looking at. But a thorough, a thorough investigation needs to be had or carried out in order to determine all those bills that have not been assented to that we pass in this house. Well, member, if you may, in terms of us making sure that we are as, as um, not only transparent, but as, as thorough in our answers. If you want, um, you can send the question back in terms of for the next sitting so that I, I, I can speak with you and also do research so that I can report to the Honorable House even further back than our tenure to be abundantly clear and accurate with our answers because as you rightfully said the house in many statements this house does a lot of work and um, if there are any way bills have not be assented to it's not a matter of whether it's an NDP or VIP government it's a matter of the institution that 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 looks at the bills and if the institution that is looking at the bills um, have passed all the litmus tests and the, or, uh, which include all the legal parameters and have moved forward for ascension and their, their concerns of the, the, the frequency of which the being held back from ascension is being used uh, as of late, well then this is something the House will have to decide uh, how, the, how this will be addressed because this is not a premier matter. This is larger than the premier now. This is a matter of the House of Assembly and the institution. And I know that this House will not um, uh, pass any bill 
that that will be any issues with any kind of laws, etc., or in, con conflicting with the, the constitutional responsibility of anyone, whether governor or anyone else. I would say too, before we move forward with with, with all those bills, um, check was made with the then Attorney General, and even now of what the concerns could have been legally, and the, we were given clearance that it does not conflict. Um, with, with any responsibility by governor or anyone else. But um, that now seems to be the, the sticking point with the ascension of the bills that have not been assented to. And uh, those are ongoing discussions uh, that are being had. But I will welcome the thorough question for the next sitting so I can do more research so that I can be able to state clearly for you even as far back as the areas where I might have missed that you seem to have some knowledge of that can point me in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know if the Premier would like to have more time than the next sitting that's coming up for this question to be... Re, 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 um, the, the same one that we just answered? Yeah. I would, I would welcome if you, if you um, allow it, because clearly uh, uh, there was a misunderstanding of how far back, and I want to make sure that we answer the house as thorough as possible. So I, I do apologize because it was a misunderstanding of how far back. I didn't recognize that there were more bills that far back, so I have to do more thorough research with my team. So I do apologize. Fine. I have no uh, issue next sitting is the 23rd. That's, next, that's on Monday. Yes, because it's just a matter of us uh, asking the clerk and, um, uh, to see what outstanding bills have not been assented to. Because what, what goes up must come down. So if it went up to the governor's house and it didn't come back down, then that will defy gravity. Mr. Premier, you're so in, in thinking that the, the opposition is always after you that you're only concerned about answering your questions regarding your administration, but... Uh, no, no, no. Um, for, the, for, the, for the record, Mr. Speaker, I'm not concerned that the opposition is always after me. The opposition's job is to be after anyone who's a premier, not Andrew Foy. That's the opposition's job anywhere, anywhere in the world, not after me. I'm just um, a, a, a transient in the position. But that's how oppositions are. Opposition try to be the next government, and the government stay, try to stay the government. And today's opposition might be tomorrow's government, and tomorrow's government um, might have been yesterday's opposition. That is how this uh, goes. So I don't take it personal at all, member. You and I know that we are two old cats that can't be fooled by kittens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, question 13. Mr. Speaker, in response to a recent question on government revenues, the Premier published a list indicating corporate income tax at $13,115.64 for 2018, $72,000 for 2019, $52,133.25 for 2020. Can the Honorable Premier Minister of Finance please tell his Honorable House, how were those figures arrived at when corporate income tax is taxed at 0%? Mr. Speaker, I was here, my technical team said that that last question that I was saying for the 23rd needs a little more time because there's some more work involved. And they just uh, sent a text message, asked me, please ask the member for the 3rd, give him a little more time than the 23rd, because there seems to be some information that is popping up that needs re some extensive research. So if I can ask, with your kind permission, member for the tour to, to have it to the sitting after the 23rd. And you know we have plenty of sittings. We don't run from any at all. So please, I ask you for your kind um, in craving your indulgence in this for the public officers. I have no problems, Mr. Speaker, except that what I see here is that the Premier is ensuring that I show up here at 10 o'clock in the morning. But I have no problems with that. That's what I'm paid for. Premier, okay. your, your answer. 
So the, the okay, so the member could he could he ask yes, a he question? Yes, agree that it will come. Okay, thank you. The next so you could, September. You could ask question thirteen again. This, this, this one would come at, at the other sitting, not the twenty third. Right. Thank you, sir. So he has already read question thirteen. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, upon review of the question being asked, the figures listed relate to the collection of personal income tax and not corporate income tax. Currently, personal income tax is also taxed at 0%. The amounts collected are from the aged areas listed prior to the tax type being zero rated. Mr. Speaker, accordingly, the government revenues for corporate income tax is $2,000 $2, for 2018, $15,805.17 for 2019, $85,395.28 for 2020, during 2018, age revenue in the amount of $2,000 was collected from one taxpayer. During 2019, age revenue in the amount of $15,805.17 was collected from two taxpayers, one in the amount of $15,000 and the other in the amount of $805.17. During 2020, age revenue in the amount of $85,395.38 was collected from two taxpayers one in the amount of $37,707.81, and the other in the amount of $47,687.57. In total, revenue for 2019 and 2020 was collected from a total of three taxpayers. Mr. Speaker, it was further revealed that there, was, there are slight discrepancies between the actual revenue received and the figures being presented. This is mainly due to the timing differences and the upgrade to the JDE system, JDE system, which presented backlog issues in the initial stages. Mr. Speaker, I'll present to the member. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm lost. I thought the Premier said that he didn't have the information for this question and therefore it should be presented. No, question six. Question six, you're still talking about six? No, no. I went back to six. Which question you told me I should? Yeah, I went back to six. You went back to six. Yeah. So you, pre so you proceed. That's, that's, that's all I could give you there. I got confused then. Okay, so, yeah. so we're talking about this. This is the answer to 13 that you just uh, sent me? No, let me give you a better answer to 13. So, much, so many of them. Give me one minute there for me, please. Mm -hmm. One minute for me, please, member. Member for the third. Yeah, 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 I get the wrong one. Yeah. I do apologize to the house on that. Third district. Question five. Third district. So many of them, uh, member, let me make sure that I have. But at least you can see that I've started to answer your question for the next time. So you could hold that until. But that's not complete. No, let's, um, you talk six, no, six was dealing with, six was dealing with the, with the FDL, with, um, with the water contract. So this one here was dealing with, a, with, with what we did in terms of the taxes. So, so what you were talking about recently was that it was back to six. You went back to six and say you can't take it on the no. next sitting? Um, 13. No, we, 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 six is what we said we will bring back. Right. But 13 is what you just read. So this, I was giving you the figures for the taxes. 
So, so I did give you the correct one. But can you take question six at the next sitting? Oh, that's what you're asking. I, I would say leave that also till one more sitting. Let me finish the thorough research. Yes. So I, I, I misunderstand what you're saying. I apologize to you and the house. Yeah, but let, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. The answer that I was given for 13 says, Mr. Speaker, upon review of the question being asked, the figures listed related to collection of personal income tax, not corporate income tax. Uh, I'm Mr. Sorry, I'll remember, just let me, um, just for the proper record, just for the proper record, at the 13th sitting, we're going to have two questions coming forward, the one on the water and the one on the thorough research on bills not ascended to going way back. Those two questions come in on the 13th sitting. Yeah, not, the not on the 12th sitting, but the 13th. Right. Both, both, both of them okay. come in, yes. Sorry, so I just want to be, make sure that everyone is clear. So now we're on to question 13. Yes. And yes, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I don't know why this part of the answer says that the figures listed relates to the collection of personal income tax and not corporate income tax. I, I would have to go back to my, my, my chart that I got from the Premier with those answers, with those, those figures. But nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, accordingly, I'm reading the answer, the government revenues for corporate income tax is $2,000 for 2018 Fifteen thousand eight hundred and five dollars for and seventeen cents for two thousand nineteen, and eighty-five thousand three hundred and ninety-five dollars and thirty-eight cents for twenty twenty. During twenty eighteen, age revenue in the amount of two thousand dollars was collected from one taxpayer. I, I need I need a premier to explain to me what this means. Why is it? that it says the government revenue for corporate income tax is $2,000 for 2018. It says age revenue was collected in the amount of 2000 Does that mean that this person owed that money for, for 20 years and now they're just paying it? Because it, the, the corporate income tax went to 0% back in, was it 2003, I think it was? Somewhere around there, or four? Mr. Speaker, just like how the member has been persistent in his questions about the Transport um, Network Improvement Fund and the BVI Airways and also the Airport Fund, the member for the second has been consistent with these taxes. Mr. Speaker, I, I would like to say that since becoming Minister of Finance, I've been trying to make sure that my team and I address a lot of difficult issues. And without getting the answer from the technical people and, and having you going from back and forth like a tennis ball across the net, I would say that the, one of the biggest issues that we have found is when the conversion came from the uh, accounting into accrual, accounting or whatever, the changes that were done. There were a lot of gray areas before our time that still are uh, being worked out in terms of collection and certain areas with taxes and, and the TIP fund and the, the, the airport funding, etc. As you have seen from the answers, the answer for the transportation network improvement fund has reached a point where we have had that resolved. As you've seen from your answer, the, the, the concerns even with the customs duties and how it's handled at the Cerebral B. Romney Pack has been resolved. As you will see from your answers that we finally have a better grab hold of what can and can be done with the BVI Airports Authority, although the, the, the deficit is, has been before time and that is on the way to be resolved. I would like to tell you, member of the third and the member for the second who have asked this quite a while, this is something that we are working on. 
we're on the verge of, of signing the, uh, to upgrade the system for inland revenue. Um, SIGTAS, I think it is, already been approved by cabinet, and that is going to help us to resolve this significantly because I'm not gonna come to the house giving you answers back and forth. There is some areas that needs the manpower placed on that, especially when we're doing the upgrade of the system that's going to go through file by file by file so we can understand where those lost revenues are and how much exactly they are. All the other answers, as they say on the Old Spice commercial, will be uncivilized to give anybody in this house. So I will ask for some more time to be able to put a neck hold on this problem in terms of getting it under control um, and, and, and to brace it so that it could guide it, not to stifle or to kill, because it's a lot of work. Uh, we signed up for it, but we have gotten a lot of places and a lot of progress in all those other areas that you rightfully and other members have asked. And this is another one of them that this is what we have found as a result of the research. But there's plenty more to do to get this regularized. Thank you, Member. Mr. Speaker, it, 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 it doesn't, I don't want anyone to believe that, le that legislators stand in this honorable house and point fingers at anyone for doing their jobs. I don't want anyone to feel that way. Mr. Speaker, just like I, I look around the territory and I see people driving around with license plates saying PV. And the, the reason those PV plates still existed was because you, you gave some time for it to phase out. Everyone was supposed to be using new plates. And you would have, you would have hoped that people would have jumped for the opportunity to change their plates to a new plate. But it didn't happen in every instance. And the same way I feel, Mr. Speaker, that the government should swallow the cost and issue new plates to those folks who still have the PV plates, instead of having them go out to buy the plates so that the place could be regularized, is what I feel about this. I see, what I see the department doing is making account for monies collected that were in arrears. And someone who owed money in their taxes, I could be corrected, but this is what I understand. Someone who owed taxes for how many, so many other years, how many years there were, 10, 15 years, if they paid it in in 2017, it's recorded as revenue in 2017. If they paid it in... I'm in sorry, the, senior member, you get into your follow-up? Yes, yes, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not hungry yet, so... We well, still I, have a lot of time. I'm just trying to assess... No, we still have a lot of time, Mr. Speaker, don't, don't... I'm just trying to assess whether you're making a statement or you're asking a follow-up question. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to el elucidate my question. That's why I'm doing this. Now that, now that I've, I've, you tried to last my thought, I have to go back to the beginning now and, and try this. <laughs> but anyhow, I'll, I'll continue where I was going. So, if Mr. S Mr. Premier, could you, could you help me to understand and tell me if, this, if my understanding is correct, that what took place is that because the revenues that were owed to government were paid in in 2017, or 2018, it's being listed as revenue in 2018, not necessarily a tax that was collected for 2018, but it might have been for 2006. Is that what I'm seeing here, Mr. Speaker? And before you get up, Mr. Speaker, what I think that, what I think the government should do is, is, is put a cut off on these things, not have it go on infinitum. Cut it off. If, some, if, they're, if they're old, if you have people owing your money, you, you write it off after a certain point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member, as you rightfully said, started over his questions, uh, his, his uh, follow-up. And I must say that I, I, I think that's the longest follow-up that I've ever heard since I'm in the house. So allow me to use my, my um, young enough memory 
to see if I can get it answer. <laughs> he, um, he's even longer than my answers now. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, I understand what the member is saying. And I repeat by saying, in, um, and I do so in the abundance of caution, because I don't know what the research would reveal. But the member is correct that the government will have to make a call on how far back um, when this review is done that it would allow or not allow, especially given these economic hard times that, that exist. Uh, the, how we got here even before Oma is amazing. Um, in my humble opinion, I, I really thought that the certain things could have been done to be more current with, with the collection of revenue. Uh, outstanding revenue, not, not just any revenue, but outstanding revenue. But be that as it may, the officers are now overwhelmed. The system of grade is needed. And um, that, that is going to help significantly to get us current, like we have been able to become current in all the other areas that, that I've stated. I can't say how far back it, it went and they just drop it in, in this year and say, well, all right, um, I found that this money was over in 2006. The fellow finally paid in 2018, so we put it as revenue in 2018. I, I really can't say how they handled it, um, but what I can say is with the time that we um, are craving an indulgence for on another project that we have met and inherited, that we'll be able to get this one rectified in due course. Uh, inland Revenue and all those entities have been working extremely hard, but this new upgrade of, of um, the software and and other equipment and other things that we are getting to Inland Revenue is going to help them by leaps and bounds to not only become current over a time, but also to remain current. And um, it will be at your fingertips. Because these things also create delays with the good standings, um, with the system not being as current as it should be. So we're going to get there. Uh, I thank you for acknowledging that we have improved on other areas that you have brought up before, the transportation network improvement fund that was uh, that was um, not collected in ten million dollars, um, you know, just disappeared in, in ten air through the consolidated fund to do other things and not what it was legislated to do. So I thank you for recognizing our efforts in that. I thank you for recognizing our efforts in finally um, being able to rectify the issues with the the Cyril B uh, Romney. Uh, pay a pack with customs and the duty free and the revenues. I thank you for also recognizing um, our efforts in able of the airport and our efforts in other areas. But this is one that we are still ongoing. So I thank you for recognizing that there's a lot of work that has been done, even in the middle of COVID-19, and and also point out the areas that we still have to work on, and not just on to exploit areas where you know that we we have deficiencies, but also recognizing the areas where we have worked on and recognizing that those areas of deficiencies are being worked on. This is one of them. I cannot give you that answer accurately that it was collected in 2005 and then, I mean, it was a 2005 um, bill, but it was paid in 2018 or 2019. I can't do that accurately, but over a period of time as we update the system, I can answer that question as thoroughly as I've done for the other three or four that you have brought, that you have been bringing for months, that we have finally been able to put to rest today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to thank the Premier for being thorough and forthcoming with his answers. And I look forward to him clearing up any inconsistency that we may have had today in the future. Thank you. Um, Honorable Premier, is my understanding that you are answering the questions for the Transportation Minister? Clarity, if you may, that I need to do with the answer that I, I answered on Thursday. I think it needs some clarity to it. That you answer who? The, the, the opposition leader. So I can put it on the record. Sure. Me, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise because I believe in being as accurate as possible when you bring information to this honorable house. And I don't know about other members, but when I answer, I always try to ask all the technical persons to research as much as possible to give me the, 
the answers as accurate as can be. And if I find any areas where it was not, uh, all the information was not forthcoming and is not as accurate, I have no problem coming back to this house because we rely on our experts around us to help us with these answers. But on checking, Mr. Speaker, there was an error in one of the answers, and I take it upon myself to read, Mr. Speaker, the updated answer for the record of the House, which is question one um, for the, that the Leader of the Opposition asks. Just enlighten us again about the, the question that you're correcting. Yes, question one. Question. Yeah, to the Leader of the Opposition. Question one. Right. So I would like to all, I have to amend okay. this, Mr. Speaker, because it is not, it, it will be in keeping for any member to make sure that the House records are accurate. And, it, and I do apologize that it was not intentional, but the research, further research shows that I need to clear it up. Mr. Speaker, I wish to strike from the record the answer I give to the Leader of the Opposition Thursday, 12th August, regarding his question asking me to provide this Honorable House with a list of all the Cabinet decisions for all Cabinet meetings held between 1st March 2020 through 31st December 2020. Mr. Speaker, let me preface the answer to the question by reminding the, this Honorable House uh, that the Cabinet Office issued a statement on 10th February 2021 in which the Cabinet of the Virgin Islands acknowledged the interruption of the publicizing of Cabinet decisions. Um, publicizing Cabinet decisions was primarily due to the significant increase in the number of Cabinet meetings held in 2020. The almost daily meetings increased from nine, increased to 94 meetings in 2020, when compared to only 42 cabinet meetings in, held, held in 2019. Mr. Speaker, this was due to your government's shift to urgently provide a necessary strategic response to the declaration by the World Health Organization that COVID-19 had been characterized as a pandemic. It is important to note, Mr. Speaker, that the procedures for the confirmation of cabinet minutes were developed for non-crisis conditions. Therefore, it was agreed that the backlog of decisions between 1st March 2020 and 31st March December 2020 will be rectified by the Cabinet and the Cabinet Office will make a determined effort to release those decisions within the shortest time possible. Mr. Speaker, the Cabinet Office had already identified human resource support and had been making good progress. However, I wish to inform this Honorable House that their work has been further halted I can, uh, due to the latest spike, but is now again being moving forward. I can only say that, that uh, the, at this time, that in keeping with standing order 171G4, which states that a question shall not be asked, which deals with matters referring to a commission of inquiry or within the jurisdiction of the chairman of the select committee, I'm therefore unable to provide a projected date when cabinet decisions during this period would be available, but I know that it will be available based on what they're saying in the shortest time frame as it has been in interrupted by the Commission of Inquiry, hence why they were not released prior. Mr. Speaker, your government remains committed to good governance, principles of transparency and accountability, and resume publicizing cabinet decisions covering its first meeting held on 7 February 2021 to present. These cabinet decisions were published in the Virgin Islands Official Gazette and disseminated by the Department of Information and Public Relations. Cabinet decisions can also be accessed on bvie.gov.bg and on Twitter. So, Mr. Speaker, I will conclude by reminding this Honorable House that the majority of cabinet decisions taken at its 2020 meetings were made public as part of government's COVID-19 updates. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, statements were made in the House of Assembly based on COVID-19 related and unrelated cabinet decisions, thereby maintaining government's commitment to being accountable and transparent. Mr. Speaker, um, that is the answer I would like to, to put in the record. And just as a follow-up, Mr. Speaker, to the question that would have been asked, Mr. Speaker, the, the, obviously the cabinet minutes of that period which um, slipped and we were stating the general answer that cabinet meetings are made public. But the ones that were asked by the leader of opposition in that period, Mr. Speaker, was interrupted because of the Commissioner of Inquiry requesting those, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we'll have to wait until they have disposed of them, and then those will be made public. So, Mr. Speaker, it was very important to one clear up this because it was not intentional. But, Mr. Speaker, it is important to come and apologize if you make a mistake to the House. 
and I now give the host the most accurate and up-to-date information. Thank you. I thank you, Honorable Premier, for your transparency and also for correcting the records. Before we move on to the other questions posed by the member for the third, I'm going to go into a recess, but I don't want members to leave, so we can deal with one or two matters uh, in camera. So this Honorable House is now in recess, but please don't leave the chambers. House in recess. <laughs>
Please be seated. This Honorable House now resumes its sitting. We ended with the question posed by the Honorable Julian Fraser to that of the Premier, and I think there was a decision made subsequently that we will hold off on the Premier answering the questions on behalf of the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities. So in that case, then, we will move to the member for the third district posing his questions to the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration. And we're on page 15 of the order of the day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, work permit holders, and I've learned subsequently that it's, it applies to anyone under immigration control, are asked to provide certificates of good standing for themselves and their employer for, from Inland Revenue, Social Security, and NHI to both the Labor Department and Immigration Department in order to renew their work permit and extend their time in the territory. My guess is that this is government's policy. If this is so, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration please tell this Honorable House, A, what is the objective of the policy? B, why is the employee being held responsible for the employer's good standing? C, why can't the employer's good standing be a yes or no box on the employee's good standing that is checked by the three agencies, Inland Revenue, Social Security, and NHI? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for those questions. They should have been sent electronically, the answers more for the third district. If not, you'll get them subsequently. Mr. Speaker, the hurricanes of 2017 and another pandemic have exposed flaws, inefficiencies, and many undesirable situations in the territory that impact the collection of fees. This policy helps ensure that both entities are in compliance with submitting the government's mandated payments to the delegated agencies, which helps to generate revenue to pay the government's expenditures. The policy also helps to ascertain that employers and employees are fulfilling their legal and moral obligations, many of whom were non-compliant. Mr. Speaker, employees are not being held responsible for the employer's good standing certificates as employers can submit their good stand certificates on behalf of the organizations directly to the Department of Labor and Workforce Development. In lieu of good standing certificates, employers can also submit to the department payment plans that have been negotiated with the relevant agencies. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Inland Revenue, along with Social Development, Social Security and National Health Insurance already have their policies in place and no instruction was given for changes to be made. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Minister says that the Social Security and NHI has their policy in place. As far as I recall, those policies were to issue good standing certificates in cases where companies are seeking something from government and in order to get it they need to provide these good standing. But Mr. Speaker, what I am what I am seeing is that the employee, the employees are the ones who has to take these good standing certificate to the Labor Department and um, what which whatever Labor Department and Immigration. What if the employer doesn't take a good standing certificate to, to, to um, Labor Department Immigration? A poor employee doesn't get, a, doesn't get his permit re renewed. So why, my, my question on that, Mr. Speaker, was when the employee goes to whatever agency, let's say he goes to Inland Revenue to get his, in, his good standing, Inland Revenue should be able to check a box 
on that good standing for the employee stating whether the employer is in good standing or not. And it, that eliminates the process. Of the Mr. Mr. Speaker, land revenue is not required at this point in time. It was originally, but because of issues with the system, we have since required uh, receipts showing that they have applied for good standing. Again, the Social Security and NHI, the employee requires certificate of earning showing that they are legitimately employed. The company has got good standing, which is, which is now for any company. The Speaker, what we find, which is a, a fact, companies and persons do what is inspected, not what is expected. We expect all companies to be in compliance and in good standing all the time. But we found over the years that because it wasn't being inspected, now this forces the companies to do it. And what we found is what you identified a while ago is that many companies have not been doing it. We try not to punish employees for the, for the delinquency of the employees. When that happens, we find a way around it. But what you've described there does happen where some employees absolutely, employers absolutely refuse to provide employees documents. We are working around that issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what I'm trying to, to eliminate is the, if you want to call it double dipping, you can, the, the duplications of efforts. And I'm saying if, if an employee has worked 2020 and he goes for his work permit renewal in 2021, he would have, they would, Inland Revenue would have a record of his taxes being paid. And essentially, you after the employee, you want to have the employee pay his taxes. If you want to have the employer pay their taxes, that's a different story. So the poor employee should have a box on his form that Inland Revenue gives him and checks it off and says, you have paid, your employer has paid all your taxes for you on your behalf. And if you want to know about the employer, you could have a simple, similar box that says yes, no. But the poor employee should not be held as you said, they're not responsible, but that's not my experience from what I've been hearing on the street. Mr. Speaker, let me again clarify that. What we're trying to do here, Mr. Speaker, is to make sure, to ensure that employee, employees who are applying for a permit have legitimate work. We have discovered, Mr. Speaker, that there are several cases where persons are in the territory walking off the grid, so to speak. There's nothing anywhere. A gentleman comes in and says, I want to hire these 10 persons. You go to the workplace to realize not a single one of those persons have actually worked for that employee who brought them in. Mr. Speaker, that's what we're trying to avoid. We've been quite successful through this policy here of making employees prove that they have been working. In the case of a new employee who is in the territory for the first time, it is not required. Because you don't have a history of working here, but if it's a renewal or a transfer, we want to make sure that you are here legitimately doing legitimate work for a legitimate business. That's, what, that's the main aim of that policy. What a member is saying, if the employee is a regular employee and has been paying all the time, it could be a checkbox, yes? It probably is done that way. But when there are problems in the system, that's where there are complications. It's possibly probably five or 10 years with no record of any earnings, absolutely none. But the employee is here now trying to renew your permit. Those are the things we are trying to avoid, Mr. Speaker, to make sure persons who are working here are working here legitimately, doing legitimate work. We got some strange titles, we don't know what they mean. We didn't show up to these places there. The person isn't there, never been there. But the person is here trying to get five permits, six permits, 20 permits for these persons, and no real work for them. Mr. Speaker, it's a problem in this country that we're trying to fix. It's one of many of these kind of problems Illegal working, undetected working, not paying the government its due is a problem. In a time like now with COVID, where our finances are in trouble, we need every penny we can get. And I must commend all those agencies. They have done a remarkable job recovering a lot of money that they have been missing for many, many years. Mr. Speaker, we, ha we had a hurricane of 2017, and we know businesses then were affected severely. Again, we don't punish those businesses who are affected by the hurricanes and the pandemic. We work out payment plans, because we know they can't pay. We the speaker at another category of businesses, some 20 years have never paid a single penny. 
We want companies doing legitimate above the board business. <coughs> Give the government what is the government's due. Country runs on taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I see what it is. It's, you, got a, you got a problem. Mr. Speaker, question number two. Mr. Speaker, with regards to question one, as far as inland revenue is concerned, can the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, Immigration please tell this Honorable House, A, what is the Labor Department expecting to get from these employers' certificate of good standing that they can't find on the employee certificate of good standing? And B, what instructions, if any, has the Labor Department issued to these three agencies regarding the new policy? These three agencies being in Land Revenue, Social Security, and NHI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question. Mr. Speaker, the Certificate of Good Standing allows the Department of Labor and Workforce Development to know whether or not the employer is in compliance with submitting the mandated payments on behalf of the company which are prescribed by the government and for corrective measures to be instituted if they are not. Unfortunately, this information cannot be recorded from an employee certificate of earnings, which outlines the contributions paid into the system on behalf of the employee. Mr. Speaker, no instructions were given to any of the three agencies regarding the new policy. However, Mr. Speaker, the agencies were all given about one year's notice before the policy became effective. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with regard to question number one, can the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, Immigration, please tell his Honorable House, A, whether he has an arrangement with these three agencies to expedite the issuing of these certificates? And B, what is the cost to the employee and the employer for this new initiative? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the issue of certificates is not new and is done on a regular basis and does not normally take very long. However, the large volume at the outset did cause some delays as many persons waited until their permits expired or were nearly expired when they could have applied up to one month prior. Mr. Speaker, the cost remains the same and is outlined as follows. Inland Revenue Department, employer, $50. Employee, $25. Social Security, employer, $20. Employee, $20. NHI, employer, $20, employee, $20. And I think they last up to six months each. So it's not done every, any, every three months like before. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have a, I have a small problem with what I'm hearing. If I go to a government agency and I make a payment for whatever debt it is I'm settling, that agency is supposed to give me a receipt indicating that I've paid my debt and what the debt was. If that is so, Mr. Speaker, why shouldn't that be sufficient for me to take to another government agency to indicate that my debt has been settled and what my debt was? What's this $50 that I have to pay for a good standing certificate? to give the government to prove that I pay the same government whatever my debt was to the government. If you, if you get my, my, the point I'm trying to make, Mr. Speaker, is that this is essentially, it's a tax. And, and it's an unnecessary tax. It's convenient for the government, but it's unnecessary for the, for the employers. In the scheme of things, someone might say, oh, that's no big deal. Same thing applies to the employee. I don't know how you would deal with the employee issue, but th there has to be a means of being able to show. Mr. Speaker, the question I'm having is, 
why can't this discussion extend to the point where it is basically seamless? I can show you that I've paid because I've, I've done so. And I, I have this receipt to show that I've paid. Instead of having to go through this application process, going back to the agency to ask for it, going back again to pick it up, and back and forth and all that. I understand what your objective is. I support your objective. But at the same time, it should not be onerous and inconvenient and expensive. I must thank the member for his point about one of the flaws in our system. And with our transformation agenda that we have, that particular issue, he's absolutely correct. There are some processes that require the same information. Some people give five different government agencies the very same information. Why, Mr. Speaker, can't you go to one agency and that one agency share among all other agencies that bit of information? That process has started. It is too onerous, it wastes time, it wastes energy, it makes the system incredibly inefficient. But the conversation has already started. It is part of our whole transformation process of government services. So hopefully sooner rather than later, exactly what you described would be or should be the reality with doing government, doing business with the government. It's called decreasing or uh, increasing the ease of doing business with government. Technology makes it possible now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you. I thank you also, Mrs. Mr. Speaker, because as you say, sooner rather than later, I hope it's sooner because according to my calculations, you got six months left. And after that six months, you're going into a different mode where nothing gets done. So you got to work on this thing like yesterday. Don't say, I told you so. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Sikorsva Harbor was a mess that turned into a disaster with Hurricane Irma, with no indication of it getting better. And I am deeply concerned, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration please tell this Honorable House, why didn't he use that $1.5 million that was spent on dredging the harbor to remove the sunken derelict yachts and other vessels from the harbor first, since dredging this dredging still doesn't give access to the shelter while the derelicts are there. B, when will he be removing the derelict yachts and other vessels from the harbor? And C, what is the cost to remove them? And Mr. Speaker, this is a good time for me to remind you that these questions were posed for June 17th. I'm sure that things happened since then. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, funding in the amount of $1,500,000 was appropriated specifically for the dredging of the harbor and therefore could not be repurposed. Mr. Speaker, in May of 2018, the Director of Disaster Management informed the Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor of Cabinet's decision via memo 112-2018, dated 25th April 2018 that funding was made available to support work in priority areas that required immediate attention ahead of the hurricane season. Among these areas was the dredging of the Seacows Bay Harbor in the amount of $1,500,000. The contract for dredging works at Seacows Bay Harbor was executed on 22nd February, 2019. Mr. Speaker, a total of $1 million was allocated in the 2021 budget estimates under the Recovery and Development Agency projects for the removal of derelict marine vessels. On 20th July 2021, the RDA presented three options for removal of the vessels, which are currently being reviewed. Mr. Speaker, the estimated cost for the removal of the vessels was estimated at around $6 million. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I didn't hear a date for the removal of the yachts. I, I think I, I heard that funding was, funding was made available, but I didn't hear the date when we gonna start moving them. That's out of my hands, that's with the RDA. I shall have a question for the RDA if you would have me do, and we we'll come back to the house with that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Mr. Speaker, I presume the minister would have some little time frame. Is it soon or, or later? When, when you talk about rather sooner than later. Like I said, Mr. Speaker, soon is six months. Later is never. Mr. Speaker, the Sea Coast Harbor is very dear to me in this hurricane shelter, and these areas are given high priority as we are currently in a hurricane season. Mr. Speaker, I don't control the RDA. I have to go according to their time, their timetable. They have not given me a timetable as yet, but my thing is it's already too late to do it. It should have been done a long time ago. So anytime after now is late. So the sooner they can do it for me, the better. We have to, to protect our yachting industry. It's one of the places where we store local fishermen, they store their boats. Persons who have um, various vessels may use Sea Cows Bay. With the uh, derelict vessels in there, it is a problem. I've been preaching this a long time. The sooner you can get those boats removed from there, the better. So I'm with, I'm with the man for the third. It's a high priority for me, but I cannot rush the RDA in doing what they do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, sir. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I said in question one, Hurricane Irma did a number on Sea Cows Harbor, including destroying an entire 19,000 square yards of four acres of mangroves, a forest, and the area is now in jeopardy of being lost. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, Immigration, please tell this Honorable House, A, why is his government not treating the restoration of these mangroves as a priority? B, if his government has plans to restore the mangroves. C, if his answer is yes, when will it be done? And D, if his answer is no, why not? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that very important question because mangroves are very dear to me. So we've been trying to get moving for a very long time. Mr. Speaker, the restoration of mangroves continues to be of high priority for this government. The ministry has partnered with the HLSCC to establish a mangrove nursery, which has been in part funded by government and private donations. To date, more than a thousand seedlings have been planted at Frenchman Ski, Parakeeta Bay, Virgin Water, and Seacoast Bay. Mr. Speaker, the ministry and government continue to support the replanting efforts, which are led and spearheaded by HLSCC. Volunteers and interns are an integral part of government's approach to the restoration efforts with the community's involvement with replanting initiatives and support from the replanting program is ongoing. Mr. Speaker, prior to the COVID-19 upsurge, replanting activities were undertaken. 1,200 have been planted at eight sites, including Seacouse Bay, Brandywine, Parakeeta, Beef Island, Gun Creek, North Song, and areas in Jasper Dyke. In keeping with the overall objective to continue replanting efforts, planned activities include the restoration of North Sound Virgin Order, Tortola, Slaney Point, Hans Creek, and areas on either side of the bridge of Beef Island and Frenchman Ski, and Jasper Dyke. Further restoration work will be undertaken in Seacouse Bay later on this year. Mr. Speaker, as previously stated, the replanting of mangroves remain a high priority for this government. With the assistance and in partnership with the college, the ministry, and several volunteer and civic groups. My latest figure, Mr. Speaker, tells me we have about 5,000 mangroves to be planted before this year is done. 5,000 seedlings to be planted before this year is done. Seacouse Bay will not be left out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, somehow the message isn't getting across to the people who are responsible for reforesting these areas. Seedlings, Mr. Speaker, take years before you can actually see anything from them. What we need, Mr. Speaker, is, is a reforestation program with basically mature trees. Mr. Speaker, I need to ask the minister, if he has driven from, driven east from Naniki to Sikau's Bay and saw yellow love growing on trees along the seashore, those are not mangroves. To the untrained, what is that? What is that? What, to the untrained eyes, Mr. Speaker, 
they may think it's mangroves, but it's not. But where the yellow loves going and it will send a message that they're not mangroves. Those are areas that were forested with mangroves before Hurricane Omar. And the section, Mr. Speaker, on the north, on the, the eastern edge of the Seacosby Harbor where the four acres of mangroves existed that doesn't exist now. No attention is being paid to that area. It's being reclaimed as I speak. I don't know what future generations are going to look forward to when they come, but as it is right now, there's nothing. Mr. Speaker, I want the minister to tell me today that his program will be accelerated, accelerated in order to improve the program that he has into making sure that the restoration of these mangroves that I'm talking about is, is, is a possibility, but it's not right now. I applaud you and your ministry and the people that are working with, on the program, I applaud you. I guess the resources are limited, but something needs to be, to be done and done now. Speaker, I thank the member for his passion. I wish he had shown that passion years ago when people said the mangrove nursery could not happen. Mr. Speaker, the member made a, a statement there that was very correct a few years ago. I was told the very same thing, that mangroves grow very, very slowly. Mr. Speaker, with modern techniques for planting and harvesting mangroves, that's a thing of the past. I've seen mangroves in a matter of months, up to five feet tall. The apostles told me it would take 20 years to grow. We have increased our mangrove production. I said a while ago, when we started the mangrove project, the aim was 1,000 mangroves in 1,000 days. I just said, we hope to plant at least 5,000 before this year. And I understand the importance of mangroves, Mr. Speaker. That's why we intend to make mangroves a sensitive species. So Suppose no feel, you can destroy them. They play an incredible vital role in ecosystems, from storm surge protection to, start to, to water running off the hills, nurseries for baby fish. The persons feel you can just destroy them and that they aren't important. They're incredibly important. And we've given mangroves a high priority. That's why we just got a, a, a grant, I think it was $80,000 about a month ago, to ensure that this program is accelerated. I agree, many areas are devastated, only in Tortola, all over the BVA. We lost around maybe 80% of our mangroves. The BVA now is the model for how to restore mangroves. That's how serious we've taken this, this, this program. It is the model for mangrove restoration used in the Caribbean. Because we've taken this program from not going to happen to right now on lightning speed. I understand your concern with the Seacosby Harbor. I too share your concern. Manpower, yes, is a concern. But we have many, many volunteer groups. We have the Rotary, we have the schools and so forth who are working with us. But we have to first harvest the mangroves and get them to a point where they can be planted in the wild. That we are doing thanks to all those, the, the volunteer groups. And I must thank the college. Susan Zalewski, Marva Wheatley, under Dr. Joseph's leadership, are doing a fantastic job producing seedlings like never before. Everyone said it was impossible, it can't be done. Because I've been trying this project since 2017, before I was even elected, I was working on a mangrove project. I heard every reason why we should, even, we should just not waste our time trying to restore the mangroves. So the last cause, they go too slow. But the modern techniques, and when there's a will and somebody understand the need to, to, to champion this project, it is happening. I saw mangroves when the guy told me they were only four months old, I couldn't believe it. With a brand new technique for growing mangroves using lobster effluent. It's like mangroves on steroids. So yes, those areas there will take a very long time to reforest. We're gonna focus on them and make sure that it happens right away before the year is done. We cannot delay any further on our mangroves. They're, they're, they're too important to our environment. Well, he said if we don't, if we don't take it for mangroves, or seashore shorelines are going to be gone years from now. In fact, anybody who were wrong years ago realized the shorelines, they've already moved significantly, receded. Because persons figure they can just go and destroy mangroves and do all stuff, and, and it's okay. No, it is not okay. It is not okay. We have to get our legislation in place to protect these plants and find heavy fines of persons who think it's okay to go and destroy a mangrove to build up a car park or to build up a little fruit stand or something, just chop the mangroves down, it's not a, a big deal. No, Mr. Speaker, so I thank the member and look, look forward to your support in making sure Seacouse Bay is properly reforested. 
with mangroves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the minister is quite convincing in his argument. I, I, if, I, if I didn't know different, I would sit there and say said, and said to him, I commend you. But minister, I want to invite you to Sikau's Bay, to the foot of this hill that they call Elevator Hill, which I hate to hear, with Sikau's Bay Chalwell Road. I want to take you there, where your people planted mangroves over six months. And you wouldn't find them if you go there if you, unless you get out your car and go look for them. So this, these, these mangroves and steroids that you're talking about, they must be in Virgin Garda. But you didn't bring them down to Tortola, at least not in my area. I'm not going to argue with you. Maybe they exist, but you didn't bring them in my area. I invite you to do so, and I applaud you for the effort. I, I know, Mr. Speaker, that this minister is quite amenable to my, to my, my um, request for environmental matters, such as the planting, reforestation, and all that of mangroves. But I want to help him to execute these, these plans. I want to help him. So that's why I'm here talking about this. I'm talking about it, Mr. Speaker, with all the passion that I can muster. And I'm hoping that he doesn't take it the wrong way to go the other way and take it the right way and come this way so we can get this thing done. I've, I've dealt with ministers who went the other way. And I don't expect, I don't expect this group of guys who I'm sure is looking to come back here to be doing those kind of things. So thank you for your, your answers, Mr. Speaker. You have other questions for the minister? You have other questions for? Okay, yeah, that's okay. That's it for. Yes, that's it for the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration from the member for the third district. I now invite the Honorable Fraser to pose his questions to the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development. The minister is asking for one minute. I'm sorry? I'm not hearing you, Minister. You're asking for a recess. <laughs> this Honorable House is now stands in recess for five minutes. House in recess. <laughs>
This Honorable House now resumes its sitting. Okay, we will continue with question and answers. We're on page 17. I now invite the Honorable Julian Fraser to pose his questions to the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Mr. Speaker, one of my many concerns in the territory is the way we care for our elderly. And I have made no secret of that fact, which is well known to the minister. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister for Health and Social Development please tell this Honorable House whether A, it is still his desire to make good on his word that he will restore the number of senior care days in Sikau's Bay to what they were when they were at, at their peak? And B, if his answer is yes, when will this happen? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to respond to this critical, very important uh, topic. And uh, thank you for obliging in the five-minute preparation as we had to get some issues cleared up around this subject. Mr. Speaker, I wish to first applaud the honorable member um, for his interest in ensuring that the well-being of our territory seniors is of paramount importance to all within this honorable house. Seniors in such a diverse population group and as such, we are all committed to ensuring that the opportunities for meaningful social participation in older or senior years is a priority. In this situation, a significant part of the social involvement and participation for this territory's older gyms comes by their ability to attend and participate in the various senior programs established throughout the territory. Mr. Speaker, these programs in their truest form provide and maintain a quality of life for seniors. The programs help them to maintain and establish relationships, reduce isolation, learn new skills, and remain connected to their peers and communities. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, it is through their attendance at this program, many seniors who are vulnerable due to their ability to earn a living due to age or because they were not able to be part of a contributory system such as Social Security are also able to seek relevant health care and other financial assistance. Mr. Speaker, the hurricanes of 2017 forced the Department of Social Development to close all of a senior day, daytime program due to the fact that the majority of buildings housing these programs was severely compromised. Seacouse Bay and the Ebenezer Thomas Center being no exception. In May of 2018, Mr. Speaker, through a contractual arrangement with St. Paul's Anglican Church, the program resumed operations. This arrangement was in place from May 28 uh, until 16th of March 2020 with the intention to relocate to the Valerie Thomas Community Center uh, in September of the same year. However, on the onset of the pandemic caused, the onset of the pandemic caused the centers at East End, King Garden Bay, and Seacouse Bay to cease all operations. Specific to Seacouse Bay, the intention was to phase the program over a period of time, one day to three day weekly. However, due to other commitments for use of the space at the Ralph Perry Gore Center, it was not practical for the number of days to be expanded. Additionally, works on the Valerie Thomas Community Center commenced in February of 2020 with Mr. Vancito Christopher as a contractor and subsequently in November 2020, Taros Hill Construction began major repairs um, on the said center. Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that work is still ongoing and is anticipated to be completed by the end of August 2020.
2021, there are additional electrical works that is being completed, and I was trying in the last two hours to make sure that I get a solid date on this, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, all things being considered, it is, it is the general intent, and I want to make it more specific, to resume the programs in October 2021 at the Valerie Thomas Community Center. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the minister didn't answer part A of my question, and I, I might need to repeat it. I asked the minister if he's if he going to make good on his promise, or his word, I should say, to restore the days of the senior care to its glory days, or its, to its peak, when it was at its peak. And Mr. Mr. Speaker, if the minister could tell me. Mr. Speaker, I also, um, sorry, but I also, um, um, the answer to the question is yes. He wants to know when. And this is the part that is difficult at this time because um, I also am intricately involved with this uh, global pandemic that is affecting lives and livelihoods, and especially the particular seniors in our community. So, Mr. Speaker, um, the answer to that question is yes. There is also a study on, um, on aging that was done, I think it was 2000. 1617 by Dr. Christine and uh, Glover and uh, that particular program we're getting a we're getting a, uh, a team together so that not only do we reinstate it to its glory days although the pandemic in this era of pandemic one does not know when fully you'll be able to um, go back to those days where you can meet in the center and do all of the things that you used to do without some risk. And the elderly have always been the most vulnerable age in which this pandemic has affected, although now it is shifting to the young. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. As it is right now, persons from Sikau's Bay are going to Carrot Bay. I think it is Carrot Bay. Not many, maybe two. Had the center, had all program been up and running inside Sikau's Bay, you would have more people going. Sorry, I, so I can't hear well. Can you hear me? I said, as it is now, Mr. Speaker, persons from the Sikau's Bay area are going to Carrot Bay. Not many, probably two. But had it been within the Sikorsby area, more people would be going because they, they keep asking me when it's going to reopen. But Mr. Speaker, I want the minister to know that I, I have no desire to entertain the shrinking of these programs. I had noticed before the, before the um, hurricane that the, 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 the number of people were shrinking. And it's not because it's the older one had left, moved on, is that new ones were not coming. And I think that the social development department should be encouraged, either by giving them the resources to recruit people to, to, to use these facilities for the purpose it was intended. Especially given that from back in the day when our budget used to be under $100,000, we had the senior citizen program, to now where it's over $400 million. Mr. Speaker, that program should be flourishing, and it should be flourishing for the people who built this country. So I want to know if the minister would agree with me that when, the, when this program gets back on his feet, that his department will make an effort to encourage new people 
to use the facility that's available to, to them for, the, for their purpose, for the purpose of enriching their lives instead of having them sit at home and doing nothing. Mr. Speaker, uh, not only would I agree with the member, I would have a personal interest. Um, one could, one could almost, um, would almost have to accuse me of having a personal interest in this. Um, I think the member first and then myself second will have to make use of these centers very soon. Sorry, um, soon enough, not very soon, soon enough. And, um, the, each of these centers, the one in the east, the one uh, in Road Town, the one in um, Virgin Gorda, in each of these centers, it is critical that we bring these together and um, the, the, the Healthy Aging Program, the member will be pleased again to know that this, would, this, is, a, this is such a committee that I think that it could involve members across the aisles in terms of making sure that they get a broad view as to what the program is, how it will be implemented, and how it will enrich the lives of uh, seniors throughout the various communities. So I know he's asking about District 3, but we ask about um, each of the districts. In fact, um, um, my I call her my mom also, uh, Nurse Tatika, Tatika Scatliff. Is that pronounced correctly? Uh, Ms. Scatliff called me one time and she says to me, well, you know, the center we have across from the Red Cross building is being engaged by public health and environmental health since 2018, or 2000, you know, when they had to move out from where they were. When are you going to get them out of there and get us back into our home? I have been asking the ministry to make sure that the building that we have engaged at the, um, at, well, next to Happy Lion, that they move, move forthwith. And again, because of the pandemic, I have not been able to give it the specific attention. And I should not have to be on it in the way it is. They need to move. They need to be able to get the seniors there so that we can then get that particular space purposed for what it is intended. We have to get the Seacouse Bay. They, um, in Bruce Bay, as, as a member, would not get a chance to ask me on this one. He will ask me next week, sorry, um, on the 23rd. Um, the Bruce Bay, the King Garden Bay, those are centers that need to be up, needs to be going, and it needs a uh, um, a bipartisan. It is not partisan politics when it comes to our golden gems, and it is not lip service either. I'm saying I'm, I'm second in line to senior, so we have to be able to get this done. And I pledge to do all that is possible, including getting the house or the housing at the um, the center across from Red Cross, readied, getting the Seacouse Bay readied. I am told that we have an electrical, to complete the electrical works is the only thing that's holding it back now. But that cannot be. Even if we have to vary the contract and get it done, we must get it done. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mrs. Sp Mrs. Speaker. Question number two. Mr. Speaker, I am concerned that the budget for the District Senior Citizen Program may be shrinking as a percentage of the national budget instead of keeping pace, which, if true, would need some explanation. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister for Health and Social Development please tell this Honorable House whether, A, the budget for Senior Citizen Program in the District smaller, bigger, or the same as it was in 2016? B, what is the budget for the senior citizen program in the district as a percentage of the national budget? And C, 
what was the budget for each of the years 2016 to 2021. Mr. Speaker, budgetary head number 2653 takes a comprehensive approach to aged care services, which comprises residential services, home care services, and the seniors engagement program. In large measures, the human resources requirement pertains interchangeably to various activities within these three programs. In a very disproportionate measure, as indicated in the answer to question number one, the floods, the hurricanes, and the COVID-19 global pandemic of 2017 through 2021 have reaped havoc on the social interaction and on the well-being of our golden gyms. Understandably, Mr. Speaker, budgetary allotment for the senior engagement program for these years, 2018 to, to, to date, had to be redistributed to fund other programs aimed at supporting our elderly. The budgetary allocations for the aged programs and, in particular, the senior programs for 2016 in terms of the aged programs was $3,029,900. Um, of the three particular program, one million six was for the senior residential program, 671000 for the senior engagement program, which include these programs that we speak, and 732000 for the home care services. In 2017, we had 2,518,620 total, of which 1.389 million was for the residential program, 496, 298,000, it actually reduced uh, for the senior engagement program, that is the year of the hurricane, 632,000 for the home care services. In 2018, we had 2,790,854, of which in 2018, 1.5 1 million went to the senior program, to the, to the residential services program, 632,000. It went back up in 2018 to the um, senior engagement program, and 672,000 for the home care services. In 2019, we had $2,501,000, of which 1.4 million went to the senior program, 398,000 to, to the residential program, 398 to the senior engagement program, and 721 to the home care services. In 2020, $2,258,000 overall for the aged programs, of which 1,239,000 went to the residential program, 286,651 to the senior engagement program, and 732,000 to the home care services. And in 2021, we had 2,256,000 to the aged programs, of which one 0.226 went to the senior program, 337,800 went to the senior engagement program, and 652,000 went to the home care program. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, specifically, we will see that the home care program um, was increased and the senior engagement programs because of the facility and the cutback in the activity, that itself had been reduced some. It started to go back up in 2021 and the senior residential program, um, it is going through some challenges but we would seek ways in which we can bring it back to the glory days of 2016, although nothing will come back to the 2016 days right now. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Minister, which one of these programs deals with the senior citizen program that I, I am talking about? Is that the senior residential or senior, senior engagement program? Senior engagement program. Okay. 
So you didn't answer the question as it was posed, whether the budget was bigger, smaller, or the same as it was in 2016. You didn't tell me whether it was the percentage, whether the percentage relative to the national budget had changed up, down, or across. But let me look at while you ponder on those things that you didn't answer, because I'm, going to seek, I'm seeking an answer to those questions. That's A and B. Well, when I look at the senior engagement program, Mr. Speaker, $2,017,498,000. $2,018,632,000. Now, you move from $632,000 in 2018 to $398,000 in 2019, and it was further reduced in 2020 down to $2,286,000. 2021, which is only midway through, you're showing me $337,800. I, I, that I have a question for as to how, well, I guess it's going back up to where it was in 2018. So that's logical. Well, how do you explain the dip in 2019, down to 398,000, and in 2020, down to 286,000. How, how, how is that? How do you explain that? Mr. Speaker, um, I think that one need not look too hard to what has been experienced over the past 16 to 18 months. We have something called, well, in addition to the devastations caused by the hurricanes, the member will soon be joining me in a ceremony to turn back over the key for his center. So there were amounts reduced from the running of that program. The member for the second has on numerous occasions asked me about the um, about the programs as a, sorry about the centers King Garden Bay and Bruce Bay. He have seen and been a part of. He have seen the program the particular drawings for Bruce Bay done by Mr. Adams. We have reported here that it will be out on bid shortly. But as it relates to the supplies, the equipment, and the others for those programs, it has been, quote unquote, non-existent in, as it relates to the typical program that we shared. Mr. Speaker, we have also, each of the centers have their challenges. I'm not going to stand here and support any argument that says that it should be kept at the $378,000 level, which is now going back up to. It, in its high day of 2016, it was $671,000. And Mr. Speaker, we have to be, I wouldn't tell the story of how the car was overturned on the seaside because it's not appropriate here. But there is a reason why some of these budgets are cut. I'm not advocating cutting anything for the senior programs. I don't have the figures and I can give him in terms of the percentage of the national budget, but I will take the percentage of the overall aged programs, only because some of the monies were reallocated over to the home care services. I mentioned that in the opening particular paragraph. We had to take the money to where the seniors were. We'll have to take more money to where the seniors are. So um, we, can't, we could not have been, because the pandemic of 2020, Mr. Speaker, had everyone at home. So to ask how you can have the particular amounts for 2020 and 2021, reduced to that particular level, 
does not take the global pandemic, which have kept everyone. Mr. Speaker, every member in this house have saved some money from entertainment. They could not go anywhere. They've saved money in terms of the other particular programs. If, you, if you're out, travel and all of the others, they couldn't go anywhere. Um, so we moved some of that money from the senior engagement program over to the home care services. We'll continue to support seniors wherever they are. And we will hope that we can get everyone back into centers and, um, and have, this, um, have this done. If you take the aged program as a whole, the fact is it has been reducing. The high days of 3 million and 30,000 will be a far reach and it is down to 2,256 budgeted for um, 2021. But again, the AG will tell you all budgets have had this hit, but we will advocate. The senior member of the House and I will advocate for reallocation in this program. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the minister said in relationship, in, with, with regard to my question B, he said he doesn't have, he doesn't have the, the, the budget for the senior citizen program as a percentage of the national budget. And, and I think that it's a disservice not to have it, Mr. Speaker, because it's something specific that you want to know. You want to learn how the program is being run and what, what the, uh, the outlook for the program is. Is it progressing or is it stagnant or what the case might be? And I could only tell if it's growing as a percentage of the budget uh, in relationship to the budget by tying the, pegging the percentage to it. So that's unfortunate. The other thing, Mr. Speaker, is that the minister I just want to let the minister know what my concerns are really my concerns are really to make sure that adequate attention is being paid to this group of individuals that's my concern so that's why that's why I'm raising the issue question number three Mr. Speaker Mr. Speaker the Solid Waste Department was at one time mandated, I guess administratively, to trim the roadsides along Drake High Drake's Highway from West End to Bird Point. And they did a very good job at it. These days, I find myself having to make a request after the weed and grass has covered the sidewalk. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister for Health and Social Development please tell this Honorable House, A, whether his government has abandoned the program and replaced it with nothing? B, if yes, why? And C, if no, are the men elsewhere working trimming weed and where? Mr. Speaker, <laughs> This is one of the questions that I am at the mercy of the written answer. I can say, save for the fact of the grass pulling me out of the car also, I have not been able to pay specific attention other than when the member for the third um, makes specific requests. And I don't think there is a single member in this house, district rep or at large, who doesn't suffer the same fate. The government has not, NOT, abandoned the grass cutting program. The program has, however, experienced some challenges due to staffing issues that have not only affected this area of the department, but other areas as well. The challenges arose as a result of the following. 
non-replacement of staff by the department who have left. Uh, members of the cotton crew submitting medical certificate excusing them from this type of work. And some members of the staff from the street cleaning crew reporting sick on a regular basis, which results in the cotton crew being redeployed to carry out their duties. The department is in the process of addressing the foregoing issues and hope to have the same resolved by the end of this summer. In the meanwhile, the department will try its best to continue to operate within the confines of the new regular. Mr. Speaker, a minister, a minister could come to this honorable house and tell me he is only, he, he is, what? Subjected to the written answer, uh, is, is limited to the answer that he's given. That thing you should not bring here, Mr. Speaker. I'm talking about real life experience that you too experienced, Mr. Minister. <laughs> people are sick, people are redeployed, people complain about, no, 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 no. Mr. Speaker, let me, let me just, Enlighten the minister. I'm sorry, um, senior member. Is this your first follow-up? This is the first follow-up. Okay. With a question? Well, follow-ups yeah. are usually yeah, questions. I, I think you should have been more concerned about the answer you're given instead of whether it's a qu the question. This I shouldn't have to be doing this. If you drive from west to east and you pass through Sikaos Bay, you know what I'm talking about. Here's this. Good afternoon, Honorable Fraser. I tried to go for a walk this morning. I'm sorry. Senior, and was shocked to find member, the sidewalk is, is, overgrown. Is this a question? With bushes. Yes, it's a question. I have to prelude the question with something. With bush so covering you, the sidewalk. You, you and have vine. to do what I'm sorry. All the way up to the bridge. Senior member. Yes, sir. Is this your follow up question to the minister? This is one of them. Okay. But when you get up and talking about everything else but Bruce Beck Community Center, that has nothing to do with me, I have to listen. I'm asking the question. You're going to tell me how to ask the question, Mr. Minister? Honorable members. I think you ought to go cut the bush off the sidewalk instead of arguing with me. Honorable members, um, senior member of the House. Yes, sir. You've been around a long time, and you know quite clearly what, how a question is asked, especially a follow-up. So I will, I will just caution you to refrain from editorials and statements and get right to the question. Mr. Mr. Speaker, when my constituents are telling me that they can't go walking in areas that they have been frequenting for years before 2016, 14, and all of a sudden now they can't do it. This is happening from Palestina to Albion. I watch the sidewalk, I watch it as I pass, and I just, I just close my eyes hoping that I don't run off the road. And I'm sure the ministers see it as well. The same people who supposed to cut it see it as well. So I want to know from the minister, because I submitted my question for a sitting that was supposed to take place on, on um, was it Miss, Miss, June 17th? And it's now today. I would imagine that once they saw the questions, they were going to cut the grass or the weed from crossing the sidewalk. Now the sidewalks are completely covered. So minister, this is nothing personal. This is what you signed up for. You campaigned in my district telling the people you're going to take care of them. That's part of taking care of them. They took care of you. And I expect to see those sidewalks clean from Palestina all the way up to Albion. So I would like to know when you're going to get that done, Mr. Speaker, despite what your people have said to you. That's my follow-up. When is you going to do it? Mr. Speaker, sir. There is no hiding place around this bush issue. Whether on the highway, the byways, the crossroads, or the high roads, the bushes have to be cut. And I don't take it personal because at the end of the day, um, it's every district every area, every region, and 
um, the time I spent and I asked the speaker for the five minutes was for the senior program to make sure we get it right. The bush has no excuse that you can do. I mean, you could, you could push bush and jump up on bush all day here because you, what you see is what you feel. The sidewalks are not cleaned. The bushes are not cleaned. They have to be cleaned. So at the end of the day, uh, it don't start at Palestina and end down there either. It from West End straight up. And uh, the only place I saw that the uh, Queen Elizabeth Park was finally cut. But we have issues. And they won in the third district because the road to victory, I was told before, leads to the third. I endorse this. And we will get the particular bush and a member for the district one will be pleading the same thing. Member, um, I, think, I think it touches one, three, well, when you reach to the fourth is under a, a new regime. The district one and district three have the same concerns. There is no need to prance up on this. It has to be done, period. It is an area that you can um, bring a number of issues in and have them validly voiced and placed on the record. This bush cutting issue is a problem of which must be solved. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I have absolutely no problems when it comes to the Ministry of Communications and Works and the bush that they have to cut and the drains that they have to clean because I know that, that a specific allocation must be given in order for that to be done. But something like this when it comes to solid waste, they have a standing crew who does this kind of work. And I can recall the days when I consider them to be like nuisances for doing their job, an effective job because when you're driving, you're wondering if they're going to crack your windshield or not. They were so effective. And the, the examples are there. So this can be done. It can be done, Mr. Speaker. I'm not asking the minister to do anything that's out of the ordinary. It's the same thing about passing a garbage bin with all the crap around it and have to make a call to get it done, removed. I, I am not, I, I, I think some gentle persuasion minister can make a lot of difference. But that paper that you read from, indicating the reasons for this not being done, I think you shouldn't let anybody see that. You should recall it and don't let anybody see that paper because if I see it, if I get my hand on it, I might make some hay out of it, which doesn't make sense, Mr. Speaker. So all, I, all I'm asking the minister is can he, at this particular time as minister, give some form of commitment as to when this area is going to be cleared up? Mr. Speaker, I don't know how many ways I can say this. This is something that has to be done. I will take it back. I deliberately read it as it was written only to um, pinpoint to the staff the fallacy in the answers. But because I changed, I, you know, I had to up upgrade a number of them that were coming forward. But the fact is, is that um, Funny thing you didn't ask about the budget for this one. These items have been cut so drastically. Um, I'll have to ask for some donation of some weed eaters. But Mr. Speaker, this, as I am saying to the member, um, it is a point of which we can stay here until nine o'clock because the bush has to be cut. So I don't know if it's, a, if it's the biggest point he will score on here tonight. I am guilty as charged. Yes, it'll be persuaded. Yes, it has been asked. Yes, you have made a request. Yes, this has not been done. Yes, it should be done. And yes, we'll try to get it done as soon as practical. Yesterday was the deadline. Today is late and tomorrow we're way behind. Question number four. Question number four. Yeah, two follow-ups finish. Give me a chance. <laughs> See, if I'm going to ask question number four, I don't need anyone to tell me. <laughs> I'm, just remind, I'm just reminding you. That, that's the question you're on now. 
Honorable awesome. member for the third, question number four. I got a little stunned. I had to. <laughs> question number four. Question number four. Mr. Speaker, April 6th and 7th, 2021, was designated for persons in, in isolation to be tested for COVID-19 virus at the Ebenezer Thomas Primary School. And a number of persons did get tested. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister for Health and Social Development please tell his Honorable House, A, how many persons got tested? And B, what is the breakdown of the results? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for this final question from the Honorable Member from the Third. Mr. Speaker, a total of 259 persons were tested for the COVID-19 virus at the Ebenezer Thomas Primary School during the period 6 to 7 April 2021. Of the person tested, one positive case was detected and 258 persons were negative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want, I want to thank the minister for the commitment he made to cut the grass and the bush off the sidewalk, the weed. And, and I want to thank him for answering the question. That's why it was so easy on him on question four. I thank the senior member for his question posed to the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development. We move now to the questions from the member for the second district. He will pose his first set of questions to the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance, Honorable Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me just get this. You see the please. Mr. Speaker, I have a, I have a small intervention. I need, I need some assistance before I begin the line of question. Maybe you can assist me, sir. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm trying to find out if you could help me. When questions are put to um, the clerk, so submit it to yourself and the clerk, Mr. Speaker, the process for them making it to the order paper is at the sole discretion of the speaker, correct, as per standing orders? That's according to standing orders. And Mr. Speaker, is it also correct that you have the sole authority to decide whether a question is put on the order paper or removed from the order paper? That is the, that is the policy according to the standing orders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just want to bring one bit of information to you. Um, I'm not, not sure if you were aware, but I have to bring it because it, it did happen. Mr. Speaker, upon seeing the order paper, the I think it was the first draft of this order paper, um, and then the second draft, there was an amendment number two, I think, or amend, the second amendment. And I noted that one of the questions that I had posed on the other paper was removed. And Mr. Speaker, subsequent discussions were had and then I learned that um, it was removed by someone other than yourself. So Mr. Speaker, the question is back on the other paper, but I believe I was a bit troubled. Um, the, the question was put back on the other paper, but I was a bit troubled in terms of the authorization or the person given authorization to remove questions um, from the paper. So Mr. Speaker, I, I think there's something that we, we must pay attention to in terms of the authoritative um, figures and heads when it deals with the House of Assembly. Well, thanks for bringing that to my attention and I will pay keener attention to what's on and what's off. Not a problem, sir. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House what is the status of the e-commerce legislation needed to support the digital transformation of the economy?
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to give the member an update on the status of e-commerce legislation needed to support the digital transformation of the economy. Mr. Speaker, the Data Protection Act 2021, which seeks to promote the protection of personal data processed by public and private bodies and to provide for the establishment of the Office of Information Commissioner for Handling Related Matters, was passed in this Honorable House on 5th March 2021. It was assented to by the Governor on 6 April 2021 and has been enacted or brought into force published in the Virgin Islands Official Gazette on 12 July 2021. Mr. Speaker, the Electronic Transfer of Funds Act 2021, which regulates transactions that involve the transfer of money through electronic means for the purpose of instructing or authorizing a financial institution to debit or credit a cardholder's account when anything of value is purchased. It allows for the modern and efficient services to customers, such as online shopping and e-services, and the ability to collect money using many of the available banking instruments in exchange for the good or service consumed, was passed in this Honorable House on 9th March 2021. It was assented to by the Governor on 6 April 2021 and has been enacted or brought into force, published in the Virgin Islands Official Gazette on 12 July 2021. Mr. Speaker, the Electronic Filing Act 2021, which deals with the following. One, manner and format in which such electronic records shall be filed, created, retained, issued, or provided. Two, where such electronic records have to be signed, the type of electronic signature required, including, if applicable, a requirement that a sender use a particular type of secure electronic signature. Three, the manner and format in which such signature that be affixed to the electronic record or form and the identity of or criteria that shall be met by any specific security procedure provider used by the person filing the document. Four, such control processes and procedures as may be appropriate to ensure adequate integrity, security, and confidentiality of electronic records or payments. Or five, any other required attributes for electronic records or payments that are currently specified for corresponding paper documents. Mr. Speaker, the Electronic Filing Act 2021 was passed in the House of Assembly on 9th March 2021. It was assented to by the Governor on 6 April 2021 and has been enacted or brought into force published in the Virgin Islands Gazette in 12 July 2021. Mr. Speaker, the Electronic Transactions Act 2021 was initially passed in 2001 to facilitate the use of electronic transactions within the territory in order to strengthen and modernize the existing legal framework and update the legislation. A new bill was introduced into the House of Assembly in 2019 and has had its first reading. The 2019 bill is entitled to repeal and replace the Act of 2001 and is based on the eGrip model electronic transaction bill, which was developed in 2011. The bill fundamentally seeks to enhance and modernize the legal framework relating to electronic transactions as is currently provided for in the Electronic Transaction Act 2001. In doing so, the provisions of the bill aim to facilitate electronic governance by public authorities as well as electronic commerce within the territory by providing for the transfer of information and records by electronic means. The Electronic Transfer Transactions Act 2021 was passed in the House on 9 March 2021. It was assented to by the Governor on 6 April 2021 and has been enacted or brought into force published in the Virgin Islands Gazette on 12 July 2021. Mr. Speaker, the passing and bringing into force this suite of e-government legislation now paves the way for the BVI to enter into the digital economy, which will create new forms of innovation and generate new revenue streams and create diversity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to, thanks to the Premier for such a detailed answer. Mr. Speaker, the, the follow-up question that I have, I think it's only one, um, would be in terms of being able to realize the effect of the legislation 
that has now been passed, Premier, um, when will we anticipate um, whether it's revenues or any form of, of material um, evidence of what we, what we were set out to do? Well, Mr. Speaker, as you would see, the, they were only assented to in July. So now what the um, Premier's office is doing or has done in some of the cases already is to start to send out in terms of the applications to get the re re relative and respective personnel that is needed for this digital economy and so on. Um, so as in terms of the electronic and the whole digital that will be used, um, there's a digital officer that is needed. So that um, recruitment is in the process of, um, I think now going to the papers and all the necessary personnel to help keep this running or get this running up and running and now being pursued. Some will be pursued this year, some will be next year, but it is uh, projected within the next month or two that these should be in. So roughly within the next three months, everything so, so should be running. Um, or well, at start to run, but it will take some time even up to next year to be in full steam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two, Mr. Speaker, if I may. Mr. Speaker, would the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell us, Honorable House, the status of the Sovereign Bond Initiative? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member for the Second District is asking about the Sovereign Bond Initiative, but it is clear that this question was not accurately posed. In the spirit of cooperation, the answer will be provided in relation to the Sovereign Credit Rating Initiative. Mr. Speaker, a Sovereign Rating is an independent assessment of the credit worthiness of a country. It gives investors insight into the lack of risk associated with investing in various financial instruments of a country, including any political risk. This exercise was attempted about 10 years ago, but was not concluded. Since taking office, your government has restarted this initiative. However, your government has been advised by the experts that the imposed COI would negatively impact our rating. So in the interim, your government has focused on mitigating the negative effects of COVID while focusing on initiatives that would further bolster the economy. Mr. Speaker, just to a few seconds, Mr. Speaker, I just want to ensure that I understood the last part of what the Premier stated. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the clarification is here in the answer because I, I heard something about the negative impact of COI and then it moved on to COVID. So I will move on to question number three. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, would the Premier and Minister of Finance explain to this Honorable House his government's plans for a marine safety vessel or vessels to respond to medical and fire emergencies throughout the territory? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. It's with pleasure I answer this and the other questions. Mr. Speaker, the government's 48-foot dauntless vessel that was purchased by the last administration for the said reason the member has stated was found to be on dry dock when this government took office. Mr. Speaker, all indications reveal that this has been the case for the last 10 years or more. So, Mr. Speaker, this government took the decision to transfer the ownership back to the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry after being in custody of the Health Services Authority for a few years. The vessel was not in a condition of readiness and the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry, we took possession of the vessel. Uh, uh, the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry has commenced repairs and refurbished to the numerous systems on board to return the vessel to a safe and reliable operating condition. 
Some of these systems were damaged during Hurricanes Irma and, and others are non-operational due to lack of maintenance. Upon completion of the repairs, the vessel will be used to provide patient transfer services between Virgin Gorda and Tortola, Jocelyn Dyke and Tortola. Virgin Islands Shipping Registry has met with the Health Services Authority and began the discussions necessary to agree the human resource and equipment requirements necessary to form the underpinning of our MOU and our SOP to support the effective provision of this service. The vessel was originally designed with purpose-built fire response capability with dedicated water pumping and fire extinguishing agent delivery mechanisms. These systems are currently not functional and require servicing to be returned to an operational condition. Once the priority safety repairs are completed, the fire response systems will be repaired. It is anticipated that all systems will be operational and the vessel fully functional and available on 24-hour standby for response to both medical and fire emergencies by the beginning of the third quarter 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, does this vessel, because the Premier just noted that the ship and registry is now in communications with the Ministry of Health, until this vessel, Mr. Speaker, comes into full operation, what do we have in place um, for emergency and other services for um, the outer islands, specifically just Van Dyke, Virgin Gorda, and Annie Gara, um, given that I know there was some sort of contract set up for medical purposes, specifically for just Van Dyke that I could speak of, but it is now non existent. So, Mr. Speaker, the follow up is what is in place now? Um, for emergency services, specifically from a medical standpoint, for the, those islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member rightfully has exacerbated that the the boat that was brought into to be multi-purpose um, more than ten years ago um, never lived up to the purpose, and some contracts were signed, and some of the contracts prior to us taking office expired. But what I do know, Mr. Speaker, is the different agencies do have contacts of certain persons. If emergency comes, to contact them to mobilize, and then uh, payments would be made. So I know that they do have existing, not contracts, but agreements in case uh, for the sister islands, because I don't like to call them the outer islands, but the sister islands. And Mr. Speaker, they would um, be able to speak to more of that if the member wants. I can arrange for a call with him with the agencies so that he can speak with them to make sure that he's fully satisfied because it is important that wherever um, service is needed in those islands that it's being had. So I do agree. So I'm more than open for the member to, to have a call with them so that they can make sure they narrow down whatever the details that needs to be narrowed down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, because that, that drives the Premier's um, answer to that follow-up drives to the next question because Premier based on my understanding specifically for Just Van Dyke, whatever arrangements were had, um, there were issues with payments and there is now um, nobody under a quote-unquote agreement to bring persons on emergency services from Just Van Dyke. So I think we, we need to do that as soon as, as, soon as humanly possible because some of the persons that but out of the three persons that were, were named, um, they have all raised the same issue of payment. And I think I have a question on here for the Minister of Health surrounding the same, same um, thing. Well, I thank the member for drawing it to my attention because it is your constituency and you would know. I will inquire into it because it's the first I'm hearing on that matter. And um, that is something that has to be sorted out because we want to make sure the service is is there running and ready and available to 
whoever it is needs it because our emergency is an emergency. So I give it my fullest, my fullest attention and uh, make sure that is actioned right away. So I, I can give the house my word on that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I have no doubt that the Premier will give his attention to it and I would follow up um, with him. Question number four. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House if the population census for 2020 was completed? A, if not, why not? B, when was the last census completed? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, work to begin the 2020 population and housing census was slated to begin mid-year of 2020. Enumerators were already recruited and the publicity campaign was ongoing. However, Mr. Speaker, work on the 2020 census was interrupted and has been delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Instituted protocols to manage this health crisis made it impossible to carry out the interviews. The Central Statistics Office continues to monitor the, monitor the situation. The CSO is using this time to collect administrative data on persons and households to explore other possible avenues to approach the census. Mr. Speaker, before this recent spike in positive COVID-19 cases, the director of the CSO did an interview with GIS informing the general population that preparation was again being made to conduct the census. However, these efforts were again interrupted due to a second wave of COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, having to deal with the worst pandemic in over 100 years has contributed to this exercise not being completed in a timely manner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not sure if I heard the answer to part B of the question, when was the last census completed? Maybe I, I missed it uh, on a book me. Uh, sorry about that, Mr. Speaker. That was when the last census was completed. Remember, I must say that in answering this, I myself um, somehow missed it and, and was looking at it as when the census would be completed. So I'll get this answer for you. Mr. Speaker, I. I would bring back the question, or um, I would bring back the question so, so that the answer could be given. Um, I also want to make note, as other members did, and the Premier is also aware that these questions were submitted uh, since May 27th of this year. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, given the territory's plight still having to recover from the effects of the 2017 hurricanes, and now more recently with the pandemic, would the Premier and Minister of Finance give the debt to income ratio of the territory as at April 30th, 2021? A, if the Premier could not provide this answer, when should we expect to receive the answer? Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the second district for this question. Mr. Speaker, however, before proceeding with the answer, I would like to let the member know that the government's debt to income ratio is referred to as debt to GDP ratio. Mr. Speaker, actual estimates of GDP for the territory are measured on an annual basis and conducted by the Central Statistics Office. The latest available is for 2018. Mr. Speaker, the member should note that the Central Statistics Office does not currently prepare quarterly GDP estimates. However, Mr. Speaker, while the department strengthens its annual methodology for GDP estimates, it is also engaging in discussions with CATAC about preparing quarterly GDP estimates in the future. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that the Central Statistics Office has already commenced discussions with local data providers to begin monthly or quarterly collections. However, Mr. Speaker, with the assistance of the Central Statistics Office, each year the macro-physical unit of the Ministry of Finance forecasts uh, annual GDP 
for the medium term fiscal plan fiscal plan gdp forecasts up to 2023 were prepared in the second half of 2020 therefore mr speaker a gdp annual forecast for 2021 is available in terms of central government debt to gdp ratio uh, 2019 11.04 2020 13.47 2021 19.21 and 2021 as at April 30th, 2021 13.56. I think that there's some music coming out through somewhere. All my members light up and take down. Yeah. This humble house is now in recess huh? for five minutes. <laughs>
Please be seated. This Honorable House now resumes its sitting. Happy that whatever the challenges were is now resolved. Again, it begs the urgent need for us to get back to the chambers of town. I invite the member for the second district to continue now with, is it question six? Or question, oh, the premier, you were interrupted. You were answering question five. Okay. Yes, why don't you start over with the answer to question five, honorable premier? Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> so we'll ask the member to re-ask this question and then the premier will answer. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, take, take two. Mr. Speaker, question number five. Given the territory's plight still having to recover from the effects of the 2017 hurricanes and now more recently with the pandemic, would the Premier Minister of Finance give the debt to income ratio of the territory as at April 30th, 2021? A, if the Premier cannot provide the answer, when should we expect to receive the answer? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the second district for this question again. Mr. Speaker, however, before proceeding with the answer, I would like to, uh, to let the member know that for governments, debt to income ratio is referred to as debt, debt to GDP ratio. Mr. Speaker, actual estimates of GDP for the territory are measured on an annual basis and conducted by the Central Statistics Office. The latest available is for 2018. Mr. Speaker, the member should note that the Central Statistics Office does not currently prepare quarterly GDP estimates. However, Mr. Speaker, while the department strengthens its annual methodology for GDP estimates, it is also engaging in discussions with CATAC about preparing quarterly GDP estimates in the future. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that the Central Statistics Office has already commenced discussions with local data providers to begin monthly or quarterly collections. However, Mr. Speaker, with the assistance of the Central Statistics Office, each year the macro fiscal, fiscal uh, unit of the Ministry of Finance forecasts annual GDP for the medium term fiscal plan. The GDP forecasts up to 2023 were prepared in the second half of 2020. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, a GDP annual forecast for 2021 is available. Central government debt to GDP ratio percentage 2019 11.04, 2020 13.47, 2021 19.21, as at April 30, 2021 13.56. Mr. Speaker, the debt to GDP ratio for the territory for 2021 was projected based on the assumption that with a principal repayment of about $12.5 million by the end of the year, there would be a disbursement of $68.89 million. Mr. Speaker, this disbursement would have been a combination of the remaining disbursement on the $60.29 million portion, not proportion, sorry, portion of the CDB rehabilitation and reconstruction loan would have been dispersed along with extensive use of our existing line of credit and even acquisition of a new loan facility. However, Mr. Speaker, as at 30th April 2021, I'm pleased to report that due to our strong fiscal policies and fiscal management practices in the Ministry of Finance, the government has not had to draw down on the line or acquire a new loan facility. In addition, due to the continued slow rollout of the projects under the CB, CDB Rehabilitation Reconstruction Loan, the amount projected to be disbursed has not materialized. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, if we take the central government debt as at 30th April 2021 of $145.09 million, 
and divided by our annual GDP for 2021, which is projected to be $1.07 billion, the estimated debt to GDP ratio would be 13.56%. So, Mr. Speaker, I provide this for the honorable member. Thank you. Have, okay, I just have a few seconds to review. Just for clarification, Mr. Speaker, uh, Premier, these these numbers given, the percentages given, are they the actual numbers or what was projected in the medium term fiscal uh, plan? I, I just want to, before I ask the actual question. Well, of course, of, of, of course, some of them will be the actual because of the past, so they'll yeah. be, be, be actual. And also midterm physical medium uh, plan also deals with projections based on the trends. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thanks to Premier for clearing, clearing that up. Mr. Speaker, I know what the answer to this next question will be. <laughs> um, as the Premier, I think he understands my line of questioning by now. But as a result of specifically now the pandemic in 2020, 2021, um, based on, I, I, I'll ask a hypothetical, Mr. Speaker, if he, if he can, give the, the answer. Um, based on what you are seeing projected and given the, the effects of the pandemic, um, how do we expect to, what are the projections given the 18 months that we have been dealing with COVID towards the end of 2021? Uh, I think I'll leave that question. Mr. Speaker, it is more than a reasonable financial question. And I want to answer it, Mr. Speaker, um, as brief but as thorough as possible. Uh, every government in the world is experiencing financial difficulties with COVID. And uh, with the projections, of course, we would project to see how, how as close to the new regular, I call it, not normal, that we could have um, gotten to, get to. The, of course, the last COVID-19 spike did create some issues that we tried to work through and was able to work through for the most part, but certain sectors uh, had to be closed down. And um, COVID-19 is so fluid, it's difficult to stay steady with any projection because we're hoping that we wouldn't have any more shutdowns, but we know the reality of COVID-19 is that um, there will always be some more adjustments because you'll, you don't want any more spikes, but you know given Delta and all of them, you have to project that you might have little spikes here and there and get them down, and that will be the new regular of how business is dealt with. And um, also, we have been trying to hold steady with the revenue side based on what we have seen but the reality is, which you have heard in the house all day, um, we had to make some adjustments to keep the lights on and to keep public officers hired. And to our dismay, we did not want to have to cut certain programs, but it's either cut programs and, and um, keep certain capital things moving that are needed for the rebuilding of our territory or cut um, public officers. So the, the choice is difficult, but not too difficult. We decided to make sure that no public officer um, would lose their jobs. As a result, you would see in social development, there are certain programs that have been cut, every single ministry, um, and we're trying to do more with less. Uh, anytime we have to shut down sectors, that creates another issue. And you know last year, because of the lockdown, we had to do a revised budget. Um, this year, because of the, the current spike in some, 
some other issues, it may be something that we have to do again. And uh, we're trying to make sure, too, that we control expenditure. I must say here that uh, there are challenges trying to get this expenditure controlled because while there are a number of public officers who recognize that we have a challenge with COVID-19, there are still a few who are up trying to operate as if it is business as usual and increasing, increasing the request and um, hence increasing the, 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 the expenditure. And some very heavy decisions are going to be, have to be made that uh, would not be political decisions, but financial ones to make sure that we continue to, to navigate this financial ship through these uncharted, turbulent financial um, waters without any playbook. I answer it like that because you know you deal with projections. And, and, and the projections right now for all countries are um, being shifted because as you go tomorrow, you don't know what you meet with COVID-19. You don't know what adjustments you have to make uh, financially. In addition to that, I praise God, and I know that you would do the same, that we didn't have the storm and we didn't get hit with a hurricane. So we are asking persons to cut back, not because we, 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 we want to, to be mean, but we're asking them to cut back so we can keep all the public officers hired, keep certain things moving that will bring in revenue, and help us all to band together to navigate our way through this. Um, financial challenges because we still have to keep a very keen eye on the hurricanes and uh, we still have to keep a very keen eye God forbid everything is shaken to the left of us the right of us as the Minister of Health says and we have to keep a keen eye of, of, of what's happening here and keep in prayer um, that's why I don't take that for joke uh, or have it as, as a mockery it's very serious God alone has helped this territory I said that to you, member, so that you can understand um, better, which you do because this is your forte of, 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 of the dynamics and the different scenarios that financially we have to take into consideration while doing projections and also what all adjustments we need to do to keep those projections intact. If it calls for a revised budget um, to do so, then we would have to. If it calls for um, further cuts to certain areas so that we could keep persons employed but keep the basic services running, then we'd have to do so. But one thing is for sure, we have to make adjustments all the time and we will be making some more so that we can be able to manage the finances of the country based on the revenues that we have coming in and crave the indulgence of everyone to understand that this is not regular times. I think the Minister of Health uh, which you'll ask later, will be able to say since we took office, we haven't had a month, a good month where we could relax without something major happening. And um, you being a financier would know that with these projections, if they change, uh, then we have to make some adjustments uh, based on the revenue and uh, expenditure and the, the GDP we have to make some adjustments in our, in our projections um, ahead. It will also mean that if we have more expenditures too, it will affect our borrowing power because then we could only borrow less because our, our, our ratio would be um, affected also. And there are certain things that we must get done, I must say, member, so that we can hold true to this question, what you have asked, and, and, we have our, and you will hear them later, which are things like um, the the Jocelyn Dykes Primary School, which I wouldn't steal the minister's thunder. That has to be done. And not saying it because you're a member of the second or only, it, is, it must be done. Getting our students out from the Elmo, from CTL to the, the Elmo South High School, those are projects that must be done. And, and also um, the new Isabella Morris Primary School, which will be a junior school, must be done. The extension of, of the airport, some key areas along with the Eastern Long Loop sewage and we must keep going, so we have to balance that against the recurrent section of the budget. The, 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 the real challenge is to get some of our public officers to understand that we have to pull back on some of the, what would have been the regular 
spending so that we could stay within the projections so that when we come out of COVID-19, uh, whenever that is, the country would be better infrastructure-wise and also financially-wise, although it seems like the storm is on, no, not seeing the storm is on right now, uh, which is good. I must add, which you would know from your research, that most of our Caribbean countries have done significant cuts, even to their public officers. Some have even cut as much as 50%, and some even have get, um, received loans to finance the recurrent operation costs. And you would know, member, for the second, that once you start to, to have to lend money to pay for your operation costs, then you know that you are going down a very slippery slope. So all of that are the variables we are trying to make sure that we manage so that we, we do not get down that road and then um, we end up in more trouble than we anticipated for. But I must say all countries are going through this, big or small. But your question is very on target. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think the shorter the question might ask, the longer the answer we might give. But he's the premier nonetheless. Um, but there's a, there's a very detailed response to the question. Mr. Speaker, follow up number two on the same question. Given the debt ratios that the premier has supplied me, um, the question is, um, are we still within range, range um, regarding the financial protocols of the territory? As of right now, the answer is yes, and that's what we are gathering against with all our heart, with all our soul, all our mind. The only area that we have to come in compliance with this right now is the audited financial statements. And I'm happy to report that out um, of the Treasury, we have accelerated that to get more uh, years now to the Auditor General, and I'm very uh, pleased with the acceleration that has happened, and we're looking forward to getting some more years to the Auditor General, so, and then um, getting those audited. And uh, once this pace is set, uh, probably by next year, mid next year, we should be close, if not updated, with the audited financial statement. Uh, we also have a, a, um, a professional in that area who we have brought in to help even triple up on us getting that. That is the last entity that we have to do to, to get in compliance with every single thing that we have signed financially uh, with, the, with the United Kingdom. Uh, so I'm glad to report that. However, I must state that that is why we have to pay attention to the expenditure and make sure that we do not, um, out of, of greed, not need, um, try to force the, the expenditures to go over the revenue that we are making so that we can keep our country out of any negative situation and that we can continue to be the captains of our ship financially and continue to seal it in the right direction towards prosperity with God in the helm with us, guiding us. And uh, that is the best way that I can make sure that I, I describe that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, question number six. Mr. Speaker, would the Premier and Minister of Finance state for this honorable house the complete list of entities that fall on his portfolio broken down by category A, departments, B, units, C, statutory bodies, D, enacted bodies, and E, task force. Mr. Speaker, well, this, this answer, Mr. Speaker, in the standing orders on the section, contents of question, Section 17.1 states the right to ask a question shall be subject to the following general rules as to interpretation of which the speaker shall be the sole judge. Mr. Speaker, 17.1 G9 states a question shall not be asked if the answer to which can be found by reference to available official publications. Now, Mr. Speaker, the reason that I give this is that all these subjects would have been and um, departments under them would have been properly gazetted 
and already made a public document. And Mr. Speaker, as far as I'm with, known as Premier, there has been no significant changes requested um, by me as Premier, so whatever was gazetted still remains and is already in the public domain. So I, I hope the member would, um, you know, be able to understand that based on the rules of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when I started my submission earlier, this was the question that I was speaking about. And this question was removed from the order paper by the very member that I'm asking the question of, and then subsequently put back on. Mr. Speaker, while I am okay with the standing orders and I respect the Premier's answer to the question, I find difficulty in the Premier giving this response to this question when the very first questions that I put to the Honorable Premier, um, without hesitation, he gave details and submitted the answers to me. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I am challenged a bit in terms of why is it that one question is being answered and, and the other is not being answered? But nevertheless, Mr. Speaker, I will move on because the member, the Premier, has submitted his question. Question number seven, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during the questions and answers period of the last House of Assembly, again, these questions were submitted since the 27th of May, 2021. So given during the questions and answer period for the last House of Assembly, I asked the Premier Minister of Finance about the tourism strategy to prepare for and allow for the welcoming back of tourists to our shores, to which the Premier stated that it was confidential information and chose not to disclose this to this Honorable House. Could the Premier please tell this Honorable House when he intends to hold meetings with the stakeholders of the second district on Tortola and Just Van Dyke so that they could be enlightened on the strategy since being out of work for the last 14 months? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I didn't want to interrupt the member, but for the the one before, I would tell him that my recollection of the events surrounding that matter slightly differs to that of yours or my information about what took place. But I would not prolong that because, um, you know, I, I, I really think that um, we, leave the, we leave the water sail under the bridge with that one. Mr. Speaker, in terms of question seven, and um, well, question one, two was a totally different um, matter, Mr. Speaker, but I could have also answered it in the same way, but there was a slight difference in the question. But question seven, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government of the Virgin Islands through the BVI Tourist Board continues to have meetings with different stakeholders in the tourism industry throughout the entire BVI due to the latest challenges once again experienced as a result of COVID-19, these face-to-face -face meetings have been interrupted. Nonetheless, the BVI Tourist Board continues to make an effort to meet with all tourism stakeholders from District 1 to 9 in a phased manner. It is important to note that tourists continue to come to the BVI since the reopening of our borders first through the Terence B. Letsom International Airport and the benefits are more and more being experienced by all the tourism stakeholders in all areas. Mr. Speaker, just for information, the, sake, the record will show that since reopening our borders in December 2020, the number of tourists visiting our shores is as follows. December 2020, 1,907. January 2021, 1,022. February 2021, 899. March 2021, 1,859. April 2021, 2,358. May 2021, 3,508. 
June 2021, 6,892. And July, which was uh, in 2021, which was a, a month where we had the most challenge with this spike. But ironically, we, since we reopened in December 2020, that number jumped up to 7,208. Despite the largest COVID-19 spike, the territory welcomed its highest volume of guests in July 2021 since reopening in December 2020 with a total of 7,208 guests recorded in the month of July 2021. While these numbers are not as high as what the territory was accustomed to experiencing in the past, pre-COVID-19 times, the steady increase since the reopening of our international borders shows promise that the industry is reviving as vaccination makes traveling to the destination easier for visitors from around the world. The product department of the VEI Tourist Board continues to execute hospitality training in the territory in preparation for the peak season and the implementation of hospitality infrastructure that will allow for improvements when we are not operating at our peak time of the season. Taxi operator trainings have been planned as well as to ensure that when the cruise ships return, given that we have the issues with the current spike, that our front line is ready to go again. Your government through the BVI Tourist Board continues to execute hospitality training at various tourism sector businesses to reinforce the hospital, his hospitality training that was provided at HL Stow Community College. This training has been conducted and continues to be available and is ongoing in all districts. Understanding that our hospitality is what will set us apart, this is very, a very important initiative. Mr. Speaker, no district will be left behind. I'm currently in advanced discussions with the BBI Tourist Board, developing a schedule for a series of interactive meetings with all stakeholders on the way forward in improving our tourism product, especially in light of upcoming economic activities such as the West End Ferry Terminal construction and improvements to our airport facilities to accommodate direct flights from the USA and Europe. Mr. Speaker, I give that in-depth answer because the member did ask about his constituency, but these programs are ongoing for all the constituencies, so it's none um, to pick out or to, to highlight. We're trying to deal with all of them, especially those that have the most uh, stakeholders in the tourism sector. Mr. Speaker. The question that I asked and the answer that the Premier gave, I think, only coming on to the last paragraph that I start to get a hint of the answer. So I will repeat the question, Mr. Speaker, as in the form of a follow-up. Premier, could you please tell this honorable house and myself as district representative, as the Minister of Tourism with your team, when you intend to hold meetings with the stakeholders of the second districts on Tortola and Just Van Dyke so that they can be enlightened on the strategy going forward for tourism as that is the only area, main area of the working class in the second district. Mr. Speaker, I know the member likes to get answers that he would enjoy. But I did answer the question. There were training programs that the, that the junior minister was over with the HLSCC, um, getting ready for the reopening of the seaports at one time. There are other, pro in, and that was in Justin Dykes, that was also in different parts of the territory. There also were many ongoing with the taxi operators of the different islands including Jocelyn Dykes. My answer is that the tourist board is not just focusing on the second district, 
It's focusing on all districts, especially those areas that are heavy in the tourism industry. So it includes the second district, the fourth district, ninth district, all of them there. there con is continuous training, continuous dialogue, and they will continue even some more. They had some more intense ones coming up, but the latest spike caused an interruption in that. But there have been uh, collaboration on, on, in different parts of the second district and other districts. And there will be more. And, and Mr. Speaker, the member would know too that the, before the spike came in, and even during the spike, the number of, of yachts and boats going to Virgin God and going to Justin Dykes had started to increase immensely. So it is just for us to keep our numbers in the COVID-19 down and um, practice all the safe measures so that, that this strategy can continue to work and more and more of our personnel, uh, our visitors can get to Justin Dykes, can get to Virgin God, can come here and be as safe as they can. And also they come in making sure that they're safe. We're even working right now with the Minister of Health, you probably would have heard, to um, asking for persons who want temporary employment to be trained in the swabbing of persons so that we can dispatch them that the Western, Jocelyn Lake, Virgin Gorda, and Anigara jetties that have been designated now as ports of entry for solely vaccinated persons so that when they come in, they can now be swabbed within 15 to 20 minutes um, and have their results. They can also um, be able to apply even before they reach on their phone so that they can register to be swabbed and when they get off the boat, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes and your results is, is there. Once you're negative, you're free to go. Once you're positive, then the health um, officials will click in what needs to be done. So even to that, Mr. Speaker, is now um, persons are being trained to be dispatched so that we can have more traffic and tourist boat is working with, with this program also. So we can have more traffic going directly from USVI to Joseph Van Dyke or Puerto Rico to Joseph Van Dyke, directly to West End, directly to Virgin Gorda, or also directly to Anigada from other areas. All of this, the tourist boat is working along with health and speaking with all the different um, businesses, being not all as yet, but getting to more and more of them so that they can be more than ready. But if you could also recall, since we have to go in depth, that, that these businesses were asked to come and be trained and be part of the gold seal standard so that they would have already um, know what all is expected of their businesses, whether it be Anigara, Justin Likes, or, or whatever, or any district, so that they can know what will be expected of their businesses and be trained in those areas. Those, are on, those happen um, at HLSC, CC. There are more um, that's ongoing. There were other tourist um, training for taxi drivers, others. So it's an ongoing process for all districts. So, and it has already happened and will continue to happen in all the districts just about. Have they reached everyone that's in the tourism industry already? The answer is no. But will they get to all of them? The answer is yes. But I might, must say that anyone in the tourist industry could have a reach also the, out themselves because these programs were advertised and persons were encouraged to come and take up these programs which were free of charge because the government were paying for them. And those who couldn't go to HLSCC, we went to them on the different islands to train persons in the areas of concern in tourism and hospitality and how to deal with COVID-19. So I needed to be uh, very explicit with it because that, these, these are things that happen and continue to be ongoing that the tourist board is involved in, the college is involved in some of them, and um, along with working with health. Un these are ongoing and will continue to be. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the original question stemmed from the tourism strategy, which the Premier stated was confidential. So I understand the training 
and the workshops that were carried out. So Premier, what I will do is I will call some district meetings and invite you, sir, along with representatives from the Tourist Board to come to the second district, not just Just Van Dyke, but King Garden Bay and Bruce Bay and all the er other areas within my district to have a discussion with them because that, that is where this question is stemmed from. It is not a question that I'm asking on, on my own so that they can get a better understanding even though we are now in August of what the strategy is going forward and what they are expected to do and how they can better prepare themselves for what is ongoing. This is, this is something that I would do, Premier, and I hope that you would take, take the invitation. Question number eight, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, would the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House when he plans to install street lights on the Windy Hill Road, which leads from Stout's Lookout to Chalwell Estate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I would just say with a question before. Uh, member, you know you don't have to wait for any member until we come to the House to say if any area of concern seems to not be getting their attention. You can let us know because one thing I can say for the, the Junior Minister of Tourism and, and the Tourist Board and all of them is that they're working hard to include everyone, so there's no intention to exclude anyone, whether it be Bruce Bay, or it be King Garden Bay, or it be Carib Bay, or wherever it be Virgin Garda, or Long Bay, whether it's um, in Eastern, Western, or whatever. This is for all of us. So I am I'm more than happy to let the tourist board know to get in contact with your yourself so that the areas of concern could be addressed so that they can say more of what they've been doing. Um, I also had said or some earlier in my statement some of what the tourist board were doing to help draw persons to the territory and how the different areas now can benefit from it. So I will have the junior minister follow up this with the, with the head of tourist board so that they can get with you and they'll see whatever uh, sections in your constituency that uh, needs more attention or needs attention so we can address it because I want to see all our people succeed. So you have my support on that. In terms of answer to question eight, it's similar in nature to question seven in that we we're trying to help all the districts, but you asked for this area, so let me answer. Mr. Speaker, the BBI Electricity Corporation has advised, and they have advised, that all streetlights that were existing before hurricanes Orma and Maria in the Windy Hill area are reinstated. But you will tell me if that is not so, or if it is so. They have further advised that prior to 2017, no streetlights existed in the remaining portion of the road between Windy Hill and Chalbert Estate as the transmission and distribution overhead infrastructure did not extend along the entire road route. Nonetheless, the BBIEC has assured that we will continue the street lighting program throughout the territory in a phased manner. Mr. Speaker, I know we'll have some follow-up, so I'm more than prepared to discuss with the member and answer accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, the Premier is right. The, the, answer, the question was very specific to the road leading from Stout Lookout, if you want to look at from Stout Lookout to Charlotte Estate or Charlotte Estate to Stout Lookout. And Mr. Speaker, this question again is important given especially the fact that for just about six months there about the Ballas Bay Road was closed and a lot more traffic 
was going on that road coming for, with persons coming from Ballas Bay and even Caribe going over to Shelva to get into Road Town. But Mr. Speaker, my question is, which phase of this approach will address the street lights on the Windy Hill Road leading to Stout Lookout at is it, as it is very, very dark, Mr. Speaker, and you, you would note also, Mr. Speaker, that due to the fact that the asphalt has been removed, um, it is quite a lonely road and I believe it is important for us to have it. So I'm, I'm interested to know which phase of the phased approach will address the lighting of this area, Mr. Speaker. You, you're talking about the phase by the Ballast Bay Road that was just completed? No, the, 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 the one that, that you would take if you're going from, coming from Carrot Bay over the hill to, to Chalwa. They, just, they just, call it the, um, I think it's the Ridge Road. Yeah, the, uh, um, the Stone Walk. Uh, you mean the, one, yeah, yeah you, you mean that that was used uh, a, a lot lately, you said, for the last six months? Well, Mr. Speaker, it, it was used a lot more during the closure of the Ballast Bay Road for the reconstruction of the bridge, but it has always been traversed on a daily basis um, by persons living in those areas, especially coming from the west and, and going to and fro. But is with, it is without and has been without, as the, the persons from BBI Electricity rightfully said, it has been without um, lights even prior to Alma. So my question now is when will we get some street lights in that area? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will in, inform Electricity Cooperation as they have an ongoing initiative for street lights throughout the entire territory. There are a lot of areas that the, the hurricane knocked out the street light from 2017 and up to now some have not been replaced. And, but um, the, lately, with the order of street lights that came in, that they, that's why they did that section of what I describe in your constituency, and they move on to some other constituency to make sure that they spread them out. But I will inform them and make sure that we move towards getting um, that area that you is rightfully stated to get that um, attended to. I cannot give the answer of when because they're definitely trying to to see how they can share in, in different areas some very dark areas that, that are heavily traversed and heavily populated to make sure that there are lights in those also. So I would be able to speak with them and get back to you on the answer. Um, I know that the traffic had increased significantly in Windy Hill, given that um, this government had completed another project in your constituency, uh, fixing the Ballast Bay gut, which is, uh, was a problem for many years where you can now have two cars, two cars. Um, passing one going up and one coming down. Uh, so I know that with, with us fixing one area of your constituency that, that blocked off that road for the six months, created uh, more traffic and would have caused more persons to be uh, re recognized that that area probably would need some more lighting. So uh, we have fixed another area in, the, in your constituency. And you know that we will also move towards uh, addressing this one now that you bring it to our attention. Likewise, there are some areas in the first, in the third, fourth, fifth, uh, where more lights are needed. So we're going to try to balance it against giving each person a fair share every time an order comes in until everyone is accommodated and all the areas that are needed are accommodated. So I think that that will be the, the most precise, precise and accurate answer to give you. Uh, the time frame, I'll get back to you on that when I speak with VIEC, but I will definitely ask them to put it as part of their plan of action. If it has not been already, because I'll have to go back to them, but I'll ask them to put it in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't have a follow-up on this question, but I must 
um, comment on something that the Premier stated, which is that indeed the team from BBI Electricity, um, even in other areas of, of my constituency, have done a tremendous job in um, replacing some of the lights. Well, the majority of the lights throughout the territory that has been damaged or even uh, destroyed as a result of hurricanes, Irma and Maria. So I want to commend them on that, Mr. Speaker. Question number nine, if I may, sir. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House when he intends to make funding available to prepare the territory, specifically the tourist destination areas like the entire second district for receiving guests through landscaping and infrastructural works. Mr. Speaker, again, this question was on the order paper submitted on May 27th for a June 15th sitting. And as the member um, prior to me and his questions, it has gotten worse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that we have this question. I, I did hear something that continues to be repeated, um, and I think it would be within line to assist um, the member for the second and third, if they kindly will allow me to assist them in finishing the sentence. Because I have heard them said all 32 times that these questions were submitted in May for June, but they were pushed back. But allow me to put a comma after that and say they were pushed back, comma, because of the situation of COVID-19. So now we are having a sitting now. So I wanted to make sure that that is clear so persons would not think that we were avoiding them and uh, due to other uh, measures that came up as a result. So Mr. Speaker, I don't want the public to think that we are avoiding the questions. On a point, a point of information, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my reason for mentioning it is not a knock on the government. It's to, in, to, to enlighten the fact that my questions might seem dated insofar as things may have happened. The questions I'm asking about may, the things may have been corrected in the period. And it seems like I'm asking a question about something that already take, taken place. That's my, that's my reason for, for mentioning the fact that it was okay. June 17, 17. The yes, Mr. Speaker, and just to clarify, I know the pre Premier likes to think for us, or try to think for us, Mr. Speaker. The reason, the reason for me reiterating that point now is that it was a problem when I posed this question in May 27 with the um, overgrown bush and thing, but now it is um, one big problem um, some months later. So it was, not, it was not to do anything other than to highlight how, how much more um, dangerous and heightened the situation has become. Thank you, good minister and lawyer there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for so many things following the comma that was be able to explain that we really were not running from this, but because of the delays due to COVID-19, and the members are correct, some of the things have been corrected uh, since that time, um, that would have, uh, and some of them still needs to be corrected. But it was because of COVID-19 why the sit-ins were pushed back. I think that's just the crux of what I wanted to make sure. So all of us are correct, so all of us get an A+. Plus. Mr. Speaker, we will now move to the front of the class and have this question answered. Mr. Speaker, the member for the second district would be aware that during each year, landscaping and infrastructural works are ongoing initiatives throughout all districts, not just for guests, but all persons residing in the territory. I have been advised that the different parts of the second district have benefited from recent infrastructure works which we have discussed earlier, such as the completion of improvement works to the Ballast Bay Bridge and repairs to Windy Hill Road, among other areas in the second district. The, recommend, the, the recommencement of the territory's landscaping maintenance program is due to start very shortly 
and the member will be informed. I'll be here for any follow-up on the landscaping. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My follow-up will be simply to thank the Premier and Minister of Finance for answering the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Premier, for answering all questions posed by the member for the Second District. We continue now with the question posed by the Honorable Turnbull to the Honorable Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture. Honorable Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture tell this Honorable House how much of the $40 million taken from Social Security Board was allocated to education? Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the second district for his question. Mr. Speaker, the $40 million grant from the Social Security Board came about because of hardship imposed on the people of the Virgin Islands due to a global pandemic we all know as COVID-19. Many of the programs from this grant were associated with providing relief for persons who work within the private sector, as well as stimulating the economy, which was negatively impacted by lockdowns and the shutdown of the tourist economy. Mr. Speaker, a very important relief program was the $1 million grant to the daycares, preschools, and private educational institutions. A meeting with an association of daycares and preschools last week confirmed that the grants associated with this program were essential in keeping those businesses afloat, which are all within the private sector. As we know, Daycares and preschools provide a strong foundation for primary and secondary education. Many private educational institutions have provided letters to show gratitude for the grants which assisted them at a time when they had great hardship due to many parents being unwilling or unable to pay tuition. Mr. Speaker, in regard to the public sector, your government was adamant that no public servant, including our hardworking teachers, would lose their employment despite the decreased government revenue as a result of COVID-19. In addition to the $40 million grant, Mr. Speaker, your government, through identifying government funds, procured 359 computers for online learning after we are forced to, forced to stop face-to-face -face instruction due to the threat of COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the minister is stating that of the $40 million, only $1 million was allocated towards education and it was for the the preschools and daycares, Mr. Speaker, am I made to understand that correctly? Uh, Mr. Speaker, what I'm saying is uh, the purpose of the $40 million grant was to provide some measure of relief to persons impacted by COVID-19. So the persons within the private sector who would have had an impact due to COVID-19 would have been in education, would have been daycares, preschools, and private educational institutions, which all were grateful 
Mr. Speaker, and found very useful the grants provided to them. Uh, certainly, uh, there are many other very good things uh, that were done through the $40 million grant, but that's a debate for another time. But of, in the public sector, Mr. Speaker, uh, we know that um, the impact of COVID-19 had to do with us going really online. Uh, and we were able to provide, I'm grateful that we were able to provide uh, laptops for the individuals, students within the public sector to be able to, to continue their learning um, even though um, for periods of time we did not have face-to-face -face instruction, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, can I ask my follow-up now? Now that I got the clarification, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, The minister now mentioned, I think, the 350 laptops that were allocated to students on, on the award system. Mr. Speaker, does that, does those, or do those laptops, the cost of those laptops come from the $40 million, or was that something that was previously announced? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the cost of those laptops uh, do not come from the $40 million grant from Social Security. Um, that was uh, funds that the government identified from the Consolidated Fund uh, to be able to, to deal with that, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So then the conclusion, as I stated earlier with the clarification, Mr. Speaker, was that out of the $40 million, only $1 million was given towards education for daycares and preschools. And Mr. Speaker, question number two, follow-up question number two would be, Mr. Speaker, would the minister agree with me that some of the monies that were given from the Social Security grant could be better served in the educational system, i.e. schools and their development. Mr. Speaker, I repeat, uh, when the government sought the 40 million grant from Social Security, it was directly as a result of hardship imposed based on the COVID-19 pandemic. We had grants to help persons who were unemployed through Social Security. Uh, we had um, grants to persons um, within um, the transportation industry. Uh, we had a number of grants to be able to provide relief and stimulus to persons within the private sector, Mr. Speaker. And while, of course, we are always uh, grateful and seeking ways to be able to provide additional finances uh, for the education system, such as uh, money services, um, tax that provides some money um, to the education sector. The grant from Social Security was for a specific purpose related to COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. But I do agree, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that we have to find uh, additional ways to be able to provide funding to the education system. If that's the point that the member for the second district wants to make, we can make that point together. Uh, let's see how we can provide uh, more sustainable finance 
to the education sector in addition to what we have made available already. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I thank the minister for his response, um, but I, I was not, and I am not picking at anything. When I said educational system, Mr. Speaker, the parents in the schools who also, who actually received those laptops were finding difficulties as a result of COVID-19 to even pay their internet bills. So that was an impact directed towards education. So I am not picking at anything, Mr. Speaker. I'm just trying to understand if we don't think it could have been better used uh, in education. I'll move on, Mr. Speaker, to question number two. Mr. Speaker, could the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture please tell this Honorable House if the arrangements to subsidize transportation for the public schools still exist? A. If the answer is yes, are the transportation operators paid up to date? Again, this question is as at June 15th. And B, if not, why not? Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the uh, member for the second district for his question. Mr. Speaker, the arrangement to subsidize transportation for public schools still exists. Um, the transportation operators have not yet received up-to-date payments. Um, and the, the question is why? The answer to the question is, Mr. Speaker, um, the allow me to elaborate a little further the preparation of agreements for the transportation operators was delayed by the process of trying to get the actual number of students that are being transported the face-to-face -face opening of schools has increased the number of students that are being transported on a daily basis agreements have been prepared and are awaiting the signature of the operators Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could the minister then tell this honorable house um, what was the last date that the operators were paid and this new contract, um, what time frame is it, is it um, for? Mr. Speaker, I'd have to get that information and bring it back uh, to the member, which I'd be glad to do. Uh, let me just make sure I understand. It's the last date that they were paid and the time period that the new contract is for. I can get that uh, back to the member. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, while I appreciate that answer, I will take the first part, but the second part, if the minister is aware that contracts are being await, awarded to the operators and waiting their signature, then it has to be for a certain time period, or is it multiple contracts that have been awarded? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if I understand. You want to know the, 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 the time period uh, that the contract is for, or you want to know um, when they'll be signed? Mr. Speaker, I will slow down. The minister in his response to my question stated that the operators were not paid up to date. He then continued to state the answer for B, which is that there were some difficulties and there are new contracts being um, prepared and awaiting the signatures of the operators. So while I can take that the minister does not have the time period for which the operators are not paid up to date, if there are contracts awaiting operators' signature, what time period are those contracts that are awaiting signatures? 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll repeat what I said before, that I'll, I'll get that information for the member and bring it back. I do not have that information in front of me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. Yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker. I can count. One, two, three. Mr. Speaker, the recreation facilities at the Just Van Dyke Primary School and Ivan Dawson Primary School are in terrible condition, are in dire need of repair and upgraded. Mr. Speaker, would the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture please say when works will commence to remedy the A, overlay and painting of both basketball courts, B, lighting for the basketball courts, and C, backboards and rims and poles for the Just Van Dyke Primary School. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Approval is given for the funding to construct an overlay of the court at the Ivan Dawson Primary School. The work will include the construction of a three inch concrete slab overlay on the existing court surface. Additional work to be carried out on the basketball court is the acrylic painting of the surface and the marking of lines for basketball and volleyball. Mr. Speaker, the commencement of work on the court was delayed due to the urgent need for construction work on the roof structure on two buildings at the school. A site meeting was held with the contractor and a new start date of the 23rd of August 2021 was agreed between the contractor and the ministry. Upon immediate completion of the slab overlay, the painting and other ancillary work will begin. Mr. Speaker, all work on the court surface is expected to be completed before the commencement of, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. Work is expected to be completed before the end of, this, of the year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 3B, Mr. Speaker, with regard to the lighting uh, for the basketball court at the Ivan Dawson Primary School and the Just Van Dyke Primary School, this is on our work plan for this year and we expect that this can begin to be addressed before the end of the year. Mr. Speaker, it is the Ministry's goal to provide the most suitable and safe recreational facilities for the schools and the communities. 3C, Mr. Speaker, the basketball court at the Just Van Dyke Primary School received backboards, rims, and nets as a donation from the Unite BVI Foundation in 2020 in an effort to provide a recreational facility for the school and the community. We continue to show appreciation to the many donors who answer to our call for assistance in rebuilding after the 2017 hurricanes. Mr. Speaker, due to the location of the basketball court and the constant flooding of the area, it is evident that this court surface will continue to deteriorate at a fast rate with large cracks as the ground continues to sink and shift. Although the ministry understands the importance of providing a safe and suitable recreational facility, it is also recommended that the area be filled to a higher level and the court be reconstructed. In the interim, the ministry will conduct an assessment of the facility, request quotations and funding to replace the poles, backboards and rims. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not provided the answers from the minister, so um, I have to try to listen keenly after each, each one. But that was a, a loaded question with a loaded response. Um, minister, you would have to um, please bear me out on my understanding. For Ivan Dawson Primary School, Mr. Speaker, Minister, you stated that the works would begin or the contract would be signed in August 23rd. Is it that the works would begin for Ivan Dawson Primary School or is that the contract would be signed? I, I, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Oh. 
yes, a, a start date uh, for the contract. Well, the contract for the walks, the start date would be the 23rd of August for the walks to start. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, just by way of um, updating this Honorable House with regards to question B, um, through the BVI Electricity Corporation, um, the lighting for the Just One Light Primary School specifically um, have been sourced. So that is one minister that you can uh, remove from your list and just focus solely on the backboards and the poles for now. Mr. Speaker, um, follow-up question would simply be, Minister, I noticed that you paused and you hesitated on, on when the works would be completed, and you stated by the end of the year. That was for both um, Ivan Dawson and Just for Night Primary, or was it specifically for one school or the other? Uh, both. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this question, we are approaching the end of 2020-21 school year. Would the Deputy Premier and Minister of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture tell this Honorable House the plans with timelines to adequately prepare the public school buildings in the second district and wider Virgin Islands for the 2021-22 school year by remedying the following. A, infrastructural issues. B, leakages. C, mold. D, drainage. E, furnishings. And Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member for the second for his question. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Jasper and Dyke Primary School has the following infrastructural issues. One, electrical work. Two, roof works. Three, construction of boys' and girls' restrooms. Four, construction of a storeroom. Ivan Dawson Primary School has the following infrastructural issues. One, mold cleaning. Two, installation of window screens. Three, cleaning of AC units. Uh, Enos Adams Primary School has the following infrastructural issues. One, mold cleaning. Two, fixing of a leaking roof. Three, leveling and surfacing of yard. Four, electrical work plastering and painting. Mr. Speaker, a broad range of infrastructural issues exist in other schools, including mold cleaning, the cleaning of AC units, replacement of window screens and fixtures, cistern cleanings, replacement of bathroom fixtures, replacement of lighting fixtures, painting, tiling, among other things. Some of this work has already been started and will continue into the adver Advent term. Answer 4B. Mr. Speaker, repairs to the roof structure on two buildings at the Ivan Dawson Primary School began in January of this year and were completed in May 2021. To date, with careful monitoring by the maintenance officer, there are no reports of any further leakage. The ministry also contracted the repair of roofs for Ebenezer Thomas Primary School, Alexandrina Maduro Primary School, Leonora Delville Primary School, all of which have been completed. Mr. Speaker, there are other schools which require work, which we hope to address in 2022 with newly budgeted funds. Uh, 4C. During the school year, several schools were treated for mold, including, including Alta Scatliff, Ivan Dawson, Leonora Delville, and Alexandrina Maduro Primary School. However, the mold cleaning has to be ongoing. Therefore, Leonora Delville Primary, Claudia Cricky Educational Center, Alexandrina Maduro Primary, and Enos Adams Primary are slated to be cleaned in the coming weeks. In addition, a full treatment and refurbishing will take place at the CTL building in Passer Estate, which currently houses the Elmo Stout High School Senior Division. Mold cleaning is an ongoing problem, and I will advocate for a specific allocation 
for mold remediation in the upcoming budget exercise. Answer 4D. Mr. Speaker, we are working very closely with the Public Works Department to ensure guts are cleared and to ensure proper drainage to avoid any flooding as much as possible. And 4E, Mr. Speaker, furniture for outfitting for the El Mustout High School, Ella Dorothy Turnbull Building, the Brigada Flax Educational Center, and the Enos Adams Primary School was funded through uh, were funded through the Caribbean Development uh, Bank Redevelopment Loan Agreement. The furniture was tendered, bids were evaluated, and a contract was approved and awarded to Metal Designs and Concept Limited, a company located in Trinidad. Mr. Speaker, to date we have received 89 pieces, included 67 teachers' chairs and 22 guest chairs. Representatives from Metal Designs and Concepts have been challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic and restricted by curfews and stay-at-home orders issued by the Government of Trinidad and Tobago, which have led to delays. In addition to the shipment we received in June, another shipment was scheduled to arrive on August 15th and another on the 22nd of August. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know that you are the sole judge, but it's quite difficult, Mr. Speaker, to have such a detailed answer and not the benefit of being able to refer to the answer given by the minister even after he would have answered the question, Minister, in the Mr. Speaker, and if I was to bring your attention to Standing Orders 18.2, it states that a written reply to each question shall be read by the ministers to whom the question is put, and a copy of the reply shall be handed to each member of the House. Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping that we can uh, continue as the Premier has so kindly done in preparing and furnishing the answers so that I'm able to be able to follow the minister and prepare a proper follow-up. In any event, Mr. Speaker, I will focus, even though the question stated the second district and wider Virgin Islands, I was interesting to hear that the newly constructed school at Enos Adams is now dealing with leakages um, and I know we have the same issue uh, in Ivan Dawson that I thought would have been addressed, but up until last Saturday, Mr. Speaker, I learned that there is some still some leakages um, within the classrooms, Minister. So I, I think you might want to have your team check on that. Minister, the, the follow up will be for the three public schools within the second district. Um, do we expect to have all schools open where students return based on your announcements and, and the issues that we now know still exist uh, come September uh, for school, for the school year? Yes, thank you for providing with the information in regard to Ivan Dawson. I'll certainly have that checked out uh, because of course we don't want any further problems there uh, with water getting in which leads to mold. We just had a, a mold cleaning there and we are um, certainly going to open Ivan Dawson in September. And all preparations are being made to make that a reality. Uh, same thing with um, Joss Van Dyke and Eda, Enos Adams Primary School. I know um, that there was a challenge at Enos Adams. Um, I think it was a ceiling issue in turn that was leading to the leaking roof. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to check on that 
And um, for, for whatever reason, I thought that the issue at Enos Adams was rectified. Um, but I'm going to double check and to ensure that whatever the ceiling problem was there is rectified. Some water was settling up at, on the top of the roof and wherever wasn't properly sealed, water was getting through. Um, but I'm going to check on that. Um, I, I, pr I can promise the member for the second district that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just before you continue, member for the second, let me again humbly but politely remind members, and I know that this will be the last time I'll have to say this, that after your question is answered, it's convention that you have it prepared to give the member asking the question I see. Only one minister is doing that, that's the Premier. I want to urge all other members, all other ministers, that once you ask your question, you can have then this answer your question, the sergeant at arm can then take it to the member to assist him in the follow-up. And I don't have to remind ministers that the speaker must at all times have the answers at my disposal. I don't have to remind you about that because I know you are complying and will continue to comply. So with that said, I will ask the member for the second to continue his questions. I don't know if, you, if the minister caught your eye, but he was indicated to think so. I would yield to him if you saw this. Oh, certainly, Deputy Premier. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and certainly um, humble apologies uh, for not having the, the written questions, but I wanted to ask permission of you, Mr. Speaker, and the member for the second, if I could share my, my answers electronically, because I am an environmentalist, and I have been pushing very hard for us to be able to um, share these things electronically because I would like to cut down on the unnecessary printing of paper, which as we know contributes to the problem of global warming. We are in the hurricane season right now, and I certainly think that we should do our best to conserve as much as possible, uh, to cut down on um, cutting down the trees, you know, through which we got to um, uh, you to make paper and if we can use the electronic means I, 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 I see it as a better use of our resources so I humbly ask permission to be able to do so. Deputy Premier, there is absolutely no no issues with that. Um, members are free to email the clerk, the deputy clerk and the member in question uh, your questions electronically in the spirit of the House of Assembly going green. So you have my full support on that, Deputy Premier. Permission has been granted. Member for the second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I also want to state that I have no issues with the electronic submissions, but sometimes it's good to have paper in your hand, but not having the answers at all is a, is a completely different um, story. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, no question. Yes, sorry. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as we are approaching the end again, the end of the 2020-21 school year. Would the Deputy Premier Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture tell this Honorable House the plans with timelines to adequately staff public schools in the second district and wider Virgin Islands for the 2021-22 <coughs> school year? A, give a detailed report of how many teachers are, prin how many teachers are principals teachers and staff that have, okay, I got it. Mr. Speaker, give it A, give the detailed report of how many teachers 
and principals, teachers and staff that have left or will leave the service at the end of this 2020-21 school year. B, give a detailed report of how many principals are needed for each public school. C, give a detailed report of how many teachers are needed for each public school. And D, give a detailed report of specialists needed for each public school. Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member for the second for his questions. And um, perhaps uh, the deputy uh, clerk can email him so he can uh, follow the answers. Okay, so hopefully you would have received that so you can, you can follow member for the second. Mr. Speaker, at, at this time, it is difficult to say how many teachers and other staff will leave at the end of this school year, since information is still being received at the ministry. Mr. Speaker, at the primary level, there are seven teachers who have indicated their desire to retire, and five from the secondary level. This gives us a total of 12 retirees throughout our system. Our records indicate that there are approximately 19 teachers who left during the current school year, or who have indicated that they will not be returning at the beginning of the upcoming 2021-2022 upcoming school year. As a result, the total number of teachers to be replaced is 31. I've been informed that some of these positions have been filled with the recent Teaching Service Commission interviews. 5B, Mr. Speaker, all our vacancies for principal positions have been filled. Uh, 5C. Mr. Speaker, please note that this information available to date is Alta Scatliff Primary School, one teacher, Claudia, Claudia Cricky Educational Center, five teachers. Enid Scatliff Pre Primary School, one teacher. Esden Henley Riche Learning Center, one teacher. Francis Letson Primary School, two teachers. Joss Van Dyke Primary School, one substitute teacher. Joy Samuel Primary School, one teacher. Leonora Delville Primary School, one teacher. Virgin Islands School of Technical Studies, three teachers. Brigado Flax Educational Center Secondary Division, eight teachers. Elmer Stout High School, 15 teachers. Teacher assistants, eight. Total to date, 47. Mr. Speaker, although 31 persons are leaving, there are additional teachers who are needed to complete the teaching staff for the upcoming year. Again, we are currently engaged in TSC interviews, and some of these positions would have been filled. 5D. Mr. Speaker, the need for specialists in the public school system is rising each year as we continue to identify students with varying needs. Currently, there are three positions for special education teachers that are budgeted for, and these positions are already filled. However, there are regular classroom teachers with training who perform these roles daily. We also have three reading specialist positions budgeted for, and two of these positions are filled. Mr. Speaker, while we would some they like to see each public school in the territory with an assigned specialist, given the constraints, we operate an itinerant teacher program for special education teachers and reading specialists at the primary level. Realistically, there should be a specialist assigned to a school according to the ratio, one to 100. After reviewing the data for the advent and Lent terms in our primary schools, we are able to project the following. Alexandrina Madur Primary School, two learning support assistants needed. Alta Scatliff Primary School, Enid Scatliff Pre-Primary School, one needed. Claudia Cricky Educational Center, one currently serving once a week. Ebenezer Thomas Primary School, one needed. Enos Adams Primary School, three needed. Esden Henley Richelle Learning, three needed. Learning Center, three needed. And two aides to assist with hygiene, routines, and general supervision. Francis Letson Primary School, special education teachers, two needed. One shared with Willard Wheatley Primary School to help with load, and two learning support assistants. Jas Van Dyke, one 
learning support assistant needed. One learning support assistant. Joyce Samuel Primary School, one special education specialist needed. Leonora Delville Primary School, Ivan Dawson Primary School, one special education specialist needed, shared between two, the two schools. Willard Wheatley Primary School, one needed, an extra to walk between two schools. Mr. Speaker, for those schools not mentioned, there are persons already in place to accommodate them. Regarding secondary schools, the projected need for specialist educators needed are as follows. El Mostau, grades seven through nine, special education specialists, one per grade, three are needed. Learning support assistance, two are needed. Reading specialists, one is needed. El Mostau, grades 10 through 12, special education specialists, special education specialists, two are needed. Learning support assistance, two are needed. Reading specialists, one is needed. Brigada Flax Educational Center Secondary Division, two special education teachers are needed, one learning support assistant is needed. Virgin Islands School of Technical Studies, one special education teacher is needed, one learning support assistant is also needed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his initial answer to to the question. Mr. Speaker, my follow-up question would be, based on the amount of need for educators within the system, Minister, could you please tell us, Honorable House, if the adequate funding is in the budget of education to uh, fill these positions? Uh, certainly, Mr. Speaker, I thank um, the member for his follow-up. Certainly, there's always need for more hands in education. And I'm certainly going to be uh, pushing for uh, more positions because we have um, two things that we have to take a look at. Uh, we have the positions which are available now and also possibly increasing the amount of positions in the budget. Um, we do our best to fill all the positions which are available. Um, and of course, in the teaching service, you always have uh, some level of turnover and there's always a need to be able to um, bring in new teachers. And that's why we are restarting the um, teacher education program at the college to make sure we have a dedicated source of teachers coming in, into the service. Um, but there's also the need for increasing the amount of positions we have in the teaching service because certainly um, the schools are getting bigger there are more children coming into the school system and our positions are, are currently not being increased. Um, and this, we know, will expand the entire um, public service. So it's nece necessary for us to be able to grow our economy and bring in additional revenue so we can provide all the positions needed within the public service because we know already our recurrent expenditure is very large. But even in the midst of that, I certainly am going to push for education to get a larger share of the budget. And I will welcome the cooperation of all members in the House when budget time comes around to push and advocate for more money for education, more money for, um, for filling positions in education and possibly to increase the number of positions in education. But I know that um, as a government, we are doing all that we can um, to bring more revenue 
um, and to, to, to do all that we can to support the education system. I have to say that the Premier Minister of Finance has been very understanding and very cooperative and very accommodating for the request that I have come to him with. Um, but I know given COVID-19 and given the shrinking revenue, it's a very difficult time right now. Um, but we continue, to, we continue to push for more resources in education because we believe when we invest in education that all other sectors and all other areas of society will benefit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the minister stated not that there was a want or a desire for these educations, educators in the various schools in the territory. He stated that there was a need and Mr. Speaker, if there is a need for these positions to be filled, I'm wondering, Mr. Speaker, if we are not in fact doing a disservice to this now generation who will take over this territory in ensuring that these positions are filled and the schools are supplied with the necessary human resources to carry out the education development of our children. So my question, Mr. Speaker, simply, if education in our children is in fact a priority, why can't we get these positions that are needed Filled now. Again, I thank the member for the second district for his follow up. I just want to, to give some clarity, Mr. Speaker, so I'm not misunderstood. We have the Teaching Service Commission. We're trying the best right now to fill the positions that I outlined in my answer. I don't want that to be confused. There are positions which have been advertised and they're going through the process of filling those positions. But what I disclosed is that I believe we need to create new positions in the budget and we need to fill those. And certainly this is a problem that has existed over many years. I don't want persons to get the impression that this is a now problem that only is now taking place. And like many other problems that this administration has encountered, we're not going to run away from the challenges. We're going to seek ways of addressing those challenges. And I certainly welcome the support of the member of the second district and all other members in advocating for a bigger slice of the pie to education. Now, education can exhaust your whole budget. That's the type of needs you always have in education. That is something that you see in every single country in the world. There's no country in the world, or very few countries in the world, who will say that enough is being budgeted towards education. I know since coming into this position, Mr. Speaker, there has been quite a lot expended in education. In fact, I would challenge anyone who would say that there's been a two-year period where more has been expended in educational infrastructure, for example. I challenge anybody to, to bring me information about more being expended in a two-year period in educational infrastructure. And that will continue throughout um, this administration's uh, tenure. But that doesn't mean that enough is being done. We have to fight for more being done. That's why we need to bring and support revenue measures, which this administration has brought to the House of Assembly and various revenue, members, uh, re revenue measures are being frustrated 
um, some by a lack of assent and others in other ways being frustrated. But we have to work over time, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we are able to grow the revenue and to be able to facilitate the type of education system that our children and our territory deserves. So I'll just end off to say, Mr. Speaker, there's no lack of effort on the part of this administration. And um, this is not a no problem. This is a problem that um, this administration has met here. And it's our responsibility to be able to solve it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if, if, if I may, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm moving forward, but I have to pivot. Because now that I'm provided the answers, I have to go back. Mr. Speaker, question number three, A, that the minister answered, and I ask him to clarify the answer which he stated, by the end of the year, both works will be completed. But in his question, is in his answers that were submitted to me, Mr. Speaker, I would read, Mr. Speaker, at, at, approval was given for the funding to construct an overlay of the court at Ivan Dawson Primary School. The work will include the construction of a three-inch concrete slab overlay on the existing court surface. Additional work to be carried out on the basketball court is acrylic painting on the surface and the marking of lines on the basketball and volleyball, for basketball and volleyball. Mr. Speaker, he then says, the commencement of this work was delayed due to the urgent need for construction work on the roof structure on two buildings at the school. A site meeting was held with the contractor and a new start date of the 23rd of August 2021 was agreed between the contractor and the ministry. Upon immediate completion of the slab overlay, the painting and other ancillary works will begin. Mr. Speaker, all works on the court surface is expected to be completed before the commencement of the school year, which means September morning. But the minister stated when he gave his response, it will be completed by the end of the year. So I just seek in clarity, Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, to state which one. Mr. Speaker, that um, was a mistake, and that's why you heard me um, hesitate when I give the answer, Mr. Speaker. I would say by the end of the year uh, for safety. But, Mr. Speaker, it's not about um, a got you moment or anything like that, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want the member for the second district to know that it's a priority. Funds have already been allocated. And as we said before, the start date for it is going to be August 23rd. I know that the contractor will work expeditiously to get it done. I don't think it's a, a project that will take that long to be completed. And then he will be pleased, I will be pleased, and the children and the community at King Garden Bay will be pleased. So members should know that it is a priority. It, it will be completed. And then once it's completed, we'll move on to another part of the member for the second district's list that he, that he has for, for us. And, and, and this is it for across the territory, Mr. Speaker. Again, I would challenge anyone to bring me a two-year period where more has been expended in sports infrastructure. I challenge anybody to, to bring me information that will show that more has been expended in a two-year period for sports infrastructure. We've repaired just about every basketball court, every sporting facility up and down the territory of the Virgin Islands. And I just ask just for a little bit more patience. Remember for the second district, Ivan Dawson basketball court will be no different We'll complete that, and he and I will get some much-needed exercise and have a nice one-on-one -on -one game down at Ivan Dawson Primary School. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for clarifying, but I think he missed one small point. That answer contained both Ivan Larson and Joss Van Dyke. So the back, the backboards and rims, um, good minister. Um, I think you more need edu uh, exercise than I, but I'm willing for the challenge. Question number six, Mr. Speaker. He's, he's the minister of sports. The fishing and agricultural in industries are extremely vital to the economic development and food security aspect of the territory's survival in an ever-changing world. Mr. Speaker, would the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture please provide this Honorable House with A, the Sustainable and Development Strategy for Fisheries for the Territory for 2019 through 2023 and beyond, and B, the Sustainable and Development Strategy for, for the Agriculture for the Territory for 2019 through 2023 and beyond. Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member for the second district for his very pertinent question. Mr. Speaker, I'll provide an answer for A and B together. Mr. Speaker, the government of the Virgin Islands is committed to the development and implementation of a national sustainable development plan to provide a roadmap for the quality future for the territory by bringing balanced development across economic sectors, improve the quality of life for all Virgin Islanders, belongers, and residents, and establish a path to sustainable economic growth. This plan is expected to chart the way forward for the territory over the next 15 years. The planning process is currently underway and is being led and executed by Dr. June Sumer, a UN ECLAC consultant. The member may be aware that consultations are being held across the territory for input on various aspects to be included in the plan. This includes the agriculture and fisheries sector. What I can say, Mr. Speaker, is that the immediate plans for the agriculture and fisheries sector include bringing to this honorable house, as soon as it is submitted to and approved by cabinet, the Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Bill. This bill seeks to establish an effective mechanism to create a well-regulated, well-organized regime to establish food security and sustainability in the territory. This legislation mandates a master plan for all Crown lands designated for agriculture and fisheries that will A, determine best use of available land and soils to maximize agricultural diversity, productivity, and opportunities for value-added agricultural production, B, define a marketing plan for agricultural production from the Crown lands designated for agriculture and fisheries, C, regularize tenure on Crown lands designated for agriculture and fisheries through the establishment of an appropriate licensing and leasing program that will impose and enforce quota requirements for agricultural production from parcels on Crown lands designated for agriculture and fisheries. D, reallocate available land through the issue of licenses and leases to support implementation of the master plan. In addition to the master plan, this legislation mandates a policy and strategy for sustainable agricultural production, food security, and food safety to ensure the sound and sustainable production, management, and use of food for Virgin Islanders, residents, and visitors to the territory, while addressing the impacts from climate change and disasters on food production. This policy shall do the following. Contain an evaluation of the state of agricultural and fishery resources, food safety and food security in the territory, provide an assessment of disaster and climate change risks and vulnerabilities affecting food security, evaluate social, human health, economic and ecological considerations and issues in respect of food security, define the national priorities concerning food security, outline the objectives to be achieved by the policy specify actions, initiatives, or activities that shall be implemented to give effect to the objectives of the policy, identify specific legal, financial, 
and institutional aspects that need to be addressed to give effect to the policy, define the strategy and action plan and mechanisms to give effect to the policy, including any financial, legal, and administrative requirements, define mechanisms for monitoring and implementation of the policy, and to undertake the periodic review of the policy. Both the master plan and policy and strategy will be developed with the broadest possible consultation. Until this legislation comes into force, the ministry has been operating plans based on a policy direction established through statements by myself in the House of Assembly, in press statements, speeches at various functions, and other fora. We have established a dedicated source of funding for the agriculture and fishery sector to the 7% money services tax, which has provided thus far over $1.4 million to agriculture and fisheries, which will greatly assist us with establishing our infrastructure and programs for advancement of the sector. The government has also injected millions of stimulus into the sector, which has assisted fishers and farmers to get on their feet since the 2017 hurricanes and the ongoing pandemic. We have already engaged in what will be mandated in the coming piece of legislation, which is a proper agricultural and fishery census, and an ongoing effort to register all farmers and license all commercial fishers and farmers. Traditionally, our register has not properly represented commercial fishing or farming in the Virgin Islands. Our plans include infrastructural development on various pieces of Crown land, specifically improving the water distribution network on the Parakita Bay Estate and establishing the Virgin Gorda Agricultural and Fisheries Substation. We are also well on our way to establishing our agricultural and fisheries depot at Parakita Bay and developing fish landing sites at various locations, including at the Oma Hodge Fisherman's Wharf. We also have focused on we also have focused on education. At the college, we have established an agricultural advisory committee, which will, among other things, recommend and develop short courses and degree programs to facilitate the training of a new workforce that can take agriculture into the future. This process will be repeated in the area of fisheries. Also important to the education process, we have restarted Farmers Week and the agricultural exhibition, which now has a fisheries component. This will highlight the work of our fishers and farmers and provide opportunities for our schools and others to do tours of farms. We also have opportunities for public forums and public education through various media outlets. We have also committed to partnering with the community to re-establish the annual Fisherman's Day on what is now called Virgin Islands Day. Aquaculture has also been an area of focus as we have made legislative amendments to help to faci facilitate the development and growth of lobster farming. We also will partner with a locally established business to begin plans to engage in fish farming. We have also been working with international donors and agencies to have studies of our fish stock, among other areas, in order to make recommendations on fishing practices. Poultry is an area of focus. We have made leases available to poultry farmers to increase our production to the point where we can cut down on imports and maybe one day even export, which will be supported uh, with an export tax. We have also engaged with H. Slavity Stout Community College, BVI Electricity Corporation, Tongue and Country Planning, the Survey Department, Natural Resources and Labor, and an enhanced planning process that will bring better accountability, coordination, and efficiency to the Parakita Bay Estate. We'll soon begin a similar process in Virgin Gordon and Anigada. Mr. Speaker, there's no shortage of plans for the sector. We must optimize our abilities to execute these plans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the minister for such a detailed answer. Mr. Speaker, what I want to know is, is if the question was asked for 
a provision of the strategy. What the minister supplied in his answer was plans for the strategy. So minister, is it that the strategy doesn't currently exist and you are working on it and these will be the components of both the strategy and the legislature coming? Or is this the strategy in, in the draft form that you have provided? Mr. Speaker, I, I would say that this is the policy direction that we're going into. And what I like about the legislation, Mr. Speaker, the proposed legislation, is that it actually mandates a policy and strategy. Um, this, I'm anxious to get this legislation into the public domain for it to have its first reading so that the member can, can peruse it and give his input on it. But it mandates a policy and a strategy. And the policy and the strategy is not one that just myself as minister will come up with. It will be done in a collaborative fashion with the fishers and farmers of the territory and the various stakeholders. Everybody will be able to have their input and it would be a strategy, a policy and a strategy that we all have invested in and we have a shared interest in and we'll take it forward together. Um, I would really like to get the legislation in place so we can go through that legislated uh, process. Uh, certainly until then, um, this is the direction that we've uh, been engaged in. Um, I think it's a good direction. I think it's a direction that will uh, lead to progress in agriculture and fisheries. And I can appreciate um, that it is not going as quickly as I would like, but Mr. Speaker, uh, we have had successes and we'll continue to have successes as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the minister for that response. Mr. Speaker, um, I'm not sure if any other members are or have received the message or such messages, but they're saying they're not hearing on the online on Facebook or ZDVI. So, persons within the, the community, they're stating that they can't hear whether on Facebook or ZBBI. I, I just received four messages thus far. So I don't know if they want to tell me to shut up or they're just saying they can't hear. So, Thanks. Not, no, they just can't hear any audio at all, at all. Thanks for that, I'm sure the technical team will work that. No problem, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll continue. Mr. Speaker, question number seven. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> would the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture provide a copy of the statistical analysis used to determine A, the macroeconomic benefits for the fishing and farming grants, B, the microeconomic benefits for the fishing and farming grants. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the second district for his question. The honorable members are aware from questions asked in a previous sitting of this honorable house that my ministry did not administer the fishing and farming grants. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I'm unable to provide a copy of any statistical analysis that may have been used to determine the macroeconomic or the microeconomic benefits for the fishing and farming grants. And I'll just add, Mr. Speaker, certainly um, th there has been a monitoring and evaluation uh, plan which has been passed in cabinet um, and my ministry certainly will be participating in a monitoring and evaluation uh, the set dates in the monitoring and evaluation plan so i'm hopeful that this information will become available to the member shortly thank you mr speaker mr speaker I thank the minister for his response, but I'm not sure if he understood the question that was asked. I am fully aware that 
in a previous question that was posed that the minister didn't administer the grants for fishing and farming but Mr. Speaker I believe based on a number of statements, comments and remarks that have been given in this honorable house and elsewhere in order for the grants to be given out information had to come from within the ministry for which he's responsible under the agricultural and fisheries department so that question mr speaker is not to the grants specifically of the administration of the grants but the information supporting on the larger scale the fishers and farmers based on the needs that exist um, under the agricultural and fisheries department and on the specific still basically which will deal with micro specific specifically deals with targeted individuals like your key farmers who are doing um the larger farming for for restaurants and supermarkets and officials who do who do more supply to the restaurants and sell on a larger scale so that's the basis of the information that i'm seeking mr speaker not on the um issuance of the grants which i clearly understand Mr. Speaker, the information that the member for the second district is, is requesting, I'm sure will be made available after we go through the monitoring and evaluation process as outlined in the cabinet decision of a few weeks ago. And this is a matter that's before the commission of inquiry. And um, I would hesitate to go any further with it. Mr. Speaker, it is a subject of a of a inquiry, and um, the the information that the members requesting, I believe, will be made available uh, shortly. But that's that's all I I care to contribute to that question right now, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I I I find it difficult that the minister is the minister for this subject and he's telling me about monitoring after the grants have already issued what i was trying to and am trying to find out mr speaker is what facilitated the process to get the grants out so when you're telling me about what monitoring after that's not what i am concerned about and i believe the minister is fully aware of the question I'm asking, but it will move on the, to be continued. Question number eight. Mr. Speaker, would the Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture please provide the Honorable House with the list of plans and programs that have been developed since taking office in 2019 to promote, to promote the territory's culture locally and abroad. I, I didn't know if you were doing the three, the three months again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Premier, not the Premier. Order, order, order. I'm recognizing the Deputy Premier to answer his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member for the second district has asked some very intriguing questions that I'm very happy to, to answer. Mr. Speaker, in 2019, the Association for the Promotion of Arts and Culture was formed out of the young group of artists that I took with me to Carifesta in August of this year. Its mission is to promote the arts and culture, thereby lending to a vibrant and strong Virgin Islands culture and identity. We have, we have to develop our young artists so that they may take their place in our society. To this end, APAC organized the first of an annual arts festival. This first one dedicated to the memory of the late great Dolores Christopher, which was held on the 2nd of November at Q 
Queen Elizabeth II Park. It featured traditional games, fungi, musicians, plat pole dancers, a food competition, a reenactment entitled Our Journey, reenactment of the 1949 Grand March, and a brilliant dance performance depicting the evolution of BVI culture. This was followed by the exciting pan-off, which was itself followed by a cultural interpretation through fashion. There was a spoken word portion of the evening, which was followed by sip and paint and jazz and fungi in the park. Our visual arts, paintings, pottery, and craft work were on display as were our literary arts during the book fair. Young and older artists were brought together and a number of trailblazers and culture bearers in our traditions of our literary performing and visual arts were honored. In 2020, the Department of Culture then began working on a new initiative, Culture and Tourism Month. I had already announced my intention to expand on Culture Week by fully involving the community at large. This is the beginning of what will be a collaborative effort between the Department of Culture and the BVI Tourist Board and Film Commission moving forward. Culture and Tourism Month opened on the 1st of November with a grand opening ceremony, which was a collaboration with the Virgin Islands Communal Association's Arts Expo. At the opening ceremony, a new artist, Jahaya Maduro, who works in metal, was introduced. Eight pieces reflective of the cultural heritage of the territory, which had been commissioned, were presented at the opening ceremony. The next major event in Culture and Tourism Month was the Cultural Food Fair, into which was incorporated a school arts fest, which included all of the territory's schools. The cultural extravaganza planned by the Virgin Gorda schools in memory of the late Beryl Vanterpool and Letitia Leonard is still to come in Culture and Tourism Month. The next major event in Culture and Tourism Month was the Cabinet's approval of the Virgin Islands Poet Laureate Program and the appointment of the territory's first poet laureate, Dr. Richard Georges. A series of artists and heritage workshops were also integrated into Culture and Tourism Month. These included a culinary arts workshop at the H. Laverty Stout Community College Culinary Arts Center, which featured traditional Virgin Islands foods, beverages, and desserts. There were two visual arts workshops facilitated by artists such as Ruben Vanterpool, Cedric Tomble, Dame Peters and Carl Burnett. There was also an oral history workshop. In these workshops, along with the public representatives from several cultural groups and other institutions were present, such as the Virgin Islands Communal Association, the BVI Drama Society, the African Studies Club, the Youth Empowerment Program, and the Virgin Islands Studies Institute. Representatives and students from the secondary schools on Tortola and Virgin Gorda also attended the workshops. Culture and Tourism Month itself also had participation from several of the territory's cultural groups, including VICA, which organized a bonfire, storytelling, and Sankey Sing Out Night. Other activities still to come are the African Studies Club, with its heritage hike, which is yet to come, and the Association for the Promotion of Arts and Culture, with its second annual Dolores Christopher Festival of the Arts. The H. Laverty Stout Community College has also been a partner throughout the Culture and Tourism Month. The Department of Culture has continued its vibrant book launch program in the area of the literary arts whilst introducing the Writing with Writers workshop series for literary artists. The first master class was conducted over several weeks with the poet laureate himself, Dr. Richard Georges. A big book fair is being planned for the summer while a virtual library will be developed by the end of the year. The Department of Culture will be continuing its focus on the development, promotion, and marketing of the work of the artists in the territory and the creation of a vibrant cultural scene in the territory. In 2020, the Department of Culture released, in celebration of International Museum Day, a two-part series of a virtual exhibition entitled From Perrine Georges to Noah Lloyd, Heroes and Freedom Fighters. At that time, I spoke about the need to integrate our museums into our community, creating true community institutions. It's also very significant that just by doing this, we also strengthen our tourism product. 
We learn and tell our own story, and then we share this, that story authentically with our visitors with the world. During 2021, the Department of Culture used International Museum Day to introduce a few initiatives for museums in the territory. The department presented a series of technical workshops for our museums, professionals in the territory. These were all part of our mandate to transform and standardize our museums and our practices. The first two workshops that were conducted were writing mission statements and developing a collection policy. The second set of workshops conducted were care of the artifacts and introducing a decolonizing paradigm into our museums. These activities will help to prepare the way for museums policy, which is being prepared by the Department of Culture along with the, stake with the stakeholders, our territories and museums, with which the Department of Culture has been meeting regularly for some time now. The Department has also been developing virtual museums in the spirit of innovative practices for all the museums. The week of activities culminated in a grand way on Saturday the 22nd of May with a museum hop which took place between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. The tour bus hopped to six of the seven museums on Tortola. The Department of Culture continued its focus on the documentation, restoration, and development of its tangible and intangible heritage. I have already met with both Department of Culture and my ministry in order to begin to address the absence in large part of Virgin Islands history and culture in the curriculum, in particular in the high school curriculum. In the meantime, International Museum Day was an excellent opportunity for our 12th graders across the territory to be immersed in our Virgin Islands heritage through an introduction and active participation in our museum world. On Friday, the 21st of May, a museum's expo was held on the grounds of the Elmostout High School, the senior campus, their photographic and artifact displays of all our museums in the territory. Educational activities had also been organized. Our museums are not just cultural institutions, they are also educational institutions. For this reason, on Thursday the 20th of May, the Department of Culture had scheduled virtual sessions with the sixth graders across the territory in order to introduce them to our museum world, leading the sixth graders through immersive virtual sessions. The Department of Culture will continue its focus on ensuring that Virgin Islands heritage and culture are taught comprehensively throughout the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. Lastly, but certainly not least, the Department of Culture will be focusing on the revision of the territory's cultural policy, along with the development of a strategic plan. And let me just quickly add that the festival, our traditional festival, while it was, uh, most of it was canceled due to COVID-19, uh, we're proud of the fact that we have added more cultural events to our festival calendar. Uh, such as the market day at Carrot Bay and uh, um, the um, festival of culture and praise in, uh, at the Sticket. And um, we'll continue to add to our cultural uh, calendar throughout the year. And let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, in all of these areas, uh, we have wonderful um, technical persons public servants working in these areas, and we would have never made such progress without them, and I, I certainly thank them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the second for his question. Mr. Speaker, when I heard the minister wrapping up, I, I almost thought he forgot he was giving an answer to a question. I thought he was wrapping up his statement. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, thank the minister for that very detailed and comprehensive response. And I know he could give responses to all the questions I asked, so that leads me to know that my classmate has chosen what he wants to answer and what he doesn't want to answer. Nevertheless, Mr. Speaker, I want to commend him and the department, I think it's still the Department of Culture, still the Department of Culture for some of, not just some of Mr. Speaker, the amount of work that they have done um, since 2019 to not only promote culture, but also educate the public, especially in the primary and secondary schools um, on the importance of understanding and teaching our children 
who we are. I know, especially in, I think it was 2019, a lot was done, a lot of efforts were done to involve the seniors that we could garner to go into the public schools and give some um, historical background to, to the students. And then since COVID, we were able to, to continue that program. So I, I minister and Mr. Speaker, I want to um, congratulate the minister and thank him and his team for, for doing that because in order to know where we're going, we must always, always know and be reminded of where we came from. Mr. Speaker, so that will be my follow up one in the term, in, in, in part of giving him congratulations so that when this is all said and done, I know the only thing that will come out is I was being negative. So now they have something to report. Mr. Speaker, question, follow up. Mr. Speaker, during the 70 year anniversary, right here in this honorable house, the Minister of Education announced that we would have a video um, that would celebrate the 70 years um, of legislative and parliamentary procedure here in this territory. Um, I think it was supposed to be completed and, and, and put out by November last year. So Minister, my only follow up, um, while you have done so much, my only follow up is to ensure um, when we can expect to have that production um, presented or put out. I thank the member for the second district for that follow up. And um, before I answer that question, Mr. Speaker, um, I just want to say to all the members of the House that I certainly recognize that within communities, the King Garden Bay community, the Carrot Bay community, the Eastern Longwood community, all the different communities we have throughout the Virgin Islands, there's a wealth of history, knowledge, and culture. And I would be willing to partner with all the different district representatives to have events to help to educate persons in the community about the vibrant um, culture and heritage that we have um, through giving platforms to those persons in the community who are our history and our culture bearers. So certainly, um, you know, reach out to me if persons would like to partner on those type of initiatives. Um, as it relates to the documentary. Um, yes, um, member for the second district, um, unfortunately we weren't able to complete the documentary in the proposed time because of um, the editor of the video had some health challenges that delayed the, that delayed the completion of the film. So now we're aiming for our very first March and Restoration, 1949 March and Restoration Day, which I think is an appropriate time to be able to, to view that film and have other celebrations. And Mr. Speaker, I'm glad the member for the second axis follow up because in my response to his question, I forgot to mention uh, that, we, that cabinet had um, implemented new days, new holidays for us to celebrate, including Heroes Day, uh, which will be approaching quickly in October. And then we have the 1949 March and Restoration Day in November, which provide us with opportunities to focus again on our rich heritage and our rich culture. So we can look forward to the film being aired um, in November at 1949 March and Restoration Day. And also, November is going to be Culture and Tourism Month. So that would be a wonderful time as well to have that film shown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I believe that concludes the questions that I have for the Deputy Premier and Minister of 
education, culture, youth affairs, fisheries, and agriculture. And I thank him for providing the answers which he did. And the answers which he didn't, I will bring back for a next time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Premier for his answers to the question and the member for the second for posing the question. So we will skip now the questions for the Transportation Minister. And if he's back on Thursday, we'll allow him to answer those questions on, at all when we reconvene on Thursday. So we'll go now to page 23, and we'll invite the member for the second district to pose his questions to the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration please tell this Honorable House how many BVI landers and or belongers have been employed over the past three years as teachers? A, could the minister state whether they are permanent and pensionable? And B, if not, why not? Question. Mr. Speaker, regarding the status of teachers, I will not be able to furnish an answer as teachers fall under the remit of the Minister for the Subject Matter, Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his prompt response. So, Minister, are you saying that under the Department of Labor and Workforce De Development, you don't keep uh, information as it regards to the sectors of government where persons are employed? The answer is not at this time, but we are in the process of doing just that. With our new online work permit system, that information would be captured there. What many for persons on a work permit. The information you want, I'm sure, is available, but just you asking the wrong ministry. Thank you. Not a problem, Mr. Speaker. I, I know the minister will work hard on his reform, as I heard him state earlier, to get all these things electronic. Mr. Speaker, question number two. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration provide this honorable house with the status of the plan to reconstruct the gunpoint in King Adame next to the Hodges gas station, to which he has responded in the last time I asked the same question? that he had no information and nothing was being done because he was unaware of this project. Mr. Speaker, I must um, make mention that the minister is the one that asked that I put this question back because shortly after the question was posed in the House, he told me that he received information. So that's why it's being brought back, not to violate any standing orders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to date, the Ministry of Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration have not been made aware of any project to reconstruct the gunpoint in King Garden Bay next to Hodges Gas Station. However, knowing the situation, the Ministry can assist in the technical work required to formulate a project that can address the long-term issues plaguing the area. The works will require financing, which is not available at this time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Captain Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that answer is heartbreaking, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that answer touches me to my core because when I spoke with the minister, he stated that he was made aware of the situation and now to hear him come back with the same answer is not only disappointing to me, Ms. Mr. Speaker, but I know for a fact it is disappointed to the people of King Garden Bay, specifically in that area, who are dealing with the continued erosion of the, the beaches and the waterways due to the erosion of the same gunpoint. Minister, I must state to you that since 
I think it was around October, November last year, discussion started. Um, and at one time, we were supposed to take a site visit there. But the persons and people within that community are willing to do what needs to be done. And as a representative of the people, I would have to stand with my people. So if you continue to be unaware, Mr. Speaker, then I will move with the people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for um, answering and partially not answering the question. Mr. Speaker, I said we've identified someone who can do a study of the problem. I'm aware of the problem. A request was not made to my ministry to, to carry out this study, but I have the expertise. I'm not a person who can do the study. We can design the necessary works to be done, but it has to come with financing. It's a very important project because the bay is going to be eroded if it's not addressed, but it's not for me to initiate the project. Once it's initiated and funding is provided, I'll, prov I'll provide a drawing and all the expertise for somebody to implement. I will happily do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Minister of Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration. We'll now move on to questions for the Minister of Health and Social I had a Development. Mr. Speaker. I think you already did your follow up. I had two. I mean, well, that was a statement. You may not have follow up then. I have entitlement. Mr. Speaker, am I entitled to two follow-ups? Go ahead. No, I don't have any, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I am look for, I'm looking forward to setting up a meeting, Minister, if we can do that as urgently as possible, where we can sit down and discuss um, these plans. That's, that's my follow-up, Mr. Speaker. And I'll call you to ask the questions to the member of the Minister of the Health and Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know I'm asking the right questions to this minister because I know he has seen these questions before. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister for Health and Social Development Please tell this honorable house, how many contact tracing devices are owned by the Ministry of Health for persons required to quarantine after arriving in the territory? That's A. B, who owns the company that provides these devices? And C, what is the cost to a user each time one is distributed? Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity to respond to these very important questions. Mr. Speaker, while your government is an advocate of transparency and accountability, and while these two standards of governance and democracy are important, however, Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 17.1 of this Honorable House sets out the parameters for which questions can be asked in this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 17.1, G, Roman numeral 4, uh, states that a question shall not be asked which deals with matters referred to a commission of inquiry or within the jurisdiction of the chairman of a standard of a select committee. Mr. Speaker, this question falls into that category as the commission of inquiry has requested this information which spans the tenure of this current administration as well as information of similar nature for the, import, for the immediate past administration, hence unable to answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I have no, no choice but to follow the standing orders, Mr. Speaker, but I want, again, if I may, to just challenge us that while we could focus on what the standing orders stay here and avoid answering the questions, then it is being asked and published internationally from the commission and the same answers are, are received. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister for Health and Social Development tell this honorable house, what is the government's plan to provide COVID-19 testing and analysis on the islands of Just Van Dyke, Virgin Gorda, and Anigata to facilitate faster results. Mr. Speaker, again, this question was on the order paper and submitted since the 27th of May 
of this year. So I know the answer would have already changed twice over. Yes, and on reflect, even in terms of the answer given, I have to give one small update on this. So I will have to adjust this before I send it to you, lest you read it and, 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 and see that I didn't have it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 RT-PCR testing is performed at the laboratory of the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital. The swabbing is what takes place on each of the outlying clinics and the particular um, centers. This is to meet the requirements of receiving uh, countries that receive lab results from certified labs only. The laboratory at the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital is currently the only lab in the BVI that is certified and credentialed for that purpose. The results from Virgin Gorda, Anagata, and Justin Lake are processed in the same timely manner as those on Tortola once received um, through arrangements. The agreed turnaround time for results is between 24 and 36 hours. However, every attempt is made to exceed these expectations. Mr. Speaker, further, we have the rapid tests that are now being conducted in areas of the seaport, airport, and the testing center at the, at the primary school. Mr. Speaker, training is being conducted uh, for persons identified for the conduct of rapid tests on Jasper Dyke, Virgin Gorda, and Agata, and at various clinics. And so too, it will be within the service at various locations. Mr. Speaker, we, in, we intend to improve the capacity of the Health Services Administration Authority in the testing requirements for worldwide travel and the fight against COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, please advise me. Um, question number three, given that schools are already closed and there have been developments, may I strike this question from the record or do I still have to proceed? You may strike it from the record. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, so I... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I, I move Minister to, to remove question number three and then move on to the final question number four. Residents who have been approved through the various protocols established to protect the territory during the pandemic are not allowed to drive themselves to home quarantine, nor are they allowed to drive to conduct the four-day testing, but are trusted to stay home for the time frame mentioned above. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister of Health and Social Development please give an explanation as to why this is the practice or the case? Again, on reflect of the answer given, I have to just make the adjustment so that we can have a complete answer. Mr. Speaker, quarantined persons are monitored through the assigned monitoring devices to ensure that they do not breach quarantine. Transportation is also provided to limit opportunities um, for the breaching of quarantine. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the the orders have been amended to give incentives to stay home by the imposition of fines from I'm sorry, Minister. Is, am I missing something? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there a follow-up? Mr. Speaker, I will rest here because I know for sure the follow-ups will come from the public. 
um, and I don't have any further follow-up, so I want to thank the minister for answering that question, that fines will be the incentive to stay home. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank all ministers for answering your questions, and as I said, if the Minister for Transportation is here on Thursday, we will entertain the answers to his question. The Honorable Minister for Mr. Speaker. Premier, for what reason do you rise? Um, I'm going to say it now. The, as I know, she's walking. It's on. The, the member for Minister of Transportation is away. And um, electronically, I have his answers. I thought that um, the, the questions were moving to the next out of paper because if I, 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 I probably misunderstand something. I thought all of his questions that was left was moving to the next out of paper for the next sitting. Because now when we leave from here right now, when we go into government business, um, you're saying we're coming back into question and answers? Uh, because the, I had already informed in not to bring the hard copies because I was under the impression that all of them was going into the next sitting. But if they have to be answered tonight, we can. But to go back there Thursday, that's a fast stretch. So I don't have the member the second, the next sitting is just the following Monday. Yeah. Well, um, I'll just be guided by the member. Whatever the member says, I'll yeah. go by. Well, so what, I could hear the member okay. with your kind of uh, indulgence. No, I, I will, I will, I will um, speak to that. The, it, it was agreed before that the Premier would have answered the questions for the member for the 5th District, Minister for Transportation. However, since then, there was discussions between the opposition and the Premier, and a new decisions were made about waiting until he returns. So... Uh, I didn't, I didn't know about that one day. Yeah. So I made the decision that if he re, if he's here on Thursday, we will simply just go you, to his questions and answer. I'll wait to hear the member for the second pause because that discussion I remember that. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I believe the consensus on this side is that it will be moved to the next sitting. Yeah, that's um, The questions will be moved to the next sitting because there are, in fact, um, questions that I believe both of us might have, including the leader opposition for the next sitting. So if that is possible, Mr. Speaker, that's what we That's why I understand. For. That's what we discussed. I, I, I was never told not next. Okay, well, I will take that on the advisement and be guided. If it's the wish of members to have it placed on the top sitting, it was my preference that if he's back this week, when we continue, that we just get it out of the way. However, I'm, I'm always guided. The Minister for Health and Social Development have asked my permission to read a statement on COVID and the Delta virus. So I will allow him to read his short statement before we continue. I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development, the Honorable Corvin Malone. And thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, just last week, Thursday, August 12th, I gave an update on the impact of COVID-19 in this honorable house. I started off that statement by acknowledging the community effort that it took to get us to a place where we can breathe a small sigh of relief because of the downturn in positive COVID-19 cases in the territory. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that as at Sunday, August 15th, we have 42 active cases. This is down from the height of over 1,604. 32 cases on Tortola, nine on Virgin Gorda, and one on a marine vessel. There were two admissions, two additional admissions, to the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital just yesterday, 
bringing our total number of persons in the hospital to nine. Great strides have been and continue to be made by all of us as a collective team to arrest the outbreak and reduce transmission of this virus. For this, I want to say thank you to all persons involved. As we continue, Mr. Speaker, to navigate the challenges of COVID-19, I want to talk to you about the Delta variant that was recently confirmed in the territory by the Chief Medical Officer and what that means to us moving forward. Mr. Speaker, to better understand the significance of the Delta variant reaching our shows, we must first understand what makes Delta so much of a concern. The Delta variant is highly contagious or has increased transmiss transmissibility according to the WHO and the CDC. Delta has accounted for more than 80% of new cases in the United States and recent research have found that the Delta variant grows more rapidly and to much greater level in the respiratory tract, making it potentially more fatal than the initial virus. This has the ability to translate into a catastrophic catastrophe, sorry, for a small community like ours, especially because of vaccination levels are not where they need to be in order for us to be more protected. As a territory, we are still mourning the loss of loved ones and picking up the pieces from the first wave of COVID. We cannot afford for a second wave and especially a Delta wave. The Delta wave could break, could wreak havoc over a community. It is for this reason that we cannot let down our guards, Mr. Speaker, especially now that we have confirmed that one COVID-19 sample out of 19 sent for genetic testing on August 4th returned positive for the Delta variant. The positive case had no travel history and the household included two other positive contacts, one of whom met criteria for sequencing and tested negative for the Delta variant. These cases and contacts were all quarantined and clearly in accordance with established protocols. Mr. Speaker, the good news is that according to the samples that were taken, we had a case of Delta that was contact traced, isolated, and mitigated in the territory. The bad news, Mr. Speaker, is that the positive case didn't have a travel history. Therefore, we can assume that the Delta variant may still be and is likely to be lurking within the territory. We have heard from the health experts over and over again that the severity of illness that could occasion this variant, we heard the experts continue to admonish the community to comply with protocols and get vaccinated. We heard the experts say that we must remain vigilant and continue to do the things that allow us to reduce positive cases and arrest the spread of this virus. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I am pleading with you to continue to wear your mask, continue to wash and sanitize your hands frequently, continue to clean and dis disinfect frequently touched surfaces, continue to limit gathering sizes, continue, Mr. Speaker, to maintain physical distance and get vaccinated because it really is your best defense against this disease that has claimed the lives of millions worldwide since the start of this pandemic. Universally, studies are showing that the Delta variant is affecting unvaccinated persons at a much greater percentage than persons who are vaccinated. Typically, vaccinated persons are either asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms if they do come in contact with the Delta variant. In the United States, as of July 22, 2021, 97% of persons hospitalized with COVID-19 were unvaccinated. This again is according to the Center of Disease Control, CDC. Locally, our very own statistics have proven, has provided us with similar results. The majority of those adversely affected by COVID were unvaccinated. That is why I, as the Minister for Health, 
will continue to encourage the unvaccinated persons in our community to get vaccinated. Don't be regretful. Don't wait until you are adversely affected by COVID to say that you should have gotten vaccinated. We are not out of the woods. Mr. Speaker, we are now seeing that a growing number of young people are dying from this disease throughout the world. Don't assume that your youth will protect you. Don't assume that your health will protect you. This disease is revealing health issues that persons did not know existed. Don't let too late be your cry. Protect yourself, protect each other, and protect the community by getting vaccinated today. Being vaccinated could prevent hospitalization and could save your life tomorrow. I also want to take this time to make an appeal to vaccinated persons to also continue to follow protocols and guidelines to assist mitigation efforts. As you are aware, Mr. Speaker, the vaccines does not make you immune from catching the virus. What, is, does, what it does is it lowers your vulnerability to the virus, and if you do catch it, it significantly reduces the impact and almost eliminates the possibility of hospitalization and even death. Mr. Speaker, we continue to advocate that the AstraZeneca vaccine is safe and effective and is among the best vaccines available on the market today. Don't hesitate. Make up your mind to get vaccinated. Make up your mind to protect yourself, your parents, your children, siblings, friends, and the community. Make up your mind, Mr. Speaker, to create your best defense against COVID because it, uh, it is obvious that it will be in the same for years to come. Mr. Speaker, we have to live with COVID. We have to work with COVID. We have to go to school with COVID, but we cannot play with COVID. So it would make sense for us to protect ourselves uh, from COVID by following the protocols and guidelines and by getting vaccinated. As a territory, we want to achieve herd immunity. We don't want anyone else to suffer the devastating blows of this virus. Let us show COVID-19 that we are not playing around either. Let us show COVID that we will stand united as a community and protect ourselves, each other, the economy and the territory from its ravages. Up until late June, we have gone through, we have done great as a territory, keeping the virus at bay with lockdowns, restricting travels into the country and associated quarantine measures. Through effective, though effective, these measures have taken a toll on us financially. It has caused many businesses to close, many persons to be jobless, and has had a huge impact on the finances of the country. We cannot continue to lock down or shut down. Therefore, our best offense is to have a great defense and be prepared for any eventuality of COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, the messages are simple. Defend yourself from this enemy. Defend your family, defend your friends, and defend all the lives and livelihoods that are at stake. I urge you to remain vigilant. Today, it may be Delta. Tomorrow, Lambda. And the next week, another variant of concern. The most, the safety protocols that have proven to be effective must never be forgotten. Again, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to sound like a stuck record, but I must urge everyone to continue to follow all the health protocols, such as wearing your face mask, continue to practice frequent hand hygiene, continue to maintain physical distance in public spaces, and continue uh, to use every opportunity that is presented to you to get vaccinated as it is our best tool to reduce the transmission of the virus and save lives of our people. Continue to follow isolation and quarantine order. Continue to disclose your COVID status and continue to be honest about persons who have come into contact with, who you have come into contact with if you have tested positive for COVID-19. Rest assured that we will continue to work with the Caribbean Public Health Agency, this is CAFA, to submit and monitor the positive samples discovered 
with the mandated city values lower than 25. That is, Mr. S that is, Mr. Speaker, anyone who tests lower than 25, their samples are being sent to cover as a criteria so that they can determine the variant of concern. It will be sent for sequencing and further surveillance for the Delta variant and any other variant of concern. We will do our part to keep you protected as best we can, but I remind you that each of us have a part to play in keeping our communities safe. Remember, Mr. Speaker, we are not out of the woods. We will get through this together, and we will return our territory back to the territory that we know, the territory that we love, and the territory that we miss. We pray that everyone will stay safe, and may God continue to bless our beautiful Virgin Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that statement. And um, I'm sure that you distribute it accordingly. I call upon the clerk. Item number eight, public business, one, government business. I call upon the Honorable Premier for the first reading of the Public Procurement Act 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move motion for the introduction of first reading of the bill entitled Public Procurement Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I move that Lee be granted to introduce the following bill sent in my name shortly entitled Public Procurement Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that Lee to introduce the bill shortly entitled Public Procurement Act 2021 be granted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. I call upon the Premier and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Public Procurement Act 2021 and will explain its provisions at the second reading. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the bill shortly entitled Public Procurement Act 2021 be now read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Public Procurement Act 2021 be now read for a first time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I therefore call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. This act may be cited as the Public Procurement Act 2021. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Premier and Leader of Government's Business to introduce the Virgin Islands Gaming and Better Control Amendment Act 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move a motion for the introduction and first reading of the bill entitled Virgin Islands Gaming and Better Control Amendment Act 2021. I move that leave be granted to introduce the following bill standing in my name, shortly entitled Virgin Islands Gaming and Better Control Amendment Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Gaming and Betting Control Amendment Act 2021 be granted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the Honorable Premier. So, Speaker, I rise to introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Virgin Islands Gaming and Betting Control Amendment Act 2021 and will explain its provision at the second time. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Gaming and Betting Control Amendment Act 2021 be now read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Gaming and Betting Control Amendment Act 2021 be now read a first time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. 
This act may be cited as the Virgin Islands Gaming and Betting Control Amendment Act 2021. I call upon the Premier and Leader of Government's Business to introduce the bill entitled Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move the motion for the introduction of first reading of the bill entitled Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021. I move that leave be granted to introduce the following bill standing in my name shortly entitled Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021 be granted. Those in favor, those against, the ayes have it. I call upon the Premier and Leader of Government's business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021 and will explain its provisions at the second reading. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021 be now read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021 be now read a first time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Therefore, I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. This act may be cited as the Virgin Islands Air and Seaports Act 2021. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development to introduce the bill, Child Maintenance and Access Amendment Act 2021. Minister, do you need a recess? Just a second, Mr. Speaker. I'll be right there. I was getting the statement out. What page is it on? 23. Thank you. Sorry about that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move a motion for the introduction and first reading of the bill entitled Child Maintenance and Access Amendment Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I move that leave be granted to introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Child Maintenance and Access Amendment Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Child Maintenance and Access Amendment Act 2021 be granted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development. Mr. Speaker, I introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Child Maintenance Access Amendment Act 2021 and will explain its provisions at the second reading. Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled Child Maintenance and Access Amendment Act 2021 be now read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Child Maintenance and Access Amendment Act 2021 be now read for a first time. Aye. The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. This act may be cited as a Child Maintenance and Access Amendment Act 2021. Thank you. Honorable members, at this stage, we will. Um, Honorable Premier, you have an intervention. 
Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to move a motion to have um, number 581, Roman numeral 5, removed from the other paper and placed on the, the next other paper that's upcoming, which is, is in the Integrity in Public Life, says 815, to remove that from the other paper from the second and third reading. And then move up Virgin Islands Investment Act as number five, and then have all the other numbers subsequently follow that. So I'll like to move the motion again to remove items eight, subsection one, Roman numeral five, off of the other paper for the day, placed on the next other paper. And I'd like to then have item number six now become five, seven becomes six, eight becomes seven and the, the, it, the number sequence will follow straight through. So Mr. Speaker, I so move. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second a motion. Thank you. A motion has been moved and seconded to renumber the order of the day, removing 8-1, Roman numeral 5, from the order of the day, and changing the sequence of numbers. Eight, six becomes five, seven becomes Six becomes seven. Those in favor? Those against? The order of the day is hereby amended. Is there any other item, Honorable Premier, before we take a recess? Organized investment and the rest of it for Thursday at 10. Okay. I'm going to remind um, members with bills to ensure that choose them on and when we resume that your witnesses are here and ready to go at Thursday. 10 a.m. Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. So we will recess the house until Thursday, 19th August, 2021 at 10 a.m. This honorable house now stands in recess until Thursday, 19th August, 2021 at 10 a.m.